Biographia Literaria Asterisk 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 Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Contents Detailed Contents Biographia Literaria Chapter I Chapter 2 Chapter 3 Chapter 4 Chapter V Chapter 6 Chapter 7 Chapter 8 Chapter 9 Chapter X Chapter 11 Chapter 12 Chapter 13 Chapter 14 Chapter 15 Chapter 16 Chapter 17 Chapter 18 Chapter 19 Chapter XX Chapter XXI Chapter XXII Satyrains Letters Chapter 23 Chapter Xiv Conclusion Footnotes List of Contents Chap I Motives to the Present Work Reception of the Author's First Publication Discipline of His Taste at School Effect of Contemporary Writers on Youthful Minds, Bowles's Sonnets, Comparison between the Poets Before and Since Pope II Supposed Irritability of Genius Brought to the Test of Facts, Causes and Occasions of the Charge, Its Injustice 3 The Author's Obligations to Critics, and the Probable Occasion, Principles of Modern Criticism. Mr. Southey's works and character for the lyrical ballads with The preface, Mr. Wordsworth's earlier poems, on fancy and imagination, the investigation of the distinction important to the fine arts v on the law of association, its history traced from Aristotle to Hartley VI that Hartley's system, as far as it differs from that of Aristotle is neither tenable in theory, nor founded in fact seven of the necessary consequences of the Hartleyan theory, of the original mistake or equivocation which procured its admission, memoria technica ate the system of dualism. Introduced by Descartes, refined first by Spinoza and afterwards by Leibniz into the doctrine of harmonia praestabilita, Hylozoism, materialism, none of these systems, or any possible theory of association, supplies or supersedes a theory of perception, or explains the formation of the associable eleven is philosophy possible as a science, and what are its conditions, Giordano Bruno, literary aristocracy or the existence of a tacit compact among the learned as a privileged order, the authors. Obligations to the mystics to Immanuel Kant, the difference between the letter and the spirit of Kant's writings, and a vindication of prudence in the teaching of philosophy, Fitz's attempt to complete the critical system its partial success and ultimate failure obligations to Schelling, and among English writers to Saumeres X a chapter of digression and anecdotes, as an interlude preceding that on the nature and genesis of the imagination or plastic power, on pedantry and pedantic expressions. Advice to young authors respecting publication, various anecdotes of the author's literary life and the progress of his opinions in religion and politics 11 an affectionate exhortation to those who in early life feel themselves disposed to become authors 12 a chapter of requests and premonitions concerning the perusal or omission of the chapter that follows 13 on the imagination or esemplastic power 14 occasion of the lyrical ballads and the objects originally proposed, preface to the second edition, the ensuing controversy, its causes and acrimony, philosophic definitions of a poem and poetry with Scolia 15 the specific symptoms of poetic power elucidated in a critical analysis of Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis and Rape of Luris 16 striking points of difference between the poets of the present age and those of the 15th and 16th centuries, 
we shall express for the union of the characteristic merits of both seventeen examination of the tenets peculiar to Mr. Wordsworth. Rustic life, above all, low and rustic life, especially unfavorable to the formation of a human diction the best parts of language the product of philosophers, not of clowns or shepherds. Poetry essentially ideal and generic, the language of Milton as much the language of real life, yet, incomparably more so than that of the cottager 18 language of metrical composition, why and wherein essentially different from that of prose, origin and elements of metre, its necessary consequences, and the Conditions thereby imposed on the metrical writer in the choice of his diction 19 continuation, concerning the real object, which, it is probable, Mr. Wordsworth had before him in his critical preface, elucidation and application of this XX the former subject continued, the neutral style, or that common to prose and poetry exemplified by specimens from Chaucer, Herbert, and others XXI remarks on the present mode of conducting critical journals XXII the characteristic defects of Wordsworth's poetry, with the principles from which the judgment, that they are defects, is deduced, their proportion to the beauties, for the greatest part characteristic of his theory only Satirane's letters 23 critique on Bertram Xiv conclusion so when I go och bestimmt sein mag, and er zu beleren, so vuenskte doc sick dienen might suthi island, die er sick gleich jazint ways, o de hoft, den aber in der breit der welt zestruist, a viewinsked same verhaltness zu den isle testen freunden. Da der quida ein zun u epfen, mit neuen s fort susitzen, und in der letzten generation sick quida and a refer sein u bright leben sit zu juinin. A viewinsked der jujang die um weed zu ers baron, auf den an er sick selbst verert. Gertie. Ein Lettung in die Propylene. Translation Little call as he may have to instruct others, he wishes nevertheless to open out his heart to such as he either knows or hopes to be of like mind with himself, but who are widely scattered in the world, he wishes to knit anew his connections with his oldest friends to continue those recently formed, and to win other friends among the rising generation for the remaining course of his life. He wishes to spare the young those circuitous paths, on which he himself had lost his way. Biographia Literaria Chapter I Motives to the Present Work Reception of the Author's First Publication Discipline of his taste at school, effect of contemporary writers on youthful minds, Bowles's sonnets, comparison between the poets before and since Pope. It has been my lot to have had my name introduced both in conversation, and in print, more frequently than I find it easy to explain, whether I consider the fewness, unimportance, and limited circulation of my writings, or the retirement and distance, in which I have lived, both from the literary and political world. Most often it has been connected with some charge which I could not acknowledge, or some principle which I had never entertained. Nevertheless, had I had no other motive or incitement, the reader would not have been troubled with this exculpation. What my additional purposes were, will be seen in the following pages. It will be found, 
that the least of what I have written concerns myself personally. I have used the narration chiefly for the purpose of giving a continuity to the work, in part for the sake of the miscellaneous reflections suggested to me by particular events, but still more as introductory to a statement of my principles in politics, religion, and philosophy, and an application of the rules, deduced from philosophical principles, to poetry and criticism. But of the objects, which I proposed to myself, it was not the least important to effect, as far as possible, a settlement of the long-continued controversy concerning the true nature of poetic diction, and at the same time to define with the utmost impartiality the real poetic character of the poet by whose writings this controversy was first kindled, and has been since fueled and fanned. In the spring of 1796, when I had but little past the verge of manhood, I published a small volume of juvenile poems. They were received with a degree of favour, which, young as I was, I well know was bestowed on them not so much for any positive merit, as because they were considered buds of hope, and promises of better works to come. The critics of that day, the most flattering, equally with the severest, concurred in objecting to them obscurity, a general turgidness of diction, and a profusion of new coined double epithets. One. The first is the fault which a writer is the least able to detect in his own compositions, and my mind was not then sufficiently disciplined to receive the authority of others, as a substitute for my own conviction. Satisfied that the thoughts, such as they were, could not have been expressed otherwise, or at least more perspicuously, I forgot to inquire whether the thoughts themselves did not demand a degree of attention unsuitable to the nature and objects of poetry. This remark however applies chiefly, though not exclusively, to the religious musings. The remainder of the charge I admitted to its full extent, and not without sincere acknowledgments both to my private and public censors for their friendly admonitions. In the after editions, I pruned the double epithets with no sparing hand, and used my best efforts to tame the swell and glitter both of thought and diction, though in truth, these parasite plants of youthful poetry had insinuated themselves into my longer poems with such intricacy of union, that I was often obliged to omit disentangling the weed, from the fear of snapping the flower. From that period to the date of the present work I have published nothing, with my name which could by any possibility have come before the board of anonymous criticism. Even the three or four poems, printed with the works of a friend, too, as far as they were censured at all, were charged with the same or similar defects, though I am persuaded not with equal justice, with an excess of ornament, in addition to strained and elaborate diction. I must be permitted to add, that, even at the early period of my juvenile poems, I saw and admitted the superiority of an austere and more natural style, with an insight not less clear, than I at present possess. My judgment was stronger than were my powers of realizing its dictates, and the faults of my language though indeed partly owing to a wrong choice of subjects, and the desire of giving a poetic colouring to abstract and metaphysical truths, in which a new world then seemed to open upon me, did yet, in part likewise, 
originate in unfeigned diffidence of my own comparative talent. During several years of my youth and early manhood, I reverenced those who had reintroduced the manly simplicity of the Greek, and of our own elder poets, with such enthusiasm as made the hope seem presumptuous of writing successfully in the same style. Perhaps a similar process has happened to others, but my earliest poems were marked by an ease and simplicity, which I have studied, perhaps with inferior success, to impress on my later compositions. At school, Christ's Hospital, I enjoyed the inestimable advantage of a very sensible, though at the same time, a very severe master, the Reverend James Bowyer. He early moulded my taste to the preference of Demosthenes to Cicero, of Homer and Theocritus to Virgil, and again of Virgil to Ovid. He habituated me to compare Eucretius, in such extracts as I then read, Terence, and above all the chaster poems of Cachalas not only with the Roman poets of the, so-called, Silver and Brazen Ages, but with even those of the Augustan era, and on grounds of plain sense and universal logic to see and assert the superiority of the former in the truth and nativeness both of their thoughts and diction. At the same time that we were studying the Greek tragic poets, he made us read Shakespeare and Milton as lessons, and they were the lessons too, which required most time and trouble to bring up, so as to escape his censure. I learned from him, that poetry, even that of the loftiest and, seemingly, that of the wildest odes, had a logic of its own, as severe as that of science, and more difficult because more subtle, more complex, and dependent on more, and more fugitive causes. In the truly great poets, he would say, there is a reason assignable, not only for every word, but for the position of every word, and I well remember that, availing himself of the synonyms to the Homer of Didymus, he made us attempt to show, with regard to each, why it would not have answered the same purpose, and wherein consisted the peculiar fitness of the word in the original text. In our own English compositions, at least for the last three years of our school education, he showed no mercy to phrase, metaphor, or image, unsupported by a sound sense or where the same sense might have been conveyed with equal force and dignity in plainer words. 3. Lute, harp, and lyre, muse, muses, and inspirations, Pegasus, Parnassus, and Hippocrene were all an abomination to him. In fancy I can almost hear him now, exclaiming harp. Harp. Liar. Pen and ink, boy, you mean. Muse, boy, muse. Your nurse's daughter, you mean. Perian Spring. Oh, I. The cloister pump, I suppose. Nay, certain introductions, similes, and examples were placed by name on a list of interdiction. Among the similes, there was, I remember, that of the machineal fruit, as suiting equally well with too many subjects, in which however it yielded the palm at once to the example of Alexander and Clytus, which was equally good and apt, whatever might be the theme. Was it ambition? Alexander and Clytus, flattery. Alexander and Clytus, anger, drunkenness, pride, friendship, ingratitude, 
late repentance. Still, still Alexander and Clytus. At length, the praises of agriculture having been exemplified in the sagacious observation that, had Alexander been holding the plough, he would not have run his friend Clytus through with a spear. This tried, and serviceable old friend was banished by public edict in secula seculorum. I have sometimes ventured to think, that a list of this kind, or an index expurgatrius of certain well-known and ever-returning phrases, both introductory, and transitional, including a large assortment of modest egoisms, and flattering elisms, and the like, might be hung up in our law courts, and both houses of parliament, with great advantage to the public, as an important saving of national time, an incalculable relief to his majesty's ministers, but above all, as ensuring the thanks of country attorneys, and their clients, who have private bills to carry through the house. Be this as it may, there was one custom of our masters, which I cannot pass over in silence, because I think it imitable and worthy of imitation. He would often permit our exercises, under some pretext of want of time, to accumulate till each lad had four or five to be looked over. Then placing the whole number abreast on his desk, he would ask the writer, why this or that sentence might not have found as appropriate a place under this or that other thesis, and if no satisfying answer could be returned, and two faults of the same kind were found in one exercise. The irrevocable verdict followed, the exercise was torn up, and another on the same subject to be produced, in addition to the tasks of the day. The reader will, I trust, excuse this tribute of recollection to a man, whose severities, even now, not seldom furnish the dreams by which the blind fancy would fain interpret to the mind the painful sensations of distempered sleep, but neither lessen nor dim the deep sense of my moral and intellectual obligations. He sent us to the university excellent Latin and Greek scholars, and tolerable Hebraists. Yet our classical knowledge was the least of the good gifts which we derived from his zealous and conscientious tutorage. He is now gone to his final reward, full of years, and full of honours, even of those honours, which were dearest to his heart, as gratefully bestowed by that school, and still binding him to the interests of that school, in which he had been himself educated and to which during his whole life he was a dedicated thing. From causes, which this is not the place to investigate, no models of past times, however perfect, can have the same vivid effect on the youthful mind, as the productions of contemporary genius. The discipline, my mind had undergone, any falla erita rotundu so no it versuum cursu, sin sinus, it floribus, sed ut in spicere quidnam sub esit, qua, seds, quod firmamentum, quis fundus verbis, and figures essent mera or natura it orationis fucus, vel sanguinis e materii ipsius cord effluentis rubber quidam nativus it in calcientia genuina, removed all obstacles to the appreciation of excellence in style without diminishing my delight. That I was thus prepared for the perusal of Mr. Bowles's sonnets and earlier poems, at once increased their influence, and my enthusiasm. The great works of past ages seem to a young man things of another race, 
in respect to which his faculties must remain passive and submiss, even as to the stars and mountains. But the writings of a contemporary, perhaps not many years older than himself, surrounded by the same circumstances, and disciplined by the same manners, possess a reality for him and inspire an actual friendship as of a man for a man. His very admiration is the wind which fans and feeds his hope. The poems themselves assume the properties of flesh and blood. To recite, to extol, to contend for them is but the payment of a debt due to one, who exists to receive it. There are indeed modes of teaching which have produced, and are producing, youths of a very different stamp, modes of teaching, in comparison with which we have been called on to despise our great public schools, and universities, in whose halls are hung armory of the invincible knights of old, modes, by which children are to be metamorphosed into prodigies and prodigies with a vengeance have I known thus produced, prodigies of self-conceit, shallowness, arrogance, and infidelity. Instead of storing the memory, during the period when the memory is the predominant faculty, with facts for the after-exercise of the judgment, and instead of awakening by the noblest models the fond and unmixed love and admiration, which is the natural and graceful temper of early youth, these nurslings of improved pedagogy are taught to dispute and decide, to suspect all but their own and their lecturer's wisdom, and to hold nothing sacred from their contempt, but their own contemptible. Arrogance, boy graduates in all the technicals, and in all the dirty passions and impudence of anonymous criticism. To such dispositions alone can the admonition of Pliny be requisite, nec enim debit opribus agisibus, quod vivit. And si interios, quos nunquam vidimus, floruisit, non solum librosagus, verum esham imagines conquire er emus. Ijustum nun con appraisantis, it gratia quasi satiate lang gesset. At hoc pravum, malinum kist, non admirari hominum admiration dignissimum, quia videria, compulcti, nec laudere tantum, verum esham amere contingit. I had just entered on my seventeenth year, when the sonnets of Mr. Bowles, twenty in number, and just then published in a quarto pamphlet, were first made known and presented to me, by a schoolfellow who had quitted us for the university, and who, during the whole time that he was in our first form, or in our school language a Grecian, had been my patron and protector. I refer to Dr. Middleton, the truly learned, and every way excellent Bishop of Calcutta, qui laudibus amplis ingenium celebramium, calamunc solabat, calcaragens animo validum. Non omnia terra obruta, vivit amor, vivit dola, or an agacha dulcia conspiceria, at fear it miminis relictum estimated. It was a double pleasure to me and still remains a tender recollection, that I should have received from a friend so revered the first knowledge of a poet, by whose works, year after year, I was so enthusiastically delighted and inspired. My earliest acquaintances will not have forgotten the undisciplined eagerness and impetuous zeal, with which I laboured to make proselytes not only of my companions, but of all with whom I conversed, of whatever rank, and in whatever place. As my school finances did not permit me to purchase copies, 
I made, within less than a year and a half, more than 40 transcriptions, as the best presents I could offer to those, who had in any way won my regard. And with almost equal delight did I receive the three or four following publications of the same author. Though I have seen and known enough of mankind to be well aware, that I shall perhaps stand alone in my creed, and that it will be well, if I subject myself to no worse charge than that of singularity, I am not therefore deterred from avowing, that I regard, and ever have regarded the obligations of intellect among the most sacred of the claims of gratitude. A valuable thought, or a particular train of thoughts, gives me additional pleasure, when I can safely refer and attribute it to the conversation or correspondence of another. My obligations to Mr. Bowles were indeed important, and for radical good. At a very premature age, even before my fifteenth year, I had bewildered myself in metaphysics, and in theological controversy. Nothing else pleased me. History, and particular facts, lost all interest in my mind. Poetry, though for a schoolboy of that age, I was above par in English versification, and had already produced two or three compositions which, I may venture to say, without reference to my age, were somewhat above mediocrity, and which had gained me more credit than the sound, good sense of my old master was at all pleased with, poetry itself, yet, novels and romances, became insipid to me. In my friendless wanderings on our leave days, for, for I was an orphan, and had scarcely any connections in London, highly was I delighted, if any passenger, especially if he were dressed in black, would enter into conversation with me. For I soon found the means of directing it to my favourite subjects of providence, foreknowledge, will, and fate, fixed fate, free will, foreknowledge absolute, and found no end in wandering mazes lost. This preposterous pursuit was, beyond doubt, injurious both to my natural powers, and to the progress of my education. It would perhaps have been destructive, had it been continued, but from this I was auspiciously withdrawn, partly indeed by an accidental introduction to an amiable family, chiefly however, by the genial influence of a style of poetry, so tender and yet so manly, so natural and real, and yet so dignified and harmonious, as the sonnets and other early poems of Mr. Bowles. Well would it have been for me, perhaps, had I never relapsed into the same mental disease, if I had continued to pluck the flower and reap the harvest from the cultivated surface, instead of delving in the unwholesome quicksilver mines of metaphysic law. And if in after time I have sought a refuge from bodily pain and mismanaged sensibility in abstruse researches, which exercised the strength and subtlety of the understanding without awakening the feelings of the heart, still there was a long and blessed interval, during which my natural faculties were allowed to expand, and my original tendencies to develop themselves my fancy, and the love of nature, and the sense of beauty in forms and sounds. The second advantage, which I owe to my early perusal, and admiration of these poems, to which let me add, though known to me at a somewhat later period, the Lusden Hill of Mr. Crow bears more immediately on my present subject. Among those with whom I conversed, there were, of course, 
very many who had formed their taste and their notions of poetry from the writings of Pope and his followers, or to speak more generally, in that school of French poetry, condensed and invigorated by English understanding, which had predominated from the last century. I was not blind to the merits of this school, yet, as from inexperience of the world, and consequent want of sympathy with the general subjects of these poems, they gave me little pleasure, I doubtless undervalued the kind, and with the presumption of youth withheld from its masters the legitimate name of poets. I saw that the excellence of this kind consisted in just and acute observations on men and manners in an artificial state of society, as its matter and substance, and in the logic of wit, conveyed in smooth and strong epigrammatic couplets, as its form, that even when the subject was addressed to the fancy, or the intellect, as in the rape of the lock, or the essay on man, nay, when it was a consecutive narration, as in that astonishing product of matchless talent and ingenuity popes. Translation of the Iliad, still a point was looked for at the end of each second line, and the whole was, as it were, a srites, or, if I may exchange a logical for a grammatical metaphor, a conjunction disjunctive, of epigrams. Meantime the matter and diction seemed to me characterized not so much by poetic thoughts, as by thoughts translated into the language of poetry. On this last point, I had occasion to render my own thoughts gradually more and more plain to myself, by frequent amicable disputes concerning Darwin's botanic garden, which, for some years, was greatly extolled, not only by the reading public in general, but even by those whose genius and natural robustness of understanding enabled them afterwards to act foremost in dissipating these painted mists that occasionally rise from the marshes at the foot of Parnassus. During my first Cambridge vacation, I assisted a friend in a contribution for a literary society in Devonshire and in this I remember to have compared Darwin's work to the Russian palace of ice, glittering, cold and transitory. In the same essay too, I assigned sundry reasons, chiefly drawn from a comparison of passages in the Latin poets with the original Greek, from which they were borrowed, for the preference of Collins's odes to those of Gray and of the simile in Shakespeare how like a yunker or a prodigal the scarfed bark puts from her native bay, hugged and embraced by the strumpet wind. How like the prodigal doth she return, with over-weathered ribs and ragged sails, lean, rent, and beggar by the strumpet wind. Merch of Venact 2 SC 6 to the imitation in the bud, fair laughs the morn, and soft the zephyr blows while proudly riding o'er the azure realm in gallant trim the gilded vessel goes, youth at the prow and pleasure at the helm, regardless of the sweeping whirlwind's sway, that hush thee in grim repose, expects its evening prey. In which, by the by, the words realm and sway are rhymes dearly purchased, I preferred the original on the ground, that in the imitation it depended wholly on the compositor's putting, or not putting, a small capital, both in this, and in many other passages of the same poet, whether the words should be personifications, or mere abstractions. I mention this, because, in referring various lines in Gray to their original in Shakespeare and Milton, and in the clear perception how completely all the propriety was lost in the transfer, I was, 
at that early period, led to a conjecture, which, many years afterwards was recalled to me from the same thought having been started in conversation, but far more ably, and developed more fully, by Mr. Wordsworth, namely, that this style of poetry, which I have characterized above, as translations of prose thoughts into poetic language, had been kept up by, if it did not wholly arise from, the custom of writing Latin verses, and the great importance attached to these exercises, in our public schools. Whatever might have been the case in the 15th century, when the use of the Latin tongue was so general among learned men, that Erasmus is said to have forgotten his native language, yet in the present day it is not to be supposed, that a youth can think in Latin, or that he can have any other reliance on the force or fitness of his phrases, but the authority of the writer from whom he has adopted them. Consequently he must first prepare his thoughts, and then pick out, from Virgil, Horace, Ovid, or perhaps more compendiously from his gradus, halves and quarters of lines, in which to embody them. I never object to a certain degree of disputatiousness in a young man from the age of seventeen to that of four or five and twenty, provided I find him always arguing on one side of the question. The controversies occasioned by my unfeigned zeal for the honour of a favourite contemporary, then known to me only by his works, were of great advantage in the formation and establishment of my taste and critical opinions. In my defence of the lines running into each other, instead of closing at each couplet, and of natural language, neither bookish, nor vulgar, neither redolent of the lamp, nor of the kennel, such as I will remember thee, instead of the same thought tricked up in the ragfair finery of thy image on her wing before my fancies I shall memory bring, I had continually to add use the metre and diction of the Greek poets, from Homer to Theocritus inclusively, and still more of our elder English poets from Chaucer to Milton. Nor was this all. But as it was my constant reply to authorities brought against me from later poets of great name, that no authority could avail in opposition to truth, nature, logic, and the laws of universal grammar, actuated too by my former passion for metaphysical investigations, I laboured at a solid foundation, on which permanently to ground my opinions, in the component faculties of the human mind itself, and their comparative dignity and importance. According to the faculty or source, from which the pleasure given by any poem or passage was derived, I estimated the merit of such poem or passage. As the result of all my reading and meditation, I abstracted two critical aphorisms, deeming them to comprise the conditions and criteria of poetic style, first, that not the poem which we have read, but that to which we return, with the greatest pleasure, possesses the genuine power, and claims the name of essential poetry, secondly, that whatever lines can be translated into other words of the same language, without diminution of their significance, either in sense or association, or in any worthy feeling, are so far vicious in their diction. Be it however observed, that I excluded from the list of worthy feelings, the pleasure derived from mere novelty in the reader, and the desire of exciting wonderment at his powers in the author. Oftentimes since then, 
in pursuing French tragedies, I have fancied two marks of admiration at the end of each line, as hieroglyphics of the author's own admiration at his own cleverness. Our genuine admiration of a great poet is a continuous undercurrent of feeling. It is everywhere present, but seldom anywhere as a separate excitement. I was wont boldly to affirm, that it would be scarcely more difficult to push a stone out from the pyramids with the bare hand, than to alter a word, or the position of a word, in Milton or Shakespeare, in their most important works at least, without making the poet say something else, or something worse, than he does say. One great distinction. I appeared to myself to see plainly between even the characteristic faults of our elder poets, and the false beauty of the moderns. In the former, from Dunn to Cowley, we find the most fantastic out-of-the-way thoughts, but in the most pure and genuine Mother English, in the latter the most obvious thoughts, in language the most fantastic and arbitrary. Our faulty elder poets sacrificed the passion and passionate flow of poetry to the subtleties of intellect and to the stars of wit, the moderns to the glare and glitter of a perpetual, yet broken and heterogeneous imagery, or rather to an amphibious something, made up, half of image, and half of abstract, five, meaning. The one sacrificed the heart to the head, the other both heart and head to point and drapery. The reader must make himself acquainted with the general style of composition that was at that time deemed poetry, in order to understand and account for the effect produced on me by the sonnets, the monody at Matlock, and the hope, of Mr. Bowles for it is peculiar to original genius to become less and less striking, in proportion to its success in improving the taste and judgment of its contemporaries. The poems of West, indeed, had the merit of chaste and manly diction, but they were cold, and, if I may so express it, only dead-coloured, while in the best of Wharton's there is a stiffness which too often gives them the appearance of imitations from the Greek. Whatever relation, therefore, of cause or impulse Perse's collection of ballads may bear to the most popular poems of the present day, yet in a more sustained and elevated style, of the then living poets, Cowper and Bowles, six, were, to the best of my knowledge, the first who combined natural thoughts with natural diction, the first who reconciled the heart with the head. It is true, as I have before mentioned, that from diffidence in my own powers, I for a short time adopted a laborious and florid diction, which I myself deemed, if not absolutely vicious, yet of very inferior worth. Gradually, however, my practice conformed to my better judgment, and the compositions of my twenty-fourth and twenty-fifth years, for example, the shorter blank verse poems, the lines, which now form the middle and conclusion of the poem entitled The Destiny of Nations, and The Tragedy of Remorse are not more below my present ideal in respect of the general tissue of the style than those of the latest date. Their faults were at least a remnant of the form eleven, and among the many who have done me the honour of putting my poems in the same class with those of my betters, the one or two, who have pretended to bring examples of affected simplicity from my volume have been able to add use but one instance, and that out of a copy of verses half ludicrous, half splenetic, which I intended, and had myself characterized, 
as Sir Money Propira. Every reform, however necessary, will by weak minds be carried to an excess, which will itself need reforming. The reader will excuse me for noticing, that I myself was the first to expose Rizu Honesto the three sins of poetry, one or the other of which is the most likely to beset a young writer. So long ago as the publication of the second number of the monthly magazine, under the name of Nehemiah Higginbottom, I contributed three sonnets, the first of which had for its object to excite a good-natured laugh at the spirit of doleful egotism, and at the recurrence of favourite phrases, with the double defect of being at once trite and licentious. The second was on low creeping language and thoughts, under the pretense of simplicity. The third, the phrases of which were borrowed entirely from my own poems, on the indiscriminate use of elaborate and swelling language and imagery. The reader will find them in the note, 7, below and will I trust regard them as reprinted for biographical purposes alone, and not for their poetic merits. So general at that time, and so decided was the opinion concerning the characteristic vices of my style, that a celebrated physician, now, alas, no more, speaking of me in other respects with his usual kindness, to a gentleman, who was about to meet me at a dinner party, could not however resist giving him a hint not to mention the house that Jack built in my presence, for that I was as sore as a boil about that sonnet, he not knowing that I was myself the author of it. Chapter 2 Supposed Irritability of Men of Genius Brought to the Test of Facts causes and occasions of the charge, its injustice. I have often thought, that it would be neither uninstructive nor unamusing to analyze, and bring forward into distinct consciousness, that complex feeling, with which readers in general take part against the author, in favor of the critic and the readiness with which they apply to all poets the old sarcasm of Horace upon the scribblers of his time, genus irritabile vitum. A debility and dimness of the imaginative power, and a consequent necessity of reliance on the immediate impressions of the senses, do, we know well, render the mind liable to superstition and fanaticism. Having a deficient portion of internal and proper warmth, minds of this class seek in the crowd circumfina for a warmth in common, which they do not possess singly. Cold and phlegmatic in their own nature, like damp hay, they heat and inflame by coacervation, or like bees they become restless and irritable through the increased temperature of collected multitudes. Hence the German word for fanaticism, such at least was its original import, is derived from the swarming of bees, namely, Pschwarman, Pschwarami. The passion being in an inverse proportion to the insight, that the more vivid, as this the less distinct, anger is the inevitable consequence. The absence of all foundation within their own minds for that, which they yet believe both true and indispensable to their safety and happiness, cannot but produce an uneasy state of feeling, an involuntary sense of fear from which nature has no means of rescuing herself but by anger. Experience informs us that the first defense of weak minds is to recriminate. There's no philosopher but sees, that rage and fear are one disease, though that may burn, and this may freeze, they are both alike the egg. But where the ideas are vivid, 
and there exists an endless power of combining and modifying them. The feelings and affections blend more easily and intimately with these ideal creations than with the objects of the senses. The mind is affected by thoughts, rather than by things, and only then feels the requisite interest even for the most important events and accidents, when by means of meditation they have passed into thoughts. The sanity of the mind is between superstition with fanaticism on the one hand, and enthusiasm with indifference and a diseased slowness to action on the other. For the conceptions of the mind may be so vivid and adequate, as to preclude that impulse to the realizing of them, which is strongest and most restless in those, who possess more than mere talent or the faculty of appropriating and applying the knowledge of others, yet still want something of the creative and self-sufficing power of absolute genius. For this reason therefore, they are men of commanding genius. While the former rest content between thought and reality, as it were in an intermundium of which their own living spirit supplies the substance, and their imagination the ever-varying form, the latter must impress their preconceptions on the world without, in order to present them back to their own view with the satisfying degree of clearness, distinctness, and individuality. These in tranquil times are formed to exhibit a perfect poem in palace, or temple, or landscape garden or a tale of romance in canals that join sea with sea, or in walls of rock, which, shouldering back the billows, imitate the power, and supply the benevolence of nature to sheltered navies, or in aqueducts that, arching the wide vale from mountain to mountain, give a palmyra to the desert. But alas! In times of tumult they are the men destined to come forth as the shaping spirit of ruin, to destroy the wisdom of ages in order to substitute the fancies of a day, and to change kings and kingdoms, as the wind shifts and shapes the clouds. 8. The records of biography seem to confirm this theory. The men of the greatest genius as far as we can judge from their own works or from the accounts of their contemporaries, appear to have been of calm and tranquil temper in all that related to themselves. In the inward assurance of permanent fame, they seem to have been either indifferent or resigned with regard to immediate reputation. Through all the works of Chaucer there reigns a cheerfulness a manly hilarity which makes it almost impossible to doubt a correspondent habit of feeling in the author himself. Shakespeare's evenness and sweetness of temper were almost proverbial in his own age. That this did not arise from ignorance of his own comparative greatness, we have abundant proof in his sonnets, which could scarcely have been known to Pope. 9. When he asserted, that our great bard grew immortal in his own despite. Epist to Augustus. Speaking of one whom he had celebrated, and contrasting the duration of his works with that of his personal existence, Shakespeare adds, Your name from hence immortal life shall have, though I once gone to all the world must die. The earth can yield me but a common grave, when you entombed in men's eyes shall lie. Your monument shall be my gentle verse, which eyes not yet created shall o'erread, and tongues to be your being shall rehearse, when all the breathers of this world are dead, you still shall live, such virtueth my pen, where breath most breathes, e'en in the mouth of men. Sonnet Luxxi. I have taken the first that occurred, 
but Shakespeare's readiness to praise his rivals, or Plano, and the confidence of his own equality with those whom he deemed most worthy of his praise, are alike manifested in another sonnet. Was it the proud full sail of his great verse, bound for the praise of all too precious you, that did my ripe thoughts in my brain in hers, making their tomb, the womb wherein they grew? Was it his spirit, by spirits taught to write above a mortal pitch that struck me dead? No, neither he, nor his compeers by night giving him aid my verse astonished. He, nor that affable familiar ghost, which nightly gulls him with intelligence, as victors of my silence cannot boast, I was not sick of any fear from thence. But when your countenance filled e up his line, then lack d i matter, that enfeebled mine. S -x 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 -v. In Spencer, Indeed, we trace a mind constitutionally tender, delicate, and, in comparison with his three great compeers, I had almost said, effeminate, and this additionally saddened by the unjust persecution of Burley, and the severe calamities, which overwhelmed his latter days. These causes have diffused over all his compositions a melancholy grace and have drawn forth occasional strains, the more pathetic from their gentleness. But nowhere do we find the least trace of irritability, and still less of quarrelsome or affected contempt of his censurers. The same calmness, and even greater self-possession, may be affirmed of Milton, as far as his poems, and poetic character are concerned. He reserved his anger for the enemies of religion, freedom, and his country. My mind is not capable of forming a more august conception, than arises from the contemplation of this great man in his latter days, poor, sick, old, blind slandered, persecuted dash darkness before, and danger's voice behind dash in an age in which he was as little understood by the party, for whom, as by that against whom, he had contended, and among men before whom he strode so far as to dwarf himself by the distance, yet still listening to the music of his own thoughts, or if additionally cheered, yet cheered only by the prophetic faith of two or three solitary individuals, he did nevertheless argue not against heaven's hand or will, nor bait a jot of heart or hope, but still bore up and steered e right onward. From others only do we derive our knowledge that Milton, in his latter day, had his scorners and detractors and even in his day of youth and hope, that he had enemies would have been unknown to us, had they not been likewise the enemies of his country. I am well aware, that in advanced stages of literature, when there exist many and excellent models, a high degree of talent, combined with taste and judgment, and employed in works of imagination, will acquire for a man the name of a great genius, though even that analogon of genius, which, in certain states of society, may even render his writings more popular than the absolute reality could have done, would be sought for in vain in the mind and temper of the author himself. Yet even in instances of this kind, a close examination will often detect, that the irritability, which has been attributed to the author's genius as its cause, did really originate in an ill conformation of body, obtuse pain, or constitutional defect of pleasurable sensation. What is charged to the author, belongs to the man, who would probably have been still more impatient 
but for the humanizing influences of the very pursuit, which yet bears the blame of his irritability. How then are we to explain the easy credence generally given to this charge, if the charge itself be not, as I have endeavoured to show, supported by experience? This seems to me of no very difficult solution. In whatever country literature is widely diffused, there will be many who mistake an intense desire to possess the reputation of poetic genius, for the actual powers, and original tendencies which constitute it. But men, whose dearest wishes are fixed on objects wholly out of their own power, become in all cases more or less impatient and prone to anger. Besides, though it may be paradoxical to assert, that a man can know one thing and believe the opposite, yet assuredly a vain person may have so habitually indulged the wish, and persevered in the attempt, to appear what he is not, as to become himself one of his own proselytes. Still, as this counterfeit and artificial persuasion must differ, even in the person's own feelings, from a real sense of inward power, what can be more natural, than that this difference should betray itself in suspicious and jealous irritability? Even as the flowery sod, which covers a hollow, may be often detected by its shaking and trembling. But, alas! The multitude of books and the general diffusion of literature, have produced other and more lamentable effects in the world of letters, and such as are abundant to explain, though by no means to justify, the contempt with which the best grounded complaints of injured genius are rejected as frivolous, or entertained as matter of merriment. In the days of Chaucer and Gower, our language might, with due allowance for the imperfections of a simile, be compared to a wilderness of vocal reeds, from which the favourites only of Pan or Apollo could construct even the rude syrinx, and from this the constructors alone could elicit strains of music. But now, partly by the labours of successive poets, and in part by the more artificial state of society and social intercourse, language, mechanized as it were into a barrel organ, supplies at once both instrument and tune. Thus even the deaf may play, so as to delight the many. Sometimes, for it is with similes, as it is with jests at a wine-table, one is sure to suggest another. I have attempted to illustrate the present state of our language, in its relation to literature, by a press-room of larger and smaller stereotype pieces, which, in the present Anglo-Gallican fashion of unconnected, epigrammatic periods, it requires but an ordinary portion of ingenuity to vary indefinitely, and yet still produce something, which, if not sense, will be so like it as to do as, well, perhaps better, for it spares the reader the trouble of thinking, prevents vacancy, while it indulges indolence, and secures the memory from all danger of an intellectual plethora. Hence of all trades, literature at present demands the least talent or information, and, of all modes of literature, the manufacturing of poems. The difference indeed between these and the works of genius is not less than between an egg and an eggshell, yet at a distance they both look alike. Now it is no less remarkable than true, with how little examination works of polite literature are commonly perused, not only by the mass of readers, but by men of first-rate ability, till some accident or chance, 
10, discussion have roused their attention, and put them on their guard. And hence individuals below mediocrity not less in natural power than in acquired knowledge, nay, bunglers who have failed in the lowest mechanic crafts, and whose presumption is in due proportion to their want of sense and sensibility, men, who being first scribblers from idleness and ignorance, next become libelers from envy and malevolence have been able to drive a successful trade in the employment of the booksellers, nay, have raised themselves into temporary name and reputation with the public at large, by that most powerful of all adulation, the appeal to the bad and malignant passions of mankind, 11. But as it is the nature of scorn, envy, and all malignant propensities to require a quick change of objects, such writers are sure, sooner or later, to awake from their dream of vanity to disappointment and neglect with embittered and envenomed feelings. Even during their short-lived success, sensible in spite of themselves on what a shifting foundation it rests, they resent the mere refusal of praise as a robbery, and at the justest censures kindle at once into violent and undisciplined abuse, till the acute disease changing into chronicle, the more deadly as the less violent, they become the fit instruments of literary detraction and moral slander. They are then no longer to be questioned without exposing the complainant to ridicule, because, forsooth, they are anonymous critics, and authorized, in Andrew Marvel's phrase, as synodical individuals to speak of themselves plurali majestatico. As if literature formed a caste, like that of the Paras in Hindustan, who, however maltreated, must not dare to deem themselves wronged. As if that, which in all other cases adds a deeper dye to slander, the circumstance of its being anonymous, here acted only to make the slanderer inviolable. 12. Thus, in part, from the accidental tempers of individuals, men of undoubted talent, but not men of genius, tempers rendered yet more irritable by their desire to appear men of genius, but still more effectively by the excesses of the mere counterfeits both of talent and genius, the number two being so incomparably greater of those who are thought to be, than of those who really are men of genius, and in part from the natural, but not therefore the less partial and unjust distinction made by the public itself between literary and all other property, I believe the prejudice to have arisen, which considers an unusual irascibility concerning the reception of its products as characteristic of genius. It might correct the moral feelings of a numerous class of readers, to suppose a review set on foot the object of which should be to criticize all the chief works presented to the public by our ribbon weavers, calico printers, cabinet makers, and china manufacturers, which should be conducted in the same spirit, and take the same freedom with personal character, as our literary journals. They would scarcely, I think, deny their belief not only that the genus irritabile would be found to include many other species besides that of bards, but that the irritability of trade would soon reduce the resentments of poets into mere shadow fights in the comparison. Or is wealth the only rational object of human interest? Or even if this were admitted, has the poet no property in his works? Or is it a rare, or culpable case, that he who serves at the altar of the muses, 
should be compelled to derive his maintenance from the altar, when too he has perhaps deliberately abandoned the fairest prospects of rank and opulence in order to devote himself, an entire and undistracted man, to the instruction or refinement of his fellow citizens. Or, should we pass by all higher objects and motives, all disinterested benevolence, and even that ambition of lasting praise which is at once the crutch and ornament, which at once supports and betrays, the infirmity of human virtue, is the character and property of the man, who labours for our intellectual pleasures, less entitled to a share of our fellow feeling, than that of the wine merchant or milliner. Sensibility indeed, both quick and deep, is not only a characteristic feature, but may be deemed a component part, of genius. But it is not less an essential mark of true genius, that its sensibility is excited by any other cause more powerfully than by its own personal interests, for this plain reason that the man of genius lives most in the ideal world, in which the present is still constituted by the future or the past, and because his feelings have been habitually associated with thoughts and images, to the number, clearness, and vivacity of which the sensation of self is always in an inverse proportion. And yet, should he perchance have occasion to repel some false charge, or to rectify some erroneous censure, nothing is more common than for the many to mistake the general liveliness of his manner and language, whatever is the subject, for the effects of peculiar irritation from its accidental relation to himself. 13. For myself, if from my own feelings, or from the less suspicious test of the observations of others, I had been made aware of any literary testiness or jealousy, I trust, that I should have been, however, neither silly nor arrogant enough to have burthened the imperfection on genius. But an experience, and I should not need documents in abundance to prove my words, if I added, a tried experience of twenty years, has taught me, that the original sin of my character consists in a careless indifference to public opinion, and to the attacks of those who influence it, that praise and admiration have become yearly less and less desirable, except as marks of sympathy nay that it is difficult and distressing to me to think with any interest even about the sale and profit of my works, important as, in my present circumstances, such considerations must needs be. Yet it never occurred to me to believe or fancy, that the quantum of intellectual power bestowed on me by nature or education was in any way connected with this habit of my feelings, or that it needed any other parents or fosterers than constitutional indolence, aggravated into languor by ill health, the accumulating embarrassments of procrastination, the mental cowardice, which is the inseparable companion of procrastination, and which makes us anxious to think and converse on anything rather than on what concerns ourselves, in fine, all those close vexations, whether chargeable on my faults or my fortunes, which leave me but little grief to spare for evils comparatively distant and alien. Indignation at literary wrongs I leave to men born under happier stars. I cannot afford it. But so far from condemning those who can, I deem it a writer's duty, and think it creditable to his heart, to feel and express a resentment proportioned to the grossness of the provocation, and the importance of the object. 
There is no profession on earth, which requires an attention so early, so long, or so unintermitting as that of poetry, and indeed as that of literary composition in general, if it be such as at all satisfies the demands both of taste and of sound logic. How difficult and delicate a task even the mere mechanism of verse is, may be conjectured from the failure of those, who have attempted poetry late in life. Where then a man has, from his earliest youth, devoted his whole being to an object, which by the admission of all civilized nations in all ages is honorable as a pursuit, and glorious as an attainment, what of all that relates to himself and his family, if only we accept his moral character, can have fairer claims to his protection, or more authorize acts of self-defense, than the elaborate products of his intellect and intellectual industry. Prudence itself would command us to show even if defect or diversion of natural sensibility had prevented us from feeling, a due interest and qualified anxiety for the offspring and representatives of our nobler being. I know it, alas! By woeful experience. I have laid too many eggs in the hot sands of this wilderness, the world with ostrich carelessness and ostrich oblivion. The greater part indeed have been trod underfoot, and are forgotten, but yet no small number have crept forth into life, some to furnish feathers for the caps of others, and still more to plume the shafts in the quivers of my enemies, of them that unprovoked have lain in wait against my soul. Sick those non vobis, maleficatis, apes. Chapter 3 The Author's Obligations to Critics, and the Probable Occasion, Principles of Modern Criticism, Mr. Southey's Works and Character. To anonymous critics in reviews, magazines, and news journals of various name and rank and to satirists with or without a name in verse or prose, or in verse text aided by prose comment, I do seriously believe and profess, that I owe full two-thirds of whatever reputation and publicity I happen to possess. For when the name of an individual has occurred so frequently, in so many works, for so great a length of time, the readers of these works, which with a shelf or two of beauties, elegant extracts and annas, form nine-tenths of the reading of the reading public, fourteen, cannot but be familiar with the name, without distinctly remembering whether it was introduced for eulogy or for censure. And this becomes the more likely, if, as I believe, the habit of perusing periodical works may be properly added to a Verus catalogue of antimnemonics, or weakeners of the memory, 15. But where this has not been the case, yet the reader will be apt to suspect that there must be something more than usually strong and extensive in a reputation that could either require or stand so merciless and long-continued a cannonading. Without any feeling of anger therefore, for which indeed, on my own account, I have no pretext, I may yet be allowed to express some degree of surprise, that, after having run the critical gauntlet for a certain class of faults which I had, nothing having come before the judgment seat in the interim, I should, year after year, quarter after quarter, month after month, not to mention sundry petty periodicals of still quicker revolution, or weekly or diurnal, have been, for at least seventeen years consecutively, dragged forth by them into the foremost ranks of the prescribed, 
and forced to abide the brunt of abuse, for faults directly opposite, and which I certainly had not. How shall I explain this? Whatever may have been the case with others, I certainly cannot attribute this persecution to personal dislike, or to envy, or to feelings of vindictive animosity. Not to the former, for with the exception of a very few who are my intimate friends, and were so before they were known as authors, I have had little other acquaintance with literary characters, than what may be implied in an accidental introduction, or casual meeting in a mixed company. And as far as words and looks can be trusted, I must believe that, even in these instances, I had excited no unfriendly disposition. Neither by letter, nor in conversation, have I ever had dispute or controversy beyond the common social interchange of opinions. Nay, where I had reason to suppose my convictions fundamentally different, it has been my habit, and I may add, the impulse of my nature, to assign the grounds of my belief, rather than the belief itself, and not to express dissent, till I could establish some points of complete sympathy, some grounds common to both sides, from which to commence its explanation. Still less can I place these attacks to the charge of envy. The few pages which I have published, are of too distant a date, and the extent of their sale a proof too conclusive against their having been popular at any time, to render probable, I had almost said possible, the excitement of envy on their account, and the man who should envy me on any other. Verily he must be envy mad. Lastly, with as little semblance of reason, could I suspect any animosity towards me from vindictive feelings as the cause. I have before said, that my acquaintance with literary men has been limited and distant, and that I have had neither dispute nor controversy. From my first entrance into life, I have, with few and short intervals, lived either abroad or in retirement. My different essays on subjects of national interest, published at different times, first in the Morning Post and then in the Courier, with my courses of lectures on the principles of criticism as applied to Shakespeare and Milton, constitute my whole publicity the only occasions on which I could offend any member of the Republic of Letters. With one solitary exception in which my words were first misstated and then wantonly applied to an individual, I could never learn that I had excited the displeasure of any among my literary contemporaries. Having announced my intention to give a course of lectures on the characteristic merits and defects of English poetry in its different eras, first, from Chaucer to Milton, second, from Dreden inclusively to Thomson, and third, from Cowper to the present day, I changed my plan, and confined my disquisition to the former two periods that I might furnish no possible pretext for the unthinking to misconstrue, or the malignant to misapply my words, and having stamped their own meaning on them, to pass them as current coin in the marts of garrulity or detraction. Praises of the unworthy are felt by ardent minds as robberies of the deserving, and it is too true and too frequent, that Bacon, Harrington, Machiavel, and Spinoza, are not read, because Hume, Condillac, and Voltaire are. But in promiscuous company no prudent man will oppugn the merits of a contemporary in his own supposed department, 
contenting himself with praising in his turn those whom he deems excellent. If I should ever deem it my duty at all to oppose the pretensions of individuals, I would oppose them in books which could be weighed and answered, in which I could evolve the whole of my reasons and feelings, with their requisite limits and modifications, not in irrecoverable conversation, where however strong the reasons might be, the feelings that prompted them would assuredly be attributed by some one or other to envy and discontent. Besides I well know, and, I trust, have acted on that knowledge, that it must be the ignorant and injudicious who extol the unworthy, and the eulogies of critics without taste or judgment are the natural reward of authors without feeling or genius. Sint uniquix sua premia. How then, dismissing, as I do, these three causes, am I to account for attacks, the long continuance and inveteracy of which it would require all three to explain? The solution seems to be this, I was in habits of intimacy with Mr. Wordsworth and Mr. Southey. This, however, transfers, rather than removes the difficulty. Be it, that, by an unconscionable extension of the old adage, nositer associo, my literary friends are never under the waterfall of criticism but I must be wet through with the spray, yet how came the torrent to descend upon them? First then, with regard to Mr. Southey. I well remember the general reception of his earlier publications, namely, the poems published with Mr. Lovell under the names of Martius and Byron, the two volumes of poems under his own name, and the Joan of Arc. The censures of the critics by profession are extant, and may be easily referred to, careless lines, inequality in the merit of the different poems, and, in the lighter works, a predilection for the strange and whimsical, in short, such faults as might have been anticipated in a young and rapid writer, were indeed sufficiently enforced. Nor was there at that time wanting a party spirit to aggravate the defects of a poet, who with all the courage of uncorrupted youth had avowed his zeal for a cause, which he deemed that of liberty, and his abhorrence of oppression by whatever name consecrated. But it was as little objected by others, as dreamed of by the poet himself that he preferred careless and prosaic lines on rule and of forethought, or indeed that he pretended to any other art or theory of poetic diction, except that which we may all learn from Horace, Quintilian, the admirable dialogue, De Oratribus, generally attributed to Tacitus, or Strada's prelusions if indeed natural good sense and the early study of the best models in his own language had not infused the same maxims. More securely, and, if I may venture the expression, more vitally. All that could have been fairly deduced was, that in his taste and estimation of writers Mr. Southey agreed far more with Thomas Wharton than with Dr. Johnson. Nor do I mean to deny, that at all times Mr. Southey was of the same mind with Sir Philip Sidney in preferring an excellent ballad in the humblest style of poetry to twenty indifferent poems that strutted in the highest. And by what have his works, published since then, been characterized? each more strikingly than the preceding, but by greater splendor, a deeper pathos, profounder reflections, and a more sustained dignity of language and of metre. Distant may the period be, but whenever the time shall come, 
when all his works shall be collected by some editor worthy to be his biographer, I trust that an appendix of excerpta of all the passages, in which his writings, name, and character have been attacked, from the pamphlets and periodical works of the last twenty years, may be an accompaniment. Yet that it would prove medicinal in after times I dare not hope, for as long as there are readers to be delighted with calumny, there will be found reviewers to calumniate. And such readers will become in all probability more numerous, in proportion as a still greater diffusion of literature shall produce an increase of sciolists, and sciolism bring with it petulance and presumption. In times of old, books were as religious oracles, as literature advanced, they next became venerable preceptors, they then descended to the rank of instructive friends, and, as their numbers increased, they sank still lower to that of entertaining companions, and at present they seem degraded into culprits to hold up their hands at the bar of every self-elected, yet not the less peremptory, judge, who chooses to write from humour or interest, from enmity or arrogance, and to abide the decision of him that reads in malice, or him that reads after dinner. The same retrograde movement may be traced, in the relation which the authors themselves have assumed towards their readers. From the lofty address of Bacon, these are the meditations of Francis of Verulam, which that posterity should be possessed of, he deemed their interest or from dedication to monarch or pontiff, in which the honour given was asserted in equipoise to the patronage acknowledged, from Pindar's, E.P. Alloy, Psi D. Alloy Megaloy, to D. S. J. Tan Corifauti Basilensi. Make it I papped in portion. E. I. A. E. S. E. Tet out an up sucranon patin, im tet osad nikaphoroi samilane, profantan sophian kathelanazi on to panta dot, a limp. O. D. I there was a gradual sinking in the etiquette or allowed style of pretension. Poets and philosophers, rendered diffident by their very number, addressed themselves to learned readers, then aimed to conciliate the graces of the candid reader, till, the critic still rising as the author sank, the amateurs of literature collectively were erected into a municipality of judges, and addressed as the town. And now, finally, all men being supposed able to read, and all readers able to judge, the multitudinous public, shaped into personal unity by the magic of abstraction, sits nominal despot on the throne of criticism. But, Alas! As in other despotisms, it but echoes the decisions of its invisible ministers, whose intellectual claims to the guardianship of the muses seem, for the greater part, analogous to the physical qualifications which adapt their oriental brethren for the superintendence of the harem. Thus it is said, that Saint Nepomuk was installed the guardian of bridges, because he had fallen over one, and sunk out of sight. Thus too Saint Cecilia is said to have been first propitiated by musicians, because, having failed in her own attempts, she had taken a dislike to the art and all its successful professors. But I shall probably have occasion hereafter to deliver my convictions more at large concerning this state of things, and its influences on taste, genius and morality. In the Thalabar, the Maduk, and still more evidently in the Unique, 16, Sid, in the Kihama, and, as last, so best, the Roderick, 
so they has given abundant proof. Se cogita quam sit magnum dera liquid in manus hominum, nec persuaderia sibi posse, non sip tractandum quod placeria it semper it omnibus cupid. But on the other hand, I conceive, that Mr. Southey was quite unable to comprehend, wherein could consist the crime or mischief of printing half a dozen or more playful poems, or to speak more generally, compositions which would be enjoyed or passed over, according as the taste and humour of the reader might chance to be, provided they contained nothing immoral. In the present age perichery passer or shartai is emphatically an unreasonable demand. The merest trifle he ever sent abroad had tenfold better claims to its ink and paper than all the silly criticisms on it, which proved no more than that the critic was not one of those, for whom the trifle was written and then all the grave exhortations to a greater reverence for the public, as if the passive page of a book, by having an epigram or doggerel tale impressed on it, instantly assumed at once locomotive power and a sort of ubiquity, so as to flutter and buzz in the ear of the public. To the sore annoyance of the said mysterious personage, but what gives an additional and more ludicrous absurdity to these lamentations is the curious fact, that if in a volume of poetry the critic should find poem or passage which he deems more especially worthless, he is sure to select and reprint it in the review, by which, on his own grounds, he wastes as much more paper than the author as the copies of a fashionable review are more numerous than those of the original book, in some, and those the most prominent instances, as 10,000 to 500. I know nothing that surpasses the vileness of deciding on the merits of a poet or painter, not by characteristic defects, for where there is genius, these always point to his characteristic beauties, but, by accidental failures or faulty passages, accept the impudence of defending it, as the proper duty, and most instructive part, of criticism. Omit or pass slightly over the expression, grace, and grouping of Raphael's figures, but ridicule in detail the knitting needles and broom twigs, that are to represent trees in his backgrounds, and never let him hear the last of his gorlipots. Admit that the Allegro and Penseroso of Milton are not without merit, but repay yourself for this concession, by reprinting at length the two poems on the university carrier. As a fair specimen of his sonnets, quote a book was writ of late called Tetracordon, and, as characteristic of his rhythm and metre, cite his literal translation of the first and second psalm. In order to justify yourself, you need only assert, that had you dwelled chiefly on the beauties and excellences of the poet, the admiration of these might seduce the attention of future writers from the objects of their love and wonder, to an imitation of the few poems and passages in which the poet was most unlike himself. But till reviews are conducted on far other principles, and with far other motives, till in the place of arbitrary dictation and petulant sneers, the reviewers support their decisions by reference to fixed canons of criticism, previously established and deduced from the nature of man, reflecting minds will pronounce it arrogance in them thus to announce themselves to men of letters, as the guides of their taste and judgment. To the purchaser and mere reader it is, at all events, an injustice. 
He who tells me that there are defects in a new work, tells me nothing which I should not have taken for granted without his information. But he, who points out and elucidates the beauties of an original work does indeed give me interesting information, such as experience would not have authorized me in anticipating. And as to compositions which the authors themselves announce with he kipsi novimus s nile, why should we judge by a different rule two printed works, only because the one author is alive, and the other in his grave? What literary man has not regretted the prudery of Spratt in refusing to let his friend Cowley appear in his slippers and dressing gown? I am not perhaps the only one who has derived an innocent amusement from the riddles, conundrums, trisyllable lines, and the like, of Swift and his correspondents, in hours of languor, when to have read his more finished works would have been useless to myself, and, in some sort, an act of injustice to the author. But I am at a loss to conceive by what perversity of judgment, these relaxations of his genius could be employed to diminish his fame as the writer of Gulliver, or the tale of a tub. Had Mr. Southey written twice as many poems of inferior merit, or partial interest, as have enlivened the journals of the day, they would have added to his honour with good and wise men not merely or principally as proving the versatility of his talents, but as evidences of the purity of that mind, which even in its levities never dictated a line which it need regret on any moral account. I have in imagination transferred to the future biographer the duty of contrasting Southey's fixed and well-earned fame with the abuse and indefatigable hostility of his anonymous critics from his early youth to his ripest manhood. But I cannot think so ill of human nature as not to believe, that these critics have already taken shame to themselves, whether they consider the object of their abuse in his moral or his literary character. For reflect but on the variety and extent of his acquirements. He stands second to no man, either as an historian or as a bibliographer, and when I regard him as a popular essayist, for the articles of his compositions in the reviews are, for the greater part, essays on subjects of deep or curious interest rather than criticisms on particular works. I look in vain for any writer, who has conveyed so much information, from so many and such recondite sources, with so many just and original reflections, in a style so lively and poignant, yet so uniformly. Classical and perspicuous, no one, in short, who has combined so much wisdom with so much wit so much truth and knowledge with so much life and fancy. His prose is always intelligible and always entertaining. In poetry he has attempted almost every species of composition known before, and he has added new ones, and if we accept the highest lyric, in which how few how very few even of the greatest minds have been fortunate, he has attempted every species successfully, from the political song of the day, thrown off in the playful overflow of honest joy and patriotic exultation, to the wild ballad, from epistolary ease and graceful narrative, to austere and impetuous moral declamation, from the pastoral charms and wild streaming lights of the Thalabar, in which sentiment and imagery have given permanence even to the excitement of curiosity, and from the full blaze of the Kihama, a gallery of finished pictures in one splendid fancy piece, in which, 
notwithstanding, the moral grandeur rises gradually above the brilliance of the coloring and the boldness and novelty of the machinery, to the more sober beauties of the Madoc, and lastly, from the Madoc to his Roderick, in which, retaining all his former excellences of a poet eminently inventive and picturesque, he has surpassed himself in language and metre, in the construction of the whole, and in the splendour of particular passages. Here then shall I conclude. No. The characters of the deceased, like the incomia on tombstones, as they are described with religious tenderness, so are they read, with allowing sympathy indeed, but yet with rational deduction. There are men, who deserve a higher record, men with whose characters it is the interest of their contemporaries, no less than that of posterity, to be made acquainted, while it is yet possible for impartial censure and even for quick-sighted envy, to cross-examine the tale without offence to the courtesies of humanity, and while the eulogist, detected in exaggeration or falsehood, must pay the full penalty of his baseness in the contempt which brands the convicted flatterer. Publicly has Mr. Southey been reviled by men, who, as I would fain hope for the honour of human nature, hurled firebrands against a figure of their own imagination, publicly have his talents been depreciated, his principles denounced, as publicly do I therefore, who have known him intimately, deem it my duty to leave recorded, that it is Southey's almost unexampled felicity to possess the best gifts of talent and genius free from all their characteristic defects. To those who remember the state of our public schools and universities some twenty years past, it will appear no ordinary praise in any man to have passed from innocence into virtue, not only free from all vicious habit, but unstained by one act of intemperance or the degradations akin to intemperance. That scheme of head, heart, and habitual demeanour, which in his early manhood, and first controversial writings, Milton, claiming the privilege of self-defence, asserts of himself, and challenges his calamiators to disprove, this will his schoolmates, his fellow collegians, and his maturer friends, with a confidence proportioned to the intimacy of their knowledge, bear witness to, as again realized in the life of Robert Southey. But still more striking to those, who by biography or by their own experience are familiar with the general habits of genius, will appear the poet's matchless industry and perseverance in his pursuits the worthiness and dignity of those pursuits, his generous submission to tasks of transitory interest, or such as his genius alone could make otherwise, and that having thus more than satisfied the claims of affection or prudence, he should yet have made for himself time and power, to achieve more, and in more various departments than almost any other writer has done, though employed wholly on subjects of his own choice and ambition. But as Southey possesses, and is not possessed by, his genius, even so is he master even of his virtues. The regular and methodical tenor of his daily labours, which would be deemed rare in the most mechanical pursuits, and might be envied by the mere man of business, loses all semblance of formality in the dignified simplicity of his manners, in the spring and healthful cheerfulness of his spirits. Always employed, his friends find him always at leisure. No less punctual in trifles, 
than steadfast in the performance of highest duties, he inflicts none of those small pains and discomforts which irregular men scatter about them, and which in the aggregate so often become formidable obstacles both to happiness and utility, while on the contrary he bestows all the pleasures and inspires all that ease of mind on those around him or connected with him, which perfect consistency, and, if such a word might be framed, absolute reliability, equally in small as in great concerns, cannot but inspire and bestow, when this too is softened without being weakened by kindness and gentleness. I know few men who so well deserve the character which an antient attributes to Marcus Cato, namely, that he was likest virtue, inasmuch as he seemed to act aright, not in obedience to any law or outward motive, but by the necessity of a happy nature, which could not act otherwise. As son, brother, husband, father, master, friend, he moves with firm yet light steps, alike unostentatious, and alike exemplary. As a writer, he has uniformly made his talents subservient to the best interests of humanity, of public virtue, and domestic piety, his cause has ever been the cause of pure religion and of liberty of national independence and of national illumination. When future critics shall weigh out his good and of praise and censure, it will be so they the poet only, that will supply them with the scanty materials for the latter. They will likewise not fail to record, that as no man was ever a more constant friend, never had poet more friends and honorous among the good of all parties, and that quacks in education, quacks in politics, and quacks in criticism were his only enemies. 17. Chapter 4 The Lyrical Ballads with the Preface, Mr. Wordsworth's Earlier Poems, On Fancy and Imagination the investigation of the distinction important to the fine arts. I have wandered far from the object in view, but as I fancied to myself readers who would respect the feelings that had tempted me from the main road, so I dare calculate on not a few, who will warmly sympathize with them. At present it will be sufficient for my purpose, if I have proved that Mr. Southey's writings no more than my own furnished the original occasion to this fiction of a new school of poetry, and to the clamours against its supposed founders and proselytes. As little do I believe that Mr. Wordsworth's lyrical ballads were in themselves the cause. I speak exclusively of the two volumes so entitled. A careful and repeated examination of these confirms me in the belief, that the omission of less than a hundred lines would have precluded nine-tenths of the criticism on this work. I hazard this declaration, however, on the supposition, that the reader has taken it up, as he would have done any other collection of poems purporting to derive their subjects or interests from the incidents of domestic or ordinary life, intermingled with higher strains of meditation which the poet utters in his own person and character, with the proviso, that these poems were perused without knowledge of, or reference to, the author's peculiar opinions and that the reader had not had his attention previously directed to those peculiarities. In that case, as actually happened with Mr. Southey's earlier works, the lines and passages which might have offended the general taste, would have been considered as mere inequalities, and attributed to inattention, not to perversity of judgment. 
the men of business who had passed their lives chiefly in cities, and who might therefore be expected to derive the highest pleasure from acute notices of men and manners conveyed in easy, yet correct and pointed language, and all those who, reading but little poetry, are most stimulated with that species of it, which seems most distant from prose, would probably have passed by the volumes altogether. Others more Catholic in their taste, and yet habituated to be most pleased when most excited, would have contented themselves with deciding that the author had been successful in proportion to the elevation of his style and subject. Not a few, perhaps, might, by their admiration of the lines written near Tintern Abbey, on revisiting the Y, those left upon a yew tree seat, the old Cumberland beggar, and Ruth, have been gradually led to peruse with kindred feeling the brothers the heart leap well, and whatever other poems in that collection may be described as holding a middle place between those written in the highest and those in the humblest style, as for instance between the Tintern Abbey, and the Thorn, or Simon Lee. Should their taste submit to no further change, and still remain unreconciled to the colloquial phrases, or the imitations of them, that are, more or less, scattered through the class last mentioned, yet even from the small number of the latter, they would have deemed them but an inconsiderable subtraction from the merit of the whole work, or, what is sometimes not unpleasing in the publication of a new writer, as serving to ascertain the natural tendency, and consequently the proper direction of the author's genius. In the critical remarks, therefore, prefixed and annexed to the lyrical ballads, I believe, we may safely rest, as the true origin of the unexampled opposition which Mr. Wordsworth's writings have been since doomed to encounter. The humbler passages in the poems themselves were dwelt on and cited to justify the rejection of the theory. What in and for themselves would have been either forgotten or forgiven as imperfections, or at least comparative failures, provoked direct hostility when announced as intentional, as the result of choice after full deliberation. Thus the poems admitted by all as excellent, joined with those which had pleased the far greater number, though they formed two-thirds of the whole work, instead of being deemed, as in all right they should have been, even if we take for granted that the reader judged aright, an atonement for the few exceptions, gave wind and fuel to the animosity against both the poems and the poet. In all perplexity there is a portion of fear, which predisposes the mind to anger. Not able to deny that the author possessed both genius and a powerful intellect, they felt very positive, but yet were not quite certain that he might not be in the right, and they themselves in the wrong, an unquiet state of mind which seeks alleviation by quarrelling with the occasion of it, and by wondering at the perverseness of the man, who had written a long and argumentative essay to persuade them, that fair is foul, and foul is fair, in other words, that they had been all their lives. Admiring without judgment, and were now about to censure without reason. 18 that this conjecture is not wide from the mark, I am induced to believe from the noticeable fact, which I can state on my own knowledge, that the same general censure has been grounded by almost every different person on some different poem. Among those, whose candour and judgment I estimate highly, 
I distinctly remember six who expressed their objections to the lyrical ballads almost in the same words, and altogether to the same purport, at the same time admitting, that several of the poems had given them great pleasure, and, strange as it might seem, the composition which one cited as execrable, another quoted as his favourite. I am indeed convinced in my own mind, that could the same experiment have been tried with these volumes, as was made in the well-known story of the picture, the result would have been the same, the parts which had been covered by black spots on the one day, would be found equally albo lapid notati on the succeeding. However this may be, it was assuredly hard and unjust to fix the attention on a few separate and insulated poems with as much aversion, as if they had been so many plague spots on the whole work, instead of passing them over in silence, as so much blank paper, or leaves of a bookseller's catalogue, especially, as no one pretended to have found in them any immorality or indelicacy and the poems, therefore, at the worst, could only be regarded as so many light or inferior coins in a rouleau of gold, not as so much alloy in a weight of bullion. A friend whose talents I hold in the highest respect, but whose judgment and strong sound sense I have had almost continued occasion to revere making the usual complaints to me concerning both the style and subjects of Mr. Wordsworth's minor poems, I admitted that there were some few of the tales and incidents, in which I could not myself find a sufficient cause for their having been recorded in metre. I mentioned Alice Fell as an instance, nay replied my friend with more than usual quickness of manner, I cannot agree with you there, that, I own, does seem to me a remarkably pleasing poem. In the lyrical ballads, for my experience does not enable me to extend the remark equally unqualified to the two subsequent volumes, I have heard at different times, and from different individuals, every single poem extolled and reprobated with the exception of those of loftier kind, which as was before observed, seem to have won universal praise. This fact of itself would have made me diffident in my censures, had not a still stronger ground been furnished by the strange contrast of the heat and long continuance of the opposition, with the nature of the faults stated as justifying it. The seductive faults, the dulcia vicia of Cowley, Marini, or Darwin might reasonably be thought capable of corrupting the public judgment for half a century, and require a twenty years' war, campaign after campaign, in order to dethrone the usurper and re-establish the legitimate taste. But that a downright simpleness, under the affectation of simplicity, prosaic words in feeble metre, silly thoughts in childish phrases, and a preference of mean, degrading, or at best trivial associations and characters, should succeed in forming a school of imitators, a company of almost religious admirers, and this too among young men of ardent minds, liberal education and not, with academic laurels unbestowed, and that this bare and bald counterfeit of poetry, which is characterized as below criticism, should for nearly twenty years have well nigh engrossed criticism, as the main, if not the only, but of review, magazine, pamphlet, poem, and paragraph, this is indeed matter of wonder. Of yet greater is it, that the contest should still continue as undecided as, 19, 
that between Bacchus and the frogs in Aristophanes, when the former descended to the realms of the departed to bring back the spirit of old and genuine posse, ch brikekex, coax, coax. D. all ex alois thorto coax. Uden garist all, ha coax. Oi mozato ugar moi milei. Ch alamein ke croxo mestagi, opos on ha pharynx and heman shandani di hemeras. Brikekex, coax, coax. D. tauto garo unikist. Ch ud men he may soup hantos. D ud main humis ge de em ud pot. Ke crocs o my ga, con me di, di hemeras, eos and human epicrati ezo two coax. Ch brikekex, koax, coax. During the last year of my residence at Cambridge, 1794, I became acquainted with Mr. Wordsworth's first publication entitled Descriptive Sketches, and seldom, if ever, was the emergence of an original poetic genius above the literary horizon more evidently announced. In the form, style, and manner of the whole poem, and in the structure of the particular lines and periods, there is a harshness and acerbity connected and combined with words and images all aglow, which might recall those products of the vegetable world, where gorgeous blossoms rise out of a hard and thorny rind and shell, within which the rich fruit is elaborating. The language is not only peculiar and strong, but at times knotty and contorted, as by its own impatient strength, while the novelty and struggling crowd of images, acting in conjunction with the difficulties of the style, demands always a greater closeness of attention, than poetry, at all events, than descriptive poetry, has a right to claim. It not seldom therefore justified the complaint of obscurity. In the following extract I have sometimes fancied, that I saw an emblem of the poem itself, and of the author's genius as it was then displayed. Tease storm, and hid in mist from hour to hour, all day the floods a deepening murmur pour, the sky is veiled, and every cheerful sight dark is the region as with coming night, yet what a sudden burst of overpowering light. Triumphant on the bosom of the storm, glances the fire-clad eagle's wheeling form, eastward, in long perspective glittering, shine the wood-crowned cliffs that o'er the lake recline, those eastern cliffs a hundred streams unfold, at once to pillars turned that flame with gold, behind his sail the peasant strives to shun the west, that burns like one dilated sun, where in a mighty crucible expire the mountains, glowing hot, like coals of fire. The poetic psyche, in its process to full development, undergoes as many changes as its Greek namesake. The Butterfly, 20. And it is remarkable how soon genius clears and purifies itself from the faults and errors of its earliest products, faults which, in its earliest compositions, are the more obtrusive and confluent, because as heterogeneous elements, which had only a temporary use, they constitute the very ferment by which themselves are carried off. Or we may compare them to some diseases, which must work on the humours, and be thrown out on the surface, in order to secure the patient from their future recurrence. I was in my twenty-fourth year, when I had the happiness of knowing Mr. Wordsworth personally, and while memory lasts, 
I shall hardly forget the sudden effect produced on my mind, by his recitation of a manuscript poem, which still remains unpublished, but of which the stanza and tone of style were the same as those of the female vagrant, as originally printed in the first volume of the lyrical ballads. There was here no mark of strained thought, or false diction, no crowd or turbulence of imagery, and, as the poet of himself well described in his lines on revisiting the why, manly reflection and human associations had given both variety, and an additional interest to natural objects, which, in the passion and appetite of the first love, they had seemed to him neither to need nor permit. The occasional obscurities, which had risen from an imperfect control over the resources of his native language, had almost wholly disappeared, together with that worse defect of arbitrary and illogical phrases, at once hackneyed and fantastic, which hold so distinguished a place in the technique of ordinary poetry, and will, more or less, alloy the earlier poems of the truest genius, unless the attention has been specially directed to their worthlessness and incongruity. 21. I did not perceive anything particular in the mere style of the poem alluded to during its recitation, except indeed such difference as was not separable from the thought and manner, and the Spenserian stanza which always, more or less, recalls to the reader's mind Spencer's own style, would doubtless have authorized, in my then opinion, a more frequent descent to the phrases of ordinary life, than could without an ill effect have been hazarded in the heroic couplet. It was not however the freedom from false taste, whether as to common defects, or to those more properly his own, which made so unusual an impression on my feelings immediately, and subsequently on my judgment. It was the union of deep feeling with profound thought, the fine balance of truth in observing, with the imaginative faculty in modifying, the objects observed, and above all the original gift of spreading the tone the atmosphere, and with it the depth and height of the ideal world around forms, incidents, and situations, of which, for the common view, custom had bedimmed all the luster, had dried up the sparkle and the dew drops. This excellence, which in all Mr. Wordsworth's writings is more or less predominant, and which constitutes the character of his mind, I no sooner felt, than I sought to understand. Repeated meditations led me first to suspect dash dash, and a more intimate analysis of the human faculties, their appropriate marks, functions, and effects matured my conjecture into full conviction that fancy and imagination were two distinct and widely different faculties, instead of being, according to the general belief, either two names with one meaning, or, at furthest, the lower and higher degree of one and the same power. It is not, I own, easy to conceive a more apposite translation of the Greek fantasia than the Latin imaginatio but it is equally true that in all societies there exists an instinct of growth, a certain collective, unconscious good sense working progressively to disinonymies. 22. Those words originally of the same meaning, which the conflux of dialects supplied to the more homogeneous languages, as the Greek and German, and which the same cause joined with accidents of translation from original works of different countries, occasion in mixed languages like our own. The first and most important point to be proved is, 
that two conceptions perfectly distinct are confused under one and the same word, and, this done, to appropriate that word exclusively to the one meaning, and the synonym, should there be one, to the other. But if, as will be often the case in the arts and sciences, no synonym exists, we must either invent or borrow a word. In the present instance the appropriation has already begun, and been legitimated in the derivative adjective. Milton had a highly imaginative, Cowley a very fanciful mind. If therefore I should succeed in establishing the actual existence of two faculties generally different, the nomenclature would be at once determined. To the faculty by which I had characterized Milton, we should confine the term imagination, while the other would be contradistinguished as fancy. Now were it once fully ascertained, that this division is no less grounded in nature than that of delirium from mania, or Otway's lutes, laurels, seas of milk, and ships of amber, from Shakespeare's what? Have his daughters brought him to this pass? Or from the preceding apostrophe to the elements, the theory of the fine arts, and of poetry in particular, could not but derive some additional and important light. It would in its immediate effects furnish a torch of guidance to the philosophical critic, and ultimately to the poet himself. In energetic minds, truth soon changes by domestication into power, and from directing in the discrimination and appraisal of the product, becomes influensive in the production. To admire on principle, is the only way to imitate without loss of originality. It has been already hinted that metaphysics and psychology have long been my hobber horse. But to have a hobber horse, and to be vain of it, are so commonly found together, that they pass almost for the same. I trust therefore, that there will be more good humour than contempt, in the smile with which the reader chastises my self-complacency, if I confess myself uncertain whether the satisfaction from the perception of a truth new to myself may not have been rendered more poignant by the conceit, that it would be equally so to the public. There was a time, certainly, in which I took some little credit to myself, in the belief that I had been the first of my countrymen who had pointed out the diverse meaning of which the two terms were capable and analysed the faculties to which they should be appropriated. Mr. W. Taylor's recent volume of synonyms I have not yet seen, 23, but his specification of the terms in question has been clearly shown to be both insufficient and erroneous by Mr. Wordsworth in the preface added to the late collection of his poems. The explanation which Mr. Wordsworth has himself given, will be found to differ from mine, chiefly, perhaps as our objects are different. It could scarcely indeed happen otherwise, from the advantage I have enjoyed of frequent conversation with him on a subject to which a poem of his own first directed my attention and my conclusions concerning which he had made more lucid to myself by many happy instances drawn from the operation of natural objects on the mind. But it was Mr. Wordsworth's purpose to consider the influences of fancy and imagination as they are manifested in poetry, and from the different effects to conclude their diversity in kind. While it is my object to investigate the seminal principle, and then from the kind to deduce the degree. 
my friend has drawn a masterly sketch of the branches with their poetic fruitage. I wish to add the trunk, and even the roots as far as they lift themselves above ground, and are visible to the naked eye of our common consciousness. Yet even in this attempt I am aware that I shall be obliged to draw more largely on the reader's attention, than so immethodical a miscellany as this can authorize, when in such a work, the ecclesiastical polity, of such a mind as Hooker's, the judicious author, though no less admirable for the perspicuity than for the port and dignity of his language, and though he wrote for men of learning in a learned age, saw nevertheless occasion to anticipate and guard against complaints of obscurity as often as he was to trace his subject to the highest wellspring and fountain, which, continues he, because men are not accustomed to, the pains we take are more needful a great deal than acceptable, and the matters we handle, seem by reason of newness, till the mind grow better acquainted with them, dark and intricate. I would gladly therefore spare both myself and others this labour, if I knew how without it to present an intelligible statement of my poetic creed, not as my opinions, which weigh for nothing but as deductions from established premises conveyed in such a form, as is calculated either to affect a fundamental conviction, or to receive a fundamental confutation. If I may dare once more adopt the words of Hooker, they, unto whom we shall seem tedious, are in no wise injured by us, because it is in their own hands to spare that labour which they are not willing to endure. Those at least, let me be permitted to add, who have taken so much pains to render me ridiculous for a perversion of taste, and have supported the charge by attributing strange notions to me on no other authority than their own conjectures, owe it to themselves as well as to me not to refuse their attention to my own statement of the theory which I do acknowledge, or shrink from the trouble of examining the grounds on which I rest it, or the arguments which I offer in its justification. Chapter V On the Law of Association, Its History Traced from Aristotle to Hartley There have been men in all ages who have been impelled as by an instinct to propose their own nature as a problem, and who devote their attempts to its solution. The first step was to construct a table of distinctions, which they seem to have formed on the principle of the absence or presence of the will. Our various sensations, perceptions, and movements were classed as active or passive or as media partaking of both. A still finer distinction was soon established between the voluntary and the spontaneous. In our perceptions we seem to ourselves merely passive to an external power, whether as a mirror reflecting the landscape, or as a blank canvas on which some unknown hand paints it. For it is worthy of notice that the latter, or the system of idealism may be traced to sources equally remote with the former, or materialism, and Berkeley can boast an ancestry at least as venerable as Gassendi or Hobbes. These conjectures, however, concerning the mode in which our perceptions originated, could not alter the natural difference of things and thoughts. In the former, the cause appeared wholly external, while in the latter, sometimes our will interfered as the producing or determining cause, and sometimes our nature seemed to act by a mechanism of its own, without any conscious effort of the will, or even against it. 
Our inward experiences were thus arranged in three separate classes, the passive sense, or what the schoolmen call the merely receptive quality of the mind, the voluntary, and the spontaneous, which holds the middle place between both. But it is not in human nature to meditate on any mode of action, without inquiring after the law that governs it, and in the explanation of the spontaneous movements of our being, the metaphysician took the lead of the anatomist and natural philosopher. In Egypt, Palestine, Greece, and India the analysis of the mind had reached its noon and manhood, while experimental research was still in its dawn and infancy. For many, very many centuries, it has been difficult to advance a new truth, or even a new era, in the philosophy of the intellect or morals. With regard, however, to the laws that direct the spontaneous movements of thought and the principle of their intellectual mechanism there exists, it has been asserted an important exception most honourable to the moderns, and in the merit of which our own country claims the largest share. Sir James Mackintosh, who, amid the variety of his talents and attainments, is not of less repute for the depth and accuracy of his philosophical inquiries than for the eloquence with which he is said to render their most difficult results perspicuous, and the driest attractive, affirmed in the lectures, delivered by him in Lincoln's Inn Hall, that the law of association as established in the contemporaneity of the original impressions, formed the basis of all true psychology, and that any ontological or metaphysical science, not contained in such, that is, an empirical, psychology, was but a web of abstractions and generalizations. Of this prolific truth, of this great fundamental law, he declared Hobbes to have been the original discoverer while its full application to the whole intellectual system we owed to Hartley, who stood in the same relation to Hobbes as Newton to Kepler, the law of association being that to the mind, which gravitation is to matter. Of the former clause in this assertion, as it respects the comparative merits of the ancient metaphysicians, including their commentators, the schoolmen, and of the modern and British and French philosophers from Hobbes to Hume, Hartley, and Condillac, this is not the place to speak. So wide indeed is the chasm between Sir James Mackintosh's philosophical creed and mine, that so far from being able to join hands, we could scarcely make our voices intelligible to each other and to bridge it over would require more time, skill, and power than I believe myself to possess. But the latter clause involves for the greater part a mere question of fact and history, and the accuracy of the statement is to be tried by documents rather than reasoning. First, then, I deny Hobbes's claim in toto for he had been anticipated by Descartes, whose work De Methodu, preceded Hobbes as De Natura Humana, by more than a year. But what is of much more importance, Hobbes builds nothing on the principle which he had announced. He does not even announce it, as differing in any respect from the general laws of material motion and impact nor was it, indeed, possible for him so to do, compatibly with his system, which was exclusively material and mechanical. Far otherwise is it with Descartes, greatly as he too in his after-writings, and still more egregiously his followers de la Forge, and others, 
obscured the truth by their attempts to explain it on the theory of nervous fluids and material configurations. But, in his interesting work, De Methodou, Descartes relates the circumstance which first led him to meditate on this subject, and which since then has been often noticed and employed as an instance and illustration of the law. A child who with its eyes bandaged had lost several of his fingers by amputation, continued to complain for many days successively of pains, now in this joint and now in that, of the very fingers which had been cut off. Descartes was led by this incident to reflect on the uncertainty with which we attribute any particular place to any inward pain or uneasiness, and proceeded after long consideration to establish it as a general law, that contemporaneous impressions, whether images or sensations, recall each other mechanically. On this principle, as a groundwork, he built up the whole system of human language, as one continued process of association. He showed in what sense not only general terms, but generic images, under the name of abstract ideas, actually existed, and in what consist their nature and power. As one word may become the general exponent of many, so by association a simple image may represent a whole class. But in truth Hobbes himself makes no claims to any discovery, and introduces this law of association, or, in his own language, discursion of mind, as an admitted fact, in the solution alone of which, and this by causes purely physiological, he arrogates any originality. His system is briefly this, whenever the senses are impinged on by external objects, whether by the rays of light reflected from them, or by effluxes of their finer particles, there results a correspondent motion of the innermost and subtlest organs. This motion constitutes a representation, and there remains an impression of the same, or a certain disposition to repeat the same motion. Whenever we feel several objects at the same time, the impressions that are left, or in the language of Mr. Hume, the ideas, 24, are linked together. Whenever therefore any one of the movements, which constitute a complex impression, is renewed through the senses, the others succeed mechanically. It follows of necessity, therefore, that Hobbes, as well as Hartley and all others who derive association from the connection and interdependence of the supposed matter, the movements of which constitute our thoughts, must have reduced all its forms to the one law of time. But even the merit of announcing this law with philosophic precision cannot be fairly conceded to him. For the objects of any two ideas need not have coexisted in the same sensation in order to become mutually associable. The same result will follow when one only of the two ideas has been represented by the senses, and the other by the memory. Long however before either Hobbes or Descartes the law of association had been defined, and its important functions set forth by Ludovicus Vives. Fantasia, it is to be noticed is employed by Vives to express the mental power of comprehension, or the active function of the mind, and imaginatio for the receptivity, via receptiva, of impressions, or for the passive perception. The power of combination he appropriates to the former, qua singular et simpliciter exseparat imaginatio, Ea conjungitit disjungae fantasia. 
and the law by which the thoughts are spontaneously presented follows thus, qua simul sunta fantasia comprehensa, si alteru trumacurat, salut secum alterum representa. To time therefore he subordinates all the other exciting causes of association. The soul proceeds a causa ad effectum, a b hoc ad instrumentum, a party ad totum, thence to the place, from place to person, and from this to whatever preceded or followed, all as being parts of a total impression, each of which may recall the other. The apparent springs saltus vel transitus eschem longissimos he explains by the same thought having been a component part of two or more total impressions. Thus ex Scipion venio in cogitationem potentiae tersisi, propter victorias agesta asia, in qua regnabat antiochus. But from vivs I pass at once to the source of his doctrines, and, as far as we can judge from the remains yet extant of Greek philosophy, as to the first, so to the fullest and most perfect enunciation of the associative principle, namely, to the writings of Aristotle, and of these in particular to the treatises de anima and de memoria which last belongs to the series of essays entitled in the old translations Parva Naturalia. Inasmuch as later writers have either deviated from, or added to his doctrines, they appear to me to have introduced either error or groundless supposition. In the first place it is to be observed that Aristotle's positions on this subject are unmixed with fiction. The wise Stagerit speaks of no successive particles propagating motion like billiard balls, as Hobbes, nor of nervous or animal spirits, where inanimate and irrational solids are thawed down, and distilled, or filtrated by ascension, into living and intelligent fluids that etch and re-etch engravings on the brain, as the followers of Descartes, and the humoral pathologists in general, nor of an oscillating ether which was to effect the same service for the nerves of the brain considered as solid fibers, as the animal spirits perform for them under the notion of hollow tubes, as Hartley teaches, nor finally, with yet more recent dreamers, of chemical compositions by elective affinity, or of an electric light at once the immediate object and the ultimate organ of inward vision, which rises to the brain like an aurora borealis, and there, disporting in various shapes, as the balance of plus and minus, or negative and positive, is destroyed or re-established images out both past and present. Aristotle delivers a just theory without pretending to an hypothesis, or in other words a comprehensive survey of the different facts, and of their relations to each other without supposition, that is, a fact placed under a number of facts, as their common support and explanation though in the majority of instances these hypotheses or suppositions better deserve the name of apopoesis, or suffixions. He uses indeed the word kinesis, to express what we call representations or ideas, but he carefully distinguishes them from material motion designating the latter always by annexing the words en topo or cater top all. On the contrary, in his treatise De Anima, he excludes place and motion from all the operations of thought, whether representations or volitions, as attributes utterly and absurdly heterogeneous. The general law of association, or, more accurately, 
the common condition under which all exciting causes act, and in which they may be generalized, according to Aristotle is this. Ideas by having been together acquire a power of recalling each other, or every partial representation awakes the total representation of which it had been a part. In the practical determination of this common principle to particular recollections, he admits five agents or occasioning causes, first, connection in time, whether simultaneous, preceding, or successive, second, vicinity or connection in space, third, interdependence or necessary connection, as cause and effect, fourth, likeness, and fifth, contrast. As an additional solution of the occasional seeming chasms in the continuity of reproduction he proves, that movements or ideas possessing one or the other of these five characters had passed through the mind as intermediate links, sufficiently clear to recall other parts of the same total impressions with which they had coexisted, though not vivid enough to excite that degree of attention which is requisite for distinct recollection, or as we may aptly express it, after consciousness. In association then consists the whole mechanism of the reproduction of impressions, in the Aristotelian psychology. It is the universal law of the passive fancy and mechanical memory, that which supplies to all other faculties their objects, to all thought the elements of its materials. In consulting the excellent commentary of St. Thomas Aquinas on the Parva Naturalia of Aristotle, I was struck at once with its close resemblance to Hume's essay on association. The main thoughts were the same in both, the order of the thoughts was the same, and even the illustrations differed only by Hume's occasional substitution of more modern examples. I mentioned the circumstance to several of my literary acquaintances, who admitted the closeness of the resemblance, and that it seemed too great to be explained by mere coincidence, but they thought it improbable that Hume should have held the pages of the angelic doctor worth turning over. But some time after Mr. Payne showed Sir James Mackintosh some odd volumes of St. Thomas Aquinas, partly perhaps from having heard that he had in his lectures passed a high encomium on this canonized philosopher, but chiefly from the fact that the volumes had belonged to Mr. Hume and had here and there marginal marks and notes of reference in his own handwriting. Among these volumes was that which contains the Parva Naturalia, in the old Latin version, swathed and swaddled in the commentary aforementioned it remains then for me, first to state wherein Hartley differs from Aristotle, then, to exhibit the grounds of my conviction, that he differed only to a, and next as the result, to show, by what influences of the choice and judgment the associative power becomes either memory or fancy, and, in conclusion, to appropriate the remaining offices of the mind to the reason, and the imagination. With my best efforts to be as perspicuous as the nature of language will permit on such a subject, I earnestly solicit the good wishes and friendly patience of my readers, while I thus go sounding on my dim and perilous way. Chapter 6 That Hartley's system, as far as it differs from that of Aristotle, is neither tenable in theory, nor founded in facts. Of Hartley's hypothetical vibrations in his hypothetical oscillating ether of the nerves, which is the first and most obvious distinction between his system and that of Aristotle, 
I shall say little. This, with all other similar attempts to render that an object of the sight which has no relation to sight, has been already sufficiently exposed by the younger Reimarus, Mass, and others, as outraging the very axioms of mechanics in a scheme, the merit of which consists in its being mechanical. Whether any other philosophy be possible, but the mechanical, and again, whether the mechanical system can have any claim to be called philosophy, are questions for another place. It is, however, certain, that as long as we deny the former, and affirm the latter, we must bewilder ourselves, whenever we would pierce into the aditar of causation, and all that laborious conjecture can do, is to fill up the gaps of fancy. Under that despotism of the eye, the emancipation from which Pythagoras by his numeral, and Plato by his musical, symbols, and both by geometric discipline, aimed at, as the first propadioma of the mind, under this strong sensuous influence, we are restless because invisible things are not the objects of vision, and metaphysical systems, for the most part, become popular, not for their truth, but in proportion as they attribute to causes a susceptibility of being seen, if only our visual organs were sufficiently powerful. From a hundred possible confutations let one suffice. According to this system the idea or vibration of from the external object a becomes associable with the idea or vibration m from the external object m, because the oscillation a propagated itself so as to reproduce the oscillation m. But the original impression from M was essentially different from the impression O, unless therefore different causes may produce the same effect. The vibration O could never produce the vibration M, and this therefore could never be the means, by which O and M are associated. To understand this, the attentive reader need only be reminded that the ideas are themselves, in Hartley's system, nothing more than their appropriate configurative vibrations. It is a mere delusion of the fancy to conceive the pre-existence of the ideas, in any chain of association, as so many differently colored billiard balls in contact, so that when an object, the billiard stick, strikes the first or white ball, the same motion propagates itself through the red, green, blue and black, and sets the whole in motion. No. We must suppose the very same force, which constitutes the white ball, to constitute the red or black, or the idea of a circle to constitute the idea of a triangle, which is impossible. But it may be said, that by the sensations from the objects A and M, the nerves have acquired a disposition to the vibrations A and M, and therefore a need only be repeated in order to reproduce M. Now we will grant, for a moment, the possibility of such a disposition in a material nerve, which yet seems scarcely less absurd than to say, that a weathercock had acquired a habit of turning to the east, from the wind having been so long in that quarter, for if it be replied, that we must take in the circumstance of life, what then becomes of the mechanical philosophy? And what is the nerve, but the flint which the wag placed in the pot as the first ingredient of his stone broth, requiring only salt? turnips, and mutton, for the remainder. But if we waive this, and presuppose the actual existence of such a disposition, two cases are possible. Either, 
every idea has its own nerve and correspondent oscillation, or this is not the case. If the latter be the truth, we should gain nothing by these dispositions, for then, every nerve having several dispositions, when the motion of any other nerve is propagated into it, there will be no ground or cause present, why exactly the oscillation M should arise, rather than any other to which it was equally predisposed. But if we take the former, and let every idea have a nerve of its own, then every nerve must be capable of propagating its motion into many other nerves, and again, there is no reason assignable, why the vibration M should arise, rather than any other ad libitum. It is fashionable to smile at Hartley's vibrations and vibration calls, and his work has been re-edited by Priestley, with the omission of the material hypothesis. But Hartley was too great a man, too coherent a thinker, for this to have been done, either consistently or to any wise purpose. For all other parts of his system, as far as they are peculiar to that system, once removed from their mechanical basis, not only lose their main support, but the very motive which led to their adoption. Thus the principle of contemporaneity, which Aristotle had made the common condition of all the laws of association, Hartley was constrained to represent as being itself the sole law. For to what law can the action of material atoms be subject, but that of proximity in place? And to what law can their motions be subjected but that of time? Again, from this results inevitably, that the will, the reason, the judgment, and the understanding, instead of being the determining causes of association, must needs be represented as its creatures, and among its mechanical effects. Conceive, for instance, a broad stream winding through a mountainous country with an indefinite number of currents, varying and running into each other according as the gusts chance to blow from the opening of the mountains. The temporary union of several currents in one, so as to form the main current of the moment, would present an accurate image of Hartley's theory of the will. Had this been really the case, the consequence would have been, that our whole life would be divided between the despotism of outward impressions, and that of senseless and passive memory. Take his law in its highest abstraction and most philosophical form, namely, that every partial representation recalls the total representation of which it was a part, and the law becomes nugatory were it only for its universality. In practice it would indeed be mere lawlessness. Consider, how immense must be the sphere of a total impression from the top of St. Paul's Church, and how rapid and continuous the series of such total impressions. If, therefore, we suppose the absence of all interference of the will, reason, and judgment, one or other of two consequences must result. Either the ideas, or relics of such impression, will exactly imitate the order of the impression itself, which would be absolute delirium, or any one part of that impression might recall any other part, and, as from the law of continuity, there must exist in every total impression, some one or more parts, which are components of some other following total impression, and so on ad infinitum, any part of any impression might recall any part of any other, without a cause present to determine what it should be. For to bring in the will, or reason, 
as causes of their own cause, that is, as at once causes and effects, can satisfy those only who, in their pretended evidences of a god, having first demanded organization, as the sole cause and ground of intellect, will then coolly demand the pre-existence of intellect, as the cause and groundwork of organization. There is in truth but one state to which this theory applies at all, namely, that of complete light-headedness, and even to this it applies but partially, because the will and reason are perhaps never wholly suspended. A case of this kind occurred in a Roman Catholic town in Germany a year or two before my arrival at Göttingen and had not then ceased to be a frequent subject of conversation. A young woman of four or five and twenty, who could neither read, nor write, was seized with a nervous fever, during which, according to the asseverations of all the priests and monks of the neighborhood, she became possessed, and, as it appeared, by a very learned devil. She continued incessantly talking Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, in very pompous tones and with most distinct enunciation. This possession was rendered more probable by the known fact that she was or had been a heretic. Voltaire humorously advises the devil to decline all acquaintance with medical men, and it would have been more to his reputation if he had taken this advice in the present instance. The case had attracted the particular attention of a young physician, and by his statement many eminent physiologists and psychologists visited the town, and cross-examined the case on the spot. Sheets full of her ravings were taken down from her own mouth, and were found to consist of sentences coherent and intelligible each for itself, but with little or no connection with each other. Of the Hebrew, a small portion only could be traced to the Bible, the remainder seemed to be in the rabbinical dialect. All trick or conspiracy was out of the question. Not only had the young woman ever been a harmless, simple creature, but she was evidently laboring under a nervous fever. In the town, in which she had been resident for many years as a servant in different families, no solution presented itself. The young physician, however, determined to trace her past life step by step, for the patient herself was incapable of returning a rational answer. He at length succeeded in discovering the place, where her parents had lived, travelled thither, found them dead, but an uncle surviving, and from him learned, that the patient had been charitably taken by an old Protestant pastor at nine years old, and had remained with him some years, even till the old man's death. Of this pastor the uncle knew nothing but that he was a very good man. With great difficulty, and after much search, our young medical philosopher discovered a niece of the pastor's, who had lived with him as his housekeeper, and had inherited his effects. She remembered the girl, related, that her venerable uncle had been too indulgent, and could not bear to hear the girl scolded that she was willing to have kept her, but that, after her patron's death, the girl herself refused to stay. Anxious inquiries were then, of course, made concerning the pastor's habits, and the solution of the phenomenon was soon obtained. For it appeared, that it had been the old man's custom, for years to walk up and down a passage of his house into which the kitchen door opened, and to read to himself with a loud voice, 
out of his favorite books. A considerable number of these were still in the niece's possession. She added, that he was a very learned man and a great hebraist. Among the books were found a collection of rabbinical writings, together with several of the Greek and Latin fathers, and the physician succeeded in identifying so many passages with those taken down at the young woman's bedside, that no doubt could remain in any rational mind concerning the true origin of the impressions made on her nervous system. This authenticated case furnishes both proof and instance, that relics of sensation may exist for an indefinite time in a latent state, in the very same order in which they were originally impressed, and as we cannot rationally suppose the feverish state of the brain to act in any other way than as a stimulus, this fact and it would not be difficult to adduce several of the same kind, contributes to make it even probable, that all thoughts are in themselves imperishable, and, that if the intelligent faculty should be rendered more comprehensive, it would require only a different and apportioned organization, the body celestial instead of the body terrestrial to bring before every human soul the collective experience of its whole past existence. And this, this, perchance, is the dread book of judgment, in the mysterious hieroglyphics of which every idle word is recorded. Yet, yeah, in the very nature of a living spirit, it may be more possible that heaven and earth should pass away than that a single act, a single thought, should be loosened or lost from that living chain of causes, with all the links of which, conscious or unconscious, the free will, our only absolute self, is co-extensive and co-present. But not now dare I longer discourse of this, waiting for a loftier mood, and a nobler subject warned from within and from without, that it is profanation to speak of these mysteries to our made fantasies in, o escalon to ties de chiosines chi sophrosines prosopong, chi out hespris out ears out o kala. To gar horan pros to horomen and singens chi homwian poes amen and dear epibolane tithea. O Ugaran popotidon of Thalmos Hylian, Hylio ides magigenemon ozud to colonon ide psyche, magige genomini, to those to whose imagination it has never been presented, how beautiful is the countenance of justice and wisdom, and that neither the morning nor the evening star are so fair. For in order to direct the view aright, it behoves that the beholder should have made himself congenerous and similar to the object beheld. Never could the eye have beheld the sun, had not its own essence been soliform, i.e. pre-configured to light by a similarity of essence with that of light, neither can a soul not beautiful attain to an intuition of beauty. Chapter 7 of the Necessary Consequences of the heart Theory, of the original mistake or equivocation which procured its admission, Memoria Technica. We will pass by the utter incompatibility of such a law, if law it may be called, which would itself be a slave of chances with even that appearance of rationality forced upon us by the outward phenomena of human conduct, abstracted from our own consciousness. We will agree to forget this for the moment, in order to fix our attention on that subordination of final to efficient causes in the human being, which flows of necessity from the assumption, that the will and, with the will, all acts of thought and attention are parts and products of this blind mechanism, 
instead of being distinct powers, the function of which it is to control, determine, and modify the phantasmal chaos of association. The soul becomes a mere ens logicum, for, as a real separable being, it would be more worthless and ludicrous than the grimakins in the cat harpsichord, described in the spectator. For these did form a part of the process, but, to Hartley's scheme, the soul is present only to be pinched or stroked, while the very squeals or purring are produced by an agency wholly independent and alien. It involves all the difficulties, all the incomprehensibility, if it be not indeed, osm wagdoki, the absurdity, of intercommunion between substances that have no one property in common, without any of the convenient consequences that bribed the judgment to the admission of the dualistic hypothesis. Accordingly, this caput mortuum of the Hartleian process has been rejected by his followers, and the consciousness considered as a result, as a tune, the common product of the breeze and the harp though this again is the mere emotion of one absurdity to make way for another, equally preposterous. For what is harmony but a mode of relation, the very s of which is percipi? an ends rationale, which presupposes the power, that by perceiving creates it. The razor's edge becomes a sword to the armed vision, and the delicious melodies of Purcell or Simarosa might be disjointed stammerings to a hearer, whose partition of time should be a thousand times subtler than ours. But this obstacle too let us imagine ourselves to have surmounted, and at one bound high overleap all bound. Yet according to this hypothesis the disquisition, to which I am at present soliciting the reader's attention, may be as truly said to be written by St. Paul's Church, as by me, for it is the mere motion of my muscles and nerves and these again are set in motion from external causes equally passive, which external causes stand themselves in interdependent connection with everything that exists or has existed. Thus the whole universe cooperates to produce the minutest stroke of every letter, save only that I myself, and I alone, have nothing to do with it but merely the causeless and effectless beholding of it when it is done. Yet scarcely can it be called a beholding, for it is neither an act nor an effect, but an impossible creation of a something nothing out of its very contrary. It is the mere quicksilver plating behind a looking glass, and in this alone consists the poor worthless eye. The sum total of my moral and intellectual intercourse, dissolved into its elements, is reduced to extension, motion, degrees of velocity, and those diminished copies of configurative motion, which form what we call notions, and notions of notions. Of such philosophy well might Butler say, the metaphysics but a puppet motion that goes with screws, the notion of a notion, the copy of a copy and lame draft unnaturally taken from a thought that counterfeits all pantomimic tricks, and turns the eyes, like an old crucifix, that counterchanges whatsoever it calls by another name, and makes it true or false, turns truth to falsehood falsehood into truth, by virtue of the Babylonian's tooth. The inventor of the watch, if this doctrine be true, did not in reality invent it, he only looked on, while the blind causes, the only true artists, were unfolding themselves. So must it have been too with my friend Alston, 
when he sketched his picture of the dead man revived by the bones of the prophet Elijah. So must it have been with Mr. Southey and Lord Byron, when the one fancied himself composing his Roderick, and the other his child Harold. The same must hold good of all systems of philosophy, of all arts, governments, wars by sea and by land, in short, of all things that ever have been or that ever will be produced. For, according to this system, it is not the affections and passions that are at work, in as far as they are sensations or thoughts. We only fancy, that we act from rational resolves, or prudent motives, or from impulses of anger, love, or generosity. In all these cases the real agent is a something nothing everything, which does all of which we know, and knows nothing of all that itself does. The existence of an infinite spirit, of an intelligent and holy will, must, on this system, be mere articulated motions of the air. For as the function of the human understanding is no other than merely to appear to itself to combine and to apply the phenomena of the association, and as these derive all their reality from the primary sensations, and the sensations again all their reality from the impressions a b extra, a god not visible, audible, or tangible, can exist only in the sounds and letters that form his name and attributes. If in ourselves there be no such faculties as those of the will, and the scientific reason, we must either have an innate idea of them, which would overthrow the whole system, or we can have no idea at all. The process by which Hume degraded the notion of cause and effect into a blind product of delusion and habit, into the mere sensation of proceeding life, nisus vitalis, associated with the images of the memory, this same process must be repeated to the equal degradation of every fundamental idea in ethics or theology. Far. Very far am I from burdening with the odium of these consequences the moral characters of those who first formed, or have since adopted the system. It is most noticeable of the excellent and pious Hartley, that, in the proofs of the existence and attributes of God, with which his second volume commences, he makes no reference to the principle or results of the first. Nay, he assumes, as his foundations, ideas which, if we embrace the doctrines of his first volume, can exist nowhere but in the vibrations of the ethral medium common to the nerves and to the atmosphere. Indeed the whole of the second volume is, with the fewest possible exceptions, independent of his peculiar system. So true is it, that the faith, which saves and sanctifies, is a collective energy, a total act of the whole moral being, that its living sensorum is in the heart, and that no errors of the understanding can be morally arraigned unless they have proceeded from the heart. But whether they be such, no man can be certain in the case of another, scarcely perhaps even in his own. Hence it follows by inevitable consequence, that man may perchance determine what is a heresy, but God only can know who is a heretic. It does not, however, by any means follow that opinions fundamentally false are harmless. A hundred causes may coexist to form one complex antidote. Yet the sting of the adder remains venomous, though there are many who have taken up the evil thing, and it hurted them not. Some indeed there seem to have been, in an unfortunate neighbor nation at least, 
who have embraced this system with a full view of all its moral and religious consequences, some, who deem themselves most free, when they within this gross and visible sphere chain down the winged thought, scoffing assent, proud in their meanness, and themselves they cheat with noisy emptiness of learned phrase, their subtle fluids, impacts, essences, self-working tools, uncaused effects, and all those blind. Omniscience, those almighty slaves, untenanting creation of its God. Such men need discipline, not argument. They must be made better men, before they can become wiser. The attention will be more profitably employed in attempting to discover and expose the paralogisms, by the magic of which such a faith could find admission into minds framed for a nobler creed. These, it appears to me, may be all reduced to one sophism as their common genus, the mistaking the conditions of a thing for its causes and essence, and the process by which we arrive at the knowledge of a faculty, for the faculty itself. The air I breathe is the condition of my life, not its cause. We could never have learned that we had eyes but by the process of seeing, yet having seen we know that the eyes must have pre-existed in order to render the process of sight possible. Let us cross-examine Hartley's scheme under the guidance of this distinction, and we shall discover, that contemporaneity, Leibniz's lex continue, is the limit and condition of the laws of mind, itself being rather a law of matter, at least of phenomena considered as material. At the utmost, it is to thought the same as the law of gravitation is to locomotion. In every voluntary movement we first counteract gravitation, in order to avail ourselves of it. It must exist, that there may be a something to be counteracted, and which, by its reaction, may aid the force that is exerted to resist it. Let us consider what we do when we leap. We first resist the gravitating power by an act purely voluntary, and then by another act, voluntary in part, we yield to it in order to alight on the spot, which we had previously proposed to ourselves. Now let a man watch his mind while he is composing, or, to take a still more common case, while he is trying to recollect a name and he will find the process completely analogous. Most of my readers will have observed a small water insect on the surface of rivulets, which throws a sank-spotted shadow fringed with prismatic colors on the sunny bottom of the brook, and will have noticed how the little animal wins its way up against the stream, by alternate pulses of active and passive motion now resisting the current, and now yielding to it in order to gather strength and a momentary fulcrum for a further propulsion. This is no unapt emblem of the mind's self-experience in the act of thinking. There are evidently two powers at work, which relatively to each other are active and passive, and this is not possible without an intermediate faculty which is at once both active and passive. In philosophical language, we must denominate this intermediate faculty in all its degrees and determinations, the imagination. But, in common language, and especially on the subject of poetry, we appropriate the name to a superior degree of the faculty joined to a superior voluntary control over it. Contemporaneity, then, being the common condition of all the laws of association, 
and a component element in the materia subjecta, the parts of which are to be associated, must needs be co-present with all. Nothing, therefore, can be more easy than to pass off on an incautious mind this constant companion of each, for the essential substance of all. But if we appeal to our own consciousness, we shall find that even time itself, as the cause of a particular act of association, is distinct from contemporaneity, as the condition of all association. Seeing a mackerel, it may happen, that I immediately think of gooseberries, because I at the same time ate mackerel with gooseberries as the source. The first syllable of the latter word, being that which had coexisted with the image of the bird so called, I may then think of a goose. In the next moment the image of a swan may arise before me, though I had never seen the two birds together. In the first two instances, I am conscious that their coexistence in time was the circumstance that enabled me to recollect them, and equally conscious am I that the latter was recalled to me by the joint operation of likeness and contrast. So it is with cause and effect, so too with order. So I am able to distinguish whether it was proximity in time, or continuity in space, that occasioned me to recall B on the mention of A. They cannot be indeed separated from contemporaneity, for that would be to separate them from the mind itself. The act of consciousness is indeed identical with time considered in its essence. I mean time per esse, as contradistinguished from our notion of time, for this is always blended with the idea of space, which, as the opposite of time, is therefore its measure. Nevertheless the accident of seeing two objects at the same moment, and the accident of seeing them in the same place are two distinct or distinguishable causes, and the true practical general law of association is this, that whatever makes certain parts of a total impression more vivid or distinct than the rest, will determine the mind to recall these in preference to others equally linked together by the common condition of contemporaneity, or, what I deem a more appropriate and philosophical term, of continuity. But the will itself by confining and intensifying, 25, the attention may arbitrarily give vividness or distinctness to any object whatsoever, and from hence we may deduce the uselessness, if not the absurdity, of certain recent schemes which promise an artificial memory, but which in reality can only produce a confusion and debasement of the fancy. Sound logic, as the habitual subordination of the individual to the species, and of the species to the genus, philosophical knowledge of facts under the relation of cause and effect, a cheerful and communicative temper disposing us to notice the similarities and contrasts of things, that we may be able to illustrate the one by the other, a quiet conscience, a condition free from anxieties, sound health, and above all, as far as relates to passive remembrance, a healthy digestion, these are the best. These are the only arts of memory. Chapter 8 The System of Dualism Introduced by Descartes, refined first by Spinoza and afterwards by Leibniz into the doctrine of harmonia pri stabilita, hylozoism, materialism, none of these systems, or any possible theory of association, supplies or supersedes a theory of perception or explains the formation of the associable. 
To the best of my knowledge Descartes was the first philosopher who introduced the absolute and essential heterogeneity of the soul as intelligence, and the body as matter. The assumption, and the form of speaking have remained, though the denial of all other properties to matter but that of extension, on which denial the whole system of dualism is grounded, has been long exploded. For since impenetrability is intelligible only as a mode of resistance, its admission places the essence of matter in an act or power, which it possesses in common with spirit, and body and spirit are therefore no longer absolutely heterogeneous, but may without any absurdity be supposed to be different modes, or degrees in perfection, of a common substratum. To this possibility, however, it was not the fashion to advert. The soul was a thinking substance, and body a space-filling substance. Yet the apparent action of each on the other pressed heavy on the philosopher on the one hand, and no less heavily on the other hand pressed the evident truth that the law of causality holds only between homogeneous things, that is, things having some common property, and cannot extend from one world into another, its contrary. A close analysis evinced it to be no less absurd than the question whether a man's affection for his wife lay northeast, or southwest of the love he bore towards his child. Leibniz's doctrine of a pre-established harmony, which he certainly borrowed from Spinoza, who had himself taken the hint from Descartes's animal machines, was in its common interpretation too strange to survive the inventor, too repugnant to our common sense, which is not indeed entitled to a judicial voice in the courts of scientific philosophy but whose whispers still exert a strong secret influence. Even Wolf, the admirer and illustrious systematizer of the leibniz doctrine, contents himself with defending the possibility of the idea, but does not adopt it as a part of the edifice. The hypothesis of Hylozoism, on the other side, is the death of all rational physiology, and indeed of all physical science, for that requires a limitation of terms, and cannot consist with the arbitrary power of multiplying attributes by occult qualities. Besides, it answers no purpose, unless, indeed, a difficulty can be solved by multiplying it or we can acquire a clearer notion of our soul by being told that we have a million of souls, and that every atom of our bodies has a soul of its own. Far more prudent is it to admit the difficulty once for all, and then let it lie at rest. There is a sediment indeed at the bottom of the vessel, but all the water above it is clear and transparent. The hylozoist only shakes it up, and renders the whole turbid. But it is not either the nature of man, or the duty of the philosopher to despair concerning any important problem until, as in the squaring of the circle, the impossibility of a solution has been demonstrated. How the S assumed as originally distinct from the sire, can ever unite itself with it, how being can transform itself into a knowing, becomes conceivable on one only condition, namely, if it can be shown that the vis representativa, or the sentient, is itself a species of being, that is, either as a property or attribute, or as an hypostasis or self-subsistence. The former that thinking is a property of matter under particular conditions, is, indeed, the assumption of materialism, 
a system which could not but be patronized by the philosopher, if only it actually performed what it promises. But how any affection from without can metamorphose itself into perception or will, the materialist has hitherto left, not only as incomprehensible as he found it, but has aggravated it into a comprehensible absurdity. For, grant that an object from without could act upon the conscious self, as on a consubstantial object, yet such an affection could only engender something homogeneous with itself. Motion could only propagate motion. Matter has no inward. We remove one surface, but to meet with another. We can but divide a particle into particles, and each atom comprehends in itself the properties of the material universe. Let any reflecting mind make the experiment of explaining to itself the evidence of our sensuous intuitions, from the hypothesis that in any given perception there is a something which has been communicated to it by an impact, or an impression a b extra. In the first place, by the impact on the percipient, or ends representants not the object itself, but only its action or effect, will pass into the same. Not the iron tongue, but its vibrations, pass into the metal of the bell. Now in our immediate perception, it is not the mere power or act of the object, but the object itself, which is immediately present. We might indeed attempt to explain this result by a chain of deductions and conclusions, but that, first, the very faculty of deducing and concluding would equally demand an explanation, and secondly, that there exists in fact no such intermediation by logical notions, such as those of cause and effect. It is the object itself not the product of a syllogism, which is present to our consciousness. Or would we explain this supervention of the object to the sensation, by a productive faculty set in motion by an impulse, still the transition, into the percipient, of the object itself, from which the impulse proceeded, assumes a power that can permeate and wholly possess the soul, and like a god by spiritual art, be all in all, and all in every part. And how came the percipient here? And what is become of the wonder-promising matter, that was to perform all these marvels by force of mere figure, weight and motion? The most consistent proceeding of the dogmatic materialist is to fall back into the common rank of soul and bodyists, to affect the mysterious, and declare the whole process a revelation given, and not to be understood, which it would be profane to examine too closely. Data non intelligiture. But a revelation unconfirmed by miracles and a faith not commanded by the conscience, a philosopher may venture to pass by, without suspecting himself of any irreligious tendency. Thus, as materialism has been generally taught, it is utterly unintelligible, and owes all its proselytes to the propensity so common among men, to mistake distinct images for clear conceptions and vice versa, to reject as inconceivable whatever from its own nature is unimaginable. But as soon as it becomes intelligible, it ceases to be materialism. In order to explain thinking, as a material phenomenon, it is necessary to refine matter into a mere modification of intelligence with the twofold function of appearing and perceiving. Even so did Priestley in his controversy with Price. 
he stripped matter of all its material properties, substituted spiritual powers, and when we expected to find a body, behold, we had nothing but its ghost, the apparition of a defunct substance. I shall not dilate further on this subject, because it will, if God grant health and permission, be treated of at large and systematically in a work, which I have many years been preparing, on the productive logos human and divine, with, and as the introduction to, a full commentary on the Gospel of Saint John. To make myself intelligible as far as my present subject requires, it will be sufficient briefly to observe. Dot, 1. That all association demands and presupposes the existence of the thoughts and images to be associated. Dot, 2. That the hypothesis of an external world exactly correspondent to those images or modifications of our own being, which alone, according to this system, we actually behold, is as thorough idealism as Barclay's, inasmuch as it equally, perhaps in a more perfect degree, removes all reality and immediateness of perception and places us in a dream world of phantoms and spectres, the inexplicable swarm and equivocal generation of motions in our own brains. Three. That this hypothesis neither involves the explanation, nor precludes the necessity, of a mechanism and co-adequate forces in the percipient which at the more than magic touch of the impulse from without is to create anew for itself the correspondent object. The formation of a copy is not solved by the mere pre-existence of an original, the copyist of Raphael's transfiguration must repeat more or less perfectly the process of Raphael. It would be easy to explain a thought from the image on the retina and that from the geometry of light, if this very light did not present the very same difficulty. We might as rationally chant the Brahim creed of the tortoise that supported the bear, that supported the elephant, that supported the world, to the tune of this is the house that Jack built. The sick Deo Placichamist we all admit as the sufficient cause and the divine goodness as the sufficient reason, but an answer to the whence and why is no answer to the how, which alone is the physiologist's concern. It is a sophism epigram, and, as Baconeth said, the arrogance of pusillanimity, which lifts up the idol of a mortal's fancy and commands us to fall down and worship it, as a work of divine wisdom an ancile or palladium fallen from heaven. By the very same argument the supporters of the Ptolemaic system might have rebuffed the Newtonian, and pointing to the sky with self-complacent grin, 26, have appealed to common sense, whether the sun did not move and the earth stand still. Chapter 9 Is Philosophy Possible as a Science? and what are its conditions, Giordano Bruno, literary aristocracy, or the existence of a tacit compact among the learned as a privileged order, the author's obligations to the mystics, to Immanuel Kant, the difference between the letter and the spirit of Kant's writings, and a vindication of prudence in the teaching of philosophy. Fitt's attempt to complete the critical system, its partial success and ultimate failure, obligations to Schelling, and among English writers to Saumerez. After I had successively studied in the schools of Locke, Berkeley, Leibniz, and Hartley, and could find in none of them an abiding place for my reason, I began to ask myself, is a system of philosophy, 
as different from mere history and historic classification, possible. If possible, what are its necessary conditions? I was for a while disposed to answer the first question in the negative, and to admit that the sole practicable employment for the human mind was to observe, to collect, and to classify. But I soon felt, that human nature itself fought up against this willful resignation of intellect, and as soon did I find, that the scheme, taken with all its consequences and cleared of all inconsistencies, was not less impracticable than contranatural. Assuming its full extent the position, Nile in intellectu quod non prius in sensu, assume it without Leibniz's qualifying preter ipsum intellectum, and in the same sense, in which the position was understood by Hartley and Condillac, and then what Hume had demonstratively deduced from this concession concerning cause and effect, will apply with equal and crushing force to all the other eleven categorical forms, twenty-seven, and the logical functions corresponding to them. How can we make bricks without straw? or build without cement. We learn all things indeed by occasion of experience, but the very facts so learned force us inward on the antecedents, that must be presupposed in order to render experience itself possible. The first book of Locke's essay, if the supposed error, which it labours to subvert, be not a mere thing of straw, an absurdity which, no man ever did, or indeed ever could, believe, is formed on a sophisma heterosity seos, and involves the old mistake of cum hoc, ergo, propter hoc. The term, philosophy, defines itself as an affection at seeking after the truth, but truth is the correlative of being. This again is no way conceivable, but by assuming as a postulate, that both are a b initio, identical and coherent, that intelligence and being are reciprocally each other's substrate. I presumed that this was a possible conception, i.e. that it involved no logical inconsonance from the length of time during which the scholastic definition of the Supreme Being, as actus purissimus sign alla potentialitate, was received in the schools of theology, both by the pontifician and the reformed divines. The early study of Plato and Plotinus, with the commentaries and the Theologia Platonica of the illustrious Florentine, of Proclus, and Gemistius Plevo, and at a later period of the De Immenso et Innumerabili and the De La Causa, Principio et you know of the philosopher of Nola, who could boast of a Sir Philip Sidney and Fook Greville among his patrons, and whom the idolaters of Rome burnt as an atheist in the year 1600 had all contributed to prepare my mind for the reception and welcoming of the cogito queer sum, its sum queer cogito, a philosophy of seeming hardihood, but certainly the most ancient, and therefore presumptively the most natural. Why need I be afraid? Say rather how dare I be ashamed of the Teutonic Theosophist, Jacob Behman. Many, indeed, and gross were his delusions, and such as furnish frequent and ample occasion for the triumph of the learned over the poor ignorant shoemaker, who had dared think for himself. But while we remember that these delusions were such, as might be anticipated from his utter want of all intellectual discipline, and from his ignorance of rational psychology, 
let it not be forgotten that the latter defect he had in common with the most learned theologians of his age. Neither with books, nor with book-learned men was he conversant. A meek and shy quietist, his intellectual powers were never stimulated into feverous energy by crowds of proselytes, or by the ambition of proselyting. Jacob Behman was an enthusiast, in the strictest sense, as not merely distinguished, but as contradistinguished, from a fanatic. While I in part translate the following observations from a contemporary writer of the continent, let me be permitted to premise, that I might have transcribed the substance from memoranda of my own which were written many years before his pamphlet was given to the world, and that I prefer another's words to my own, partly as a tribute due to priority of publication, but still more from the pleasure of sympathy in a case where coincidence only was possible. Whoever is acquainted with the history of philosophy, during the last two or three centuries, cannot but admit that there appears to have existed a sort of secret and tacit compact among the learned, not to pass beyond a certain limit in speculative science. The privilege of free thought, so highly extolled, has at no time been held valid in actual practice, except within this limit and not a single stride beyond it has ever been ventured without bringing obloquy on the transgressor. The few men of genius among the learned class, who actually did overstep this boundary, anxiously avoided the appearance of having so done. Therefore the true depth of science, and the penetration to the inmost centre, from which all the lines of knowledge diverge to their ever-distant circumference, was abandoned to the illiterate and the simple, whom unstilled yearning, and an original ebulliency of spirit, had urged to the investigation of the indwelling and living ground of all things. These, then, because their names had never been enrolled in the guilds of the learned, were persecuted by the registered liverymen as interlopers on their rights and privileges. All without distinction were branded as fanatics and fantastes, not only those, whose wild and exorbitant imaginations had actually engendered only extravagant and grotesque phantasms, and whose productions were, for the most part, poor copies and gross caricatures of genuine inspiration, but the truly inspired likewise, the originals themselves. And this for no other reason, but because they were the unlearned, men of humble and obscure occupations. When, and from whom among the literati by profession, have we ever heard the divine doxology repeated? I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. 28. No, the haughty priests of learning not only banished from the schools and marts of science all who had dared draw living waters from the fountain, but drove them out of the very temple which meantime the buyers, and sellers, and money changers were suffered to make a den of thieves. And yet it would not be easy to discover any substantial ground for this contemptuous pride in those literati, who have most distinguished themselves by their scorn of Behman, Thullerus, George Fox, and others, unless it be that they could write orthographically, make smooth periods, and had the fashions of authorship almost literally at their fingers' ends, while the latter, in simplicity of soul, made their words immediate echoes of their feelings. 
hence the frequency of those phrases among them, which have been mistaken for pretenses to immediate inspiration, as for instance, it was delivered unto me, I strove not to speak, dash I said, I will be silent, but the word was in my heart as a burning fire, and I could not forbear. Hence to the unwillingness to give offence, hence the foresight, and the dread of the clamours, which would be raised against them, so frequently avowed in the writings of these men, and expressed, as was natural, in the words of the only book, with which they were familiar. 29. Woe is me that I am become a man of strife, and a man of contention I love peace. The souls of men are dear unto me, yet because I seek for light every one of them doth curse me. Oh! It requires deeper feeling, and a stronger imagination, than belong to most of those, to whom reasoning and fluent expression have been as a trade learnt in boyhood to conceive with what might, with what inward strivings and commotion, the perception of a new and vital truth takes possession of an uneducated man of genius. His meditations are almost inevitably employed on the eternal, or the everlasting, for the world is not his friend, nor the world's law. Need we then be surprised, that, under an excitement at once so strong and so unusual, the man's body should sympathize with the struggles of his mind, or that he should at times be so far deluded, as to mistake the tumultuous sensations of his nerves, and the coexisting spectres of his fancy, as parts or symbols of the truths which were opening on him. It has indeed been plausibly observed, that in order to derive any advantage, or to collect any intelligible meaning, from the writings of these ignorant mystics, the reader must bring with him a spirit and judgment superior to that of the writers themselves, and what he brings, what needs he elsewhere seek. A sophism, which I fully agree with Warburton, is unworthy of Milton, how much more so of the awful person, in whose mouth he has placed it. One assertion I will venture to make, as suggested by my own experience, that there exist folios on the human understanding, and the nature of man, which would have a far juster claim to their high rank and celebrity if in the whole huge volume there could be found as much fullness of heart and intellect, as burst forth in many a simple page of George Fox, Jacob Behman, and even of Behman's commentator, the pious and fervid William Law. The feeling of gratitude, which I cherish toward these men, has caused me to digress further than I had foreseen or proposed but to have passed them over in an historical sketch of my literary life and opinions, would have seemed to me like the denial of a debt, the concealment of a boon. For the writings of these mystics acted in no slight degree to prevent my mind from being imprisoned within the outline of any single dogmatic system. They contributed to keep alive the heart in the head gave me an indistinct, yet stirring and working presentiment, that all the products of the mere reflective faculty partook of death, and were as the rattling twigs and sprays in winter, into which a sap was yet to be propelled from some root to which I had not penetrated, if they were to afford my soul either food or shelter. If they were too often a moving cloud of smoke to me by day, yet they were always a pillar of fire throughout the night, during my wanderings through the wilderness of doubt, and enabled me to skirt, without crossing, the sandy deserts of utter unbelief. 
that the system is capable of being converted into an irreligious pantheism, I well know. The ethics of Spinoza may, or may not, be an instance. But at no time could I believe, that in itself and essentially it is incompatible with religion, natural or revealed, and now I am most thoroughly persuaded of the contrary. The writings of the illustrious sage of Koenigsberg, the founder of the critical philosophy, more than any other work, at once invigorated and disciplined my understanding. The originality, the depth, and the compression of the thoughts, the novelty and subtlety, yet solidity and importance of the distinctions, the adamantine chain of the logic, and I will venture to add, paradox as it will appear to those who have taken their notion of Immanuel Kant from reviewers and Frenchmen, the clearness and evidence, of the critique of the pure reason, and critique of the judgment, of the metaphysical elements of natural philosophy, and of his religion within the bounds of pure reason took possession of me as with the giant's hand. After fifteen years' familiarity with them, I still read these and all his other productions with undiminished delight and increasing admiration. The few passages that remained obscure to me, after due efforts of thought, as the chapter on original perception, and the apparent contradictions which occur, I soon found were hints and insinuations referring to ideas, which Kant either did not think it prudent to avow, or which he considered as consistently left behind in a pure analysis, not of human nature in toto, but of the speculative intellect alone. Here therefore he was constrained to commence at the point of reflection, or natural consciousness while in his moral system he was permitted to assume a higher ground, the autonomy of the will, as a postulate deducible from the unconditional command, or, in the technical language of his school, the categorical imperative, of the conscience. He had been in imminent danger of persecution during the reign of the late King of Prussia, that strange compound of lawless debauchery and priest-ridden superstition, and it is probable that he had little inclination, in his old age, to act over again the fortunes, and hairbreadth escapes of Wolf. The expulsion of the first among Kant's disciples, who attempted to complete his system, from the University of Jena with the confiscation and prohibition of the obnoxious work by the joint efforts of the courts of Saxony and Hanover, supplied experimental proof, that the venerable old man's caution was not groundless. In spite therefore of his own declarations, I could never believe, that it was possible for him to have meant no more by his noumenon, or thing in itself than his mere words express, or that in his own conception he confined the whole plastic power to the forms of the intellect, leaving for the external cause, for the material of our sensations, a matter without form, which is doubtless inconceivable. I entertain doubts likewise, whether, in his own mind, he even laid all the stress, which he appears to do, on the moral postulates. An idea, in the highest sense of that word, cannot be conveyed but by a symbol, and, except in geometry, all symbols of necessity involve an apparent contradiction. Phineas signed Twazen, and for those who could not pierce through this symbolic husk, his writings were not intended. Questions which cannot be fully answered without exposing the respondent to personal danger, 
are not entitled to a fair answer, and yet to say this openly, would in many cases furnish the very advantage which the adversary is insidiously seeking after. Veracity does not consist in saying, but in the intention of communicating, truth, and the philosopher who cannot utter the whole truth without conveying falsehood, and at the same time, perhaps, exciting the most malignant passions, is constrained to express himself either mythically or equivocally. When Kant therefore was importuned to settle the disputes of his commentators himself, by declaring what he meant, how could he decline the honours of martyrdom with less offence, than by simply replying, I meant what I said, and at the age of near fourscore, I have something else, and more important to do, than to write a commentary on my own works. Fitz Wissenskaftsler, or law of ultimate science, was to add the keystone of the arch, and by commencing with an act, instead of a thing or substance, Fit assuredly gave the first mortal blow to Spinozism, as taught by Spinoza himself, and supplied the idea of a system truly metaphysical, and of a metaphysique truly systematic i.e. having its spring and principle within itself. But this fundamental idea he overbuilt with a heavy mass of mere notions, and psychological acts of arbitrary reflection. Thus his theory degenerated into a crude, thirty, egoimus, a boastful and hyperstoic hostility to nature, as lifeless, godless, and altogether unholy, while his religion consisted in the assumption of a mere ordo ordinans, which we were permitted exoteris to call God, and his ethics in an ascetic, and almost monkish, mortification of the natural passions and desires. In Schelling's Nature Philosophy, and the System des Transcendental and Idealismus, I first found a genial coincidence with much that I had toiled out for myself, and a powerful assistance in what I had yet to do. I have introduced this statement, as appropriate to the narrative nature of this sketch, yet rather in reference to the work which I have announced in a preceding page, than to my present subject. It would be but a mere act of justice to myself, were I to warn my future readers, than an identity of thought, or even similarity of phrase, will not be at all times a certain proof that the passage has been borrowed from Schelling, or that the conceptions were originally learned from him. In this instance, as in the dramatic lectures of Schlegel to which I have before alluded, from the same motive of self-defense against the charge of plagiarism, many of the most striking resemblances, indeed all the main and fundamental ideas, were born and matured in my mind before I had ever seen a single page of the German philosopher, and I might indeed affirm with truth before the more important works of Schelling had been written, or at least made public. Nor is this coincidence at all to be wondered at. We had studied in the same school, been disciplined by the same preparatory philosophy, namely, the writings of Kant, we had both equal obligations to the polar logic and dynamic philosophy of Giordano Bruno, and Schelling has lately, and, as of recent acquisition, avowed that same affectionate reverence for the labours of Behmen, and other mystics, which I had formed at a much earlier period. The coincidence of Schelling's system with certain general ideas of Behmen, he declares to have been mere coincidence, while my obligations have been more direct. He needs give to Behmen only feelings of sympathy, 
while I owe him a debt of gratitude. God forbid that I should be suspected of a wish to enter into a rivalry with Skelling for the honours so unequivocally his right, not only as a great and original genius, but as the founder of the philosophy of nature, and as the most successful improver of the dynamic system, 31, which, begun by Bruno, was reintroduced, in a more philosophical form, and freed from all its impurities and visionary accompaniments, by Kant, in whom it was the native and necessary growth of his own system. Kant's followers, however, on whom, for the greater part, their master's cloak had fallen without, or with a very scanty portion of, his spirit, had adopted his dynamic ideas, only as a more refined species of mechanics. With exception of one or two fundamental ideas, which cannot be withheld from fit, to Schelling we owe the completion, and the most important victories, of this revolution in philosophy. To me it will be happiness and honour enough should I succeed in rendering the system itself intelligible to my countrymen, and in the application of it to the most awful of subjects for the most important of purposes. Whether a work is the offspring of a man's own spirit, and the product of original thinking, will be discovered by those who are its sole legitimate judges, by better tests than the mere reference to dates. For readers in general, let whatever shall be found in this or any future work of mine, that resembles, or coincides with, the doctrines of my German predecessor, though contemporary, be wholly attributed to him, provided, that the absence of distinct references to his books, which I could not at all times make with truth as designating citations or thoughts actually derived from him, and which, I trust, would, after this general acknowledgement be superfluous, be not charged on me as an ungenerous concealment or intentional plagiarism. I have not indeed, a eu, res angusta de me, been hitherto able to procure more than two of his books, viz. The first volume of his collected tracts, and his system of transcendental idealism, to which, however, I must add a small pamphlet against fit, the spirit of which was to my feelings painfully incongruous with the principles, and which, with the usual allowance afforded to an antithesis, displayed the love of wisdom rather than the wisdom of love. I regard truth as a divine ventriloquist, I care not from whose mouth the sounds are supposed to proceed, if only the words are audible and intelligible. Albeit, I must confess to be half in doubt, whether I should bring it forth or no it being so contrary to the eye of the world, and the world so potent in most men's hearts, that I shall endanger either not to be regarded or not to be understood. And to conclude the subject of citation, with a cluster of citations, which has taken from books, not in common use, may contribute to the reader's amusement as a voluntary before a sermon, dole me i quidem delicius literum in iscato subito jam homins a deos, presa time qui christianos se profitanta, it legeria nice i quod ad delectation emphasit, sustenient nile, undi it discipline severia resit philosophia ipsa jam fia prosa session adoctis negligunta. Quod quidem propositum studiarum, nice i mature corrigita, tam magnum rebus incommodum debit, quam dedit barba brisolim. 
Pertinax res barbabris ist, fata, sed minus potent tamen, quam illa molitis it persuasa prudentia literum, cyrasham carit, sapientiae virtutisc specie mortals misere circumducens. Succedet agita, ut arbitro, hordite a multo post. Pro rusticana seculi nostri ruditate cap tatrix illa communi loquentia roba animi virilis om, omnem virtutum masculum, profligatura nisi caveta. A too prophetic remark, which has been in fulfillment from the year 1680, to the present 1815. By persuasa prudentia. Grinus means self-complacent common sense as opposed to science and philosophic reason. Ist medius ordo, it volut equestris, ingeniarum quidum sagacium, it commodorum rebus humanis, non tamen in primam magnitudinem patentium. Iram hominum, ut sic de calm. Major Anana estimated sedulum s, nihil to mere loci, as usuria labori, it imagine prudentiae it modestia tegaria angustia s partes captus, dum exercitation mac usum, quo isti in civilibus rebus polint, pro natura it magnitude in ingenii pluric accipiant. As therefore physicians are many times forced to leave such methods of curing as themselves know to be the fittest, and being overruled by the patient's impatiency, are fain to try the best they can, in like sort, considering how the case doth stand with this present age, full of tongue and weak of brain, behold we would, if our subject permitted it. Yield to the stream thereof. That way we would be contented to prove our thesis, which being the worse in itself, is notwithstanding now by reason of common imbecility the fitter and likelier to be brooked. If this fear could be rationally entertained in the controversial age of Hooker, under the then robust discipline of the scholastic logic, Pardonably may a writer of the present times anticipate a scanty audience for abstrusist themes, and truths that can neither be communicated nor received without effort of thought, as well as patience of attention. Chesio non ero al calcola de punti, par ch asinina stella annoi predomini. E l somro e l castran si shan congianti. Il tempo di apuleo piu non si nomini, che si allora un sol huum sembrava un asino, mil asinia mir di ira sembran huomini. Chapter x a chapter of digression and anecdotes as an interlude preceding that on the nature and genesis of the imagination or plastic power, on pedantry and pedantic expressions, advice to young authors respecting publication, various anecdotes of the author's literary life, and the progress of his opinions in religion and politics. E. Semplastic The word is not in Johnson nor have I met with it elsewhere. Neither have, I. I constructed it myself from the Greek words, is en platine, to shape into one, because, having to convey a new sense, I thought that a new term would both aid the recollection of my meaning, and prevent its being confounded with the usual import of the word, imagination. But this is pedantry. Not necessarily so, I hope. If I am not misinformed, pedantry consists in the use of words unsuitable to the time, place, and company. 
the language of the market would be in the schools as pedantic, though it might not be reprobated by that name, as the language of the schools in the market. The mere man of the world, who insists that no other terms but such as occur in common conversation should be employed in a scientific disquisition, and with no greater precision, is as truly a pedant as the man of letters, who either overrating the acquirements of his auditors, or misled by his own familiarity with technical or scholastic terms, converses at the wine table with his mind fixed on his museum or laboratory, even though the latter pedant instead of desiring his wife to make the tea should bid her add to the quant. Suff. Of theosinensis the oxide of hydrogen saturated with caloric. To use the colloquial, and in truth somewhat vulgar, metaphor, if the pedant of the cloister, and the pedant of the lobby, both smell equally of the shop, yet the odor from the Russian binding of good old authentic-looking folios and quartos is less annoying than the steams from the tavern or bagnio. Nay, though the pedantry of the scholar should betray a little ostentation, yet a well-conditioned mind would more easily, methinks, tolerate the fox brush of learned vanity, than the song culottery of a contemptuous ignorance that assumes a merit from mutilation in the self-consoling sneer at the pompous encumbrance of tales. The first lesson of philosophic discipline is to wean the student's attention from the degrees of things, which alone form the vocabulary of common life, and to direct it to the kind abstracted from degree. Thus the chemical student is taught not to be startled at disquisitions on the heat in ice, or on latent and fixable light. In such discourse the instructor has no other alternative than either to use old words with new meanings. The plan adopted by Darwin in his Zunamaya winking smiley or to introduce new terms, after the example of Linus and the framers of the present chemical nomenclature. The latter mode is evidently preferable, were it only that the former demands a twofold exertion of thought in one and the same act. For the reader, or hearer, is required not only to learn and bear in mind the new definition, but to unlearn, and keep out of his view, the old and habitual meaning a far more difficult and perplexing task, and for which the mere semblance of eschewing pedantry seems to me an inadequate compensation. Where, indeed, it is in our power to recall an unappropriate term that had without sufficient reason become obsolete, it is doubtless a less evil to restore than to coin a new. Thus to express in one word all that appertains to the perception, considered as passive and merely recipient, I have adopted from our elder classics the word sensuous, because sensual is not at present used, except in a bad sense, or at least as a moral distinction, while sensitive and sensible would each convey a different meaning. Thus too have I followed Hooker, Sanseson, Milton and others, in designating the immediateness of any act or object of knowledge by the word intuition, used sometimes subjectively, sometimes objectively, even as we use the word, thought, now as the thought, or act of thinking, and now as a thought, or the object of our reflection and we do this without confusion or obscurity. The very words, objective and subjective, of such constant recurrence in the schools of yore, I have ventured to reintroduce, 
because I could not so briefly or conveniently by any more familiar terms distinguish the Persiperia from the Persipi. Lastly, I have cautiously discriminated the terms, the reason, and the understanding, encouraged and confirmed by the authority of our genuine divines and philosophers, before the revolution. Both life, and sense, fancy and understanding, whence the soul reason receives, and reason is her bring, discursive or intuitive, discourse, 32, is oftest yours, the latter most is ours, differing but in degree, in kind the same. I say, that I was confirmed by authority so venerable, for I had previous and higher motives in my own conviction of the importance, nay, of the necessity of the distinction, as both an indispensable condition and a vital part of all sound speculation in metaphysics, ethical or theological. To establish this distinction was one main object of the friend, if even in a biography of my own literary life I can with propriety refer to a work, which was printed rather than published, or so published that it had been well for the unfortunate author, if it had remained in manuscript. I have even at this time bitter cause for remembering that, which a number of my subscribers have but a trifling motive for forgetting. This effusion might have been spared, but I would fain flatter myself, that the reader will be less austere than an oriental professor of the Bastinado, who during an attempt to extort per argumentum baculinum a full confession from a culprit, interrupted his outcry of pain by reminding him, that it was a mere digression. All this noise, sir is nothing to the point, and no sort of answer to my questions. Ah, but, replied the sufferer, it is the most pertinent reply in nature to your blows. An imprudent man of common goodness of heart cannot but wish to turn even his imprudences to the benefit of others, as far as this is possible. If therefore any one of the readers of this seminarative should be preparing or intending a periodical work, I warn him, in the first place, against trusting in the number of names on his subscription list. For he cannot be certain that the names were put down by sufficient authority, or, should that be ascertained, it still remains to be known whether they were not extorted by some overzealous friend's importunity, whether the subscriber had not yielded his name, merely from want of courage to answer, no, and with the intention of dropping the work as soon as possible. One gentleman procured me nearly a hundred names for the friend, and not only took frequent opportunity to remind me of his success in his canvas, but laboured to impress my mind with the sense of the obligation I was under to the subscribers, for, as he very pertinently admonished me, fifty-two shillings a year was a large sum to be bestowed on one individual where there were so many objects of charity with strong claims to the assistance of the benevolent. Of these hundred patrons ninety threw up the publication before the fourth number, without any notice, though it was well known to them, that in consequence of the distance, and the slowness and irregularity of the conveyance, I was compelled to lay in a stock of stamped paper for at least eight weeks beforehand, each sheet of which stood me in five pence previously to its arrival at my printers, though the subscription money was not to be received till the twenty-first week after the commencement of the work, and lastly, 
though it was in nine cases out of ten impracticable for me to receive the money for two or three numbers without paying an equal sum for the postage. In confirmation of my first caveat, I will select one fact among many. On my list of subscribers, among a considerable number of names equally flattering, was that of an Earl of Cork, with his address. He might as well have been an Earl of Bottle, for aught I knew of him, who had been content to reverence the peerage in abstracto, rather than in concretis. Of course the friend was regularly sent as far, if I remember right, as the eighteenth number, that is, till a fortnight before the subscription was to be paid. And lo! Just at this time I received a letter from his lordship, reproving me in language far more lordly than courteous for my impudence in directing my pamphlets to him, who knew nothing of me or my work. Seventeen or eighteen numbers of which, however, his lordship was pleased to retain, probably for the culinary or post-culinary conveniences of his servants. Secondly, I warn all others from the attempt to deviate from the ordinary mode of publishing a work by the trade. I thought indeed, that to the purchaser it was indifferent whether 30% of the purchase money went to the booksellers or to the government, and that the convenience of receiving the work by the post at his own door would give the preference to the latter. It is hard, I own, to have been labouring for years, in collecting and arranging the materials, to have spent every shilling that could be spared after the necessaries of life had been furnished, in buying books, or in journeys for the purpose of consulting them or of acquiring facts at the fountain head, then to buy the paper, pay for the printing, and the like, all at least 15% beyond what the trade would have paid and then after all to give 30% not of the net profits, but of the gross results of the sale, to a man who has merely to give the book's shelf or warehouse room, and permit his apprentice to hand them over the counter to those who may ask for them, and this too copy by copy, although, if the work be on any philosophical or scientific subject, it may be years before the edition is sold off. All this, I confess, must seem a hardship, and one, to which the products of industry in no other mode of exertion are subject. Yet even this is better, far better, than to attempt in any way to unite the functions of author and publisher. But the most prudent mode is to sell the copyright, at least of one or more editions, for the most that the trade will offer. By few only can a large remuneration be expected, but fifty pounds and ease of mind are of more real advantage to a literary man, than the chance of five hundred with the certainty of insult and degrading anxieties. I shall have been grievously misunderstood, if this statement should be interpreted as written with the desire of detracting from the character of booksellers or publishers. The individuals did not make the laws and customs of their trade, but, as in every other trade, take them as they find them. Till the evil can be proved to be removable and without the substitution of an equal or greater inconvenience, it were neither wise nor manly even to complain of it. But to use it as a pretext for speaking, or even for thinking, or feeling, unkindly or opprobriously of the tradesmen, as individuals, would be something worse than unwise or even than unmanly, it would be immoral and calamitous. 
My motives point in a far different direction and to far other objects, as will be seen in the conclusion of the chapter. A learned and exemplary old clergyman, who many years ago went to his reward followed by the regrets and blessings of his flock, published at his own expense two volumes octavo, entitled, A New Theory of Redemption. The work was most severely handled in the monthly or critical review, I forget which and this unprovoked hostility became the good old man's favorite topic of conversation among his friends. Well, he used to exclaim, in the second edition, I shall have an opportunity of exposing both the ignorance and the malignity of the anonymous critic. Two or three years however passed by without any tidings from the bookseller who had undertaken the printing and publication of the work, and who was perfectly at his ease, as the author was known to be a man of large property. At length the accounts were written for, and in the course of a few weeks they were presented by the writer for the house, in person. My old friend put on his spectacles, and holding the scroll with no very firm hand, began, paper, so much, oh moderate enough, not at all beyond my expectation. Printing, so much, well, moderate enough. Stitching, covers, advertisements, carriage, and so forth, so much. Still nothing amiss. Selridge, for orthography is no necessary part of a bookseller's literary acquirements, L3. 3s bless me, only three guineas for the what do ye call it, the Selridge. No more, sir, replied the rider. Nay, but that is too moderate, rejoined my old friend. Only three guineas for selling a thousand copies of a work in two volumes. Oh sir! cries the young traveller, you have mistaken the word. There have been none of them sold, they have been sent back from London long ago, and this L3. Three S is for the cellarage, or warehouse room in our bookseller. The work was in consequence preferred from the ominous seller of the publishers to the author's garret, and, on presenting a copy to an acquaintance, the old gentleman used to tell the anecdote with great humour and still greater good nature. With equal lack of worldly knowledge, I was a far more than equal sufferer for it, at the very outset of my authorship. Toward the close of the first year from the time, that in an inauspicious hour I left the friendly cloisters, and the happy grove of quiet, ever honoured Jesus College, Cambridge, I was persuaded by sundry philanthropists and antipolemists to set on foot a periodical work, entitled The Watchman, that, according to the general motto of the work, all might know the truth, and that the truth might make us free. In order to exempt it from the stamp tax, and likewise to contribute as little as possible to the supposed guilt of a war against freedom, it was to be published on every eighth day, thirty-two pages, large octavo, closely printed, and price only four pence. Accordingly with a flaming prospectus, knowledge is power to cry the state of the political atmosphere, and so forth, I set off on a tour to the north, from Bristol to Sheffield, for the purpose of procuring customers, preaching by the way in most of the great towns, as an hireless volunteer, in a blue coat and white waistcoat that not a rag of the women of Babylon might be seen on me. 
for I was at that time and long after, though a Trinitarian, that is ad normam Platonis, in philosophy, yet a zealous Unitarian in religion, more accurately, I was a Silanthropist, one of those who believe our Lord to have been the real son of Joseph, and who lay the main stress on the resurrection rather than on the crucifixion. Oh! Never can I remember those days with either shame or regret. For I was most sincere, most disinterested. My opinions were indeed in many and most important points erroneous, but my heart was single. Wealth, rank, life itself then seemed cheap to me, compared with the interests of what I believed to be the truth and the will of my Maker. I cannot even accuse myself of having been actuated by vanity, for in the expansion of my enthusiasm I did not think of myself at all. My campaign commenced at Birmingham, and my first attack was on a rigid Calvinist, a tallow chandler by trade. He was a tall dingy man in whom length was so predominant over breadth, that he might almost have been borrowed for a founder epocha. Oh that face! A face cat em for sin. I have it before me at this moment. The lank, black, twine-like hair, pinginite essent, cut in a straight line along the black stubble of his thin gunpowder eyebrows, that looked like a scorched aftermath from a last week's shaving. His coat collar behind in perfect unison, both of colour and lustre, with the coarse yet glib cordage, which I suppose he called his hair, and which with a bend in wood at the nape of the neck, the only approach to flex in his whole figure, slunk in behind his waistcoat, while the countenance lank, dark, very hard, and with strong perpendicular furrows, gave me a dim notion of someone looking at me through a used gridiron, all soot, grease, and iron. But he was one of the thoroughbred, a true lover of liberty, and, as I was informed, had proved to the satisfaction of many, that Mr. Pitt was one of the horns of the second beast in the revelations, that spake as a dragon. A person, to whom one of my letters of recommendation had been addressed, was my introducer. It was a new event in my life my first stroke in the new business I had undertaken of an author, yeah, and of an author trading on his own account. My companion after some imperfect sentences and a multitude of hums and has abandoned the cause to his client, and I commenced an harangue of half an hour to filial eutherus, the tallow chandler, varying my notes through the whole gamut of eloquence, from the ratiocinative to the declamatory, and in the latter from the pathetic to the indignant. I argued, I described, I promised, I prophesied, and beginning with the captivity of nations I ended with the near approach of the millennium, finishing the whole with some of my own verses describing that glorious state out of the religious musings such delights as flowed to earth, permitted visitants. When in some hour of solemn jubilee the massive gates of paradise are thrown wide open, and forth come in fragments wild sweet echoes of unearthly melodies, and odours snatched from beds of amaranth, and they, that from the crystal river of life spring up on freshened wing, ambrosial gales. My taper man of lights listened with perseverant and praiseworthy patience, though, as I was afterwards told, on complaining of certain gales that were not altogether ambrosial, it was a melting day with him. 
and what, sir, he said, after a short pause, might the cost be? Only four pence, oh, how I felt the anticlimax, the abysmal bathos of that four pence. Only four pence, sir, each number, to be published on every eighth day. That comes to a deal of money at the end of a year. And how much, did you say, there was to be for the money? Thirty-two pages, sir, large octavo, closely printed. Thirty and two pages. Bless me. Why accept what I does in a family way on the Sabbath, that's more than I ever reads, sir. All the year round. I am as great a one, as any man in Brummagem, sir. For liberty and truth and all them sort of things, but as to this, no offence, I hope, sir, I must beg to be excused. So ended my first canvas, from causes that I shall presently mention, I made but one other application in person. This took place at Manchester to a stately and opulent wholesale dealer in cottons. He took my letter of introduction, and, having perused it, measured me from head to foot and again from foot to head, and then asked if I had any bill or invoice of the thing. I presented my prospectus to him. He rapidly skimmed and hummed over the first side, and still more rapidly the second and concluding page, crushed it within his fingers and the palm of his hand, then most deliberately and significantly rubbed and smoothed one part against the other, and lastly putting it into his pocket turned his back on me with an overrun with these articles and so without another syllable retired into his counting house. And, I can truly say, to my unspeakable amusement, this, I have said, was my second and last attempt. On returning baffled from the first, in which I had vainly essayed to repeat the miracle of Orpheus with the Brahmagem Patriot, I dined with the tradesman who had introduced me to him. After dinner he importuned me to smoke a pipe with him, and two or three other Illuminati of the same rank. I objected, both because I was engaged to spend the evening with a minister and his friends, and because I had never smoked except once or twice in my lifetime and then it was herb tobacco mixed with Orinoco. On the assurance, however, that the tobacco was equally mild, and seeing too that it was of a yellow colour, not forgetting the lamentable difficulty, I have always experienced, in saying, no and in abstaining from what the people about me were doing, I took half a pipe, filling the lower half of the bowl with salt. I was soon however compelled to resign it, in consequence of a giddiness and distressful feeling in my eyes, which, as I had drunk but a single glass of ale, must, I knew, have been the effect of the tobacco. Soon after, deeming myself recovered, I sallied forth to my engagement, but the walk and the fresh air brought on all the symptoms again and, I had scarcely entered the minister's drawing-room, and opened a small packet of letters, which he had received from Bristol for me, ere I sank back on the sofa in a sort of swoon rather than sleep. Fortunately I had found just time enough to inform him of the confused state of my feelings, and of the occasion. For here and thus I lay, my face like a wall that is whitewashing, deathly pale and with the cold drops of perspiration running down it from my forehead, while one after another there dropped in the different gentlemen, 
who had been invited to meet and spend the evening with me, to the number of from fifteen to twenty. As the poison of tobacco acts but for a short time, I at length awoke from insensibility, and looked round on the party, my eyes dazzled by the candles which had been lighted in the interim. By way of relieving my embarrassment one of the gentlemen began the conversation, with have you seen a paper today, Mr. Coleridge? Sir. I replied, rubbing my eyes, I am far from convinced, that a Christian is permitted to read either newspapers or any other works of merely political and temporary interest. This remark, so ludicrously inapposite to, or rather, incongruous with, the purpose, for which I was known to have visited Birmingham, and to assist me in which they were all then met, produced an involuntary and general burst of laughter, and seldom indeed have I passed so many delightful hours, as I enjoyed in that room from the moment of that laugh till an early hour the next morning. Never, perhaps, in so mixed and numerous a party have I since heard conversation, sustained with such animation, enriched with such variety of information and enlivened with such a flow of anecdote. Both then and afterwards they all joined in dissuading me from proceeding with my scheme, assured me in the most friendly and yet most flattering expressions that neither was the employment fit for me, nor I fit for the employment. Yet, if I determined on persevering in it, they promised to exert themselves to the utmost to procure subscribers, and insisted that I should make no more applications in person, but carry on the canvas by proxy. The same hospitable reception the same dissuasion, and, that failing, the same kind exertions in my behalf, I met with at Manchester, Derby, Nottingham, Sheffield, indeed, at every place in which I took up my sojourn. I often recall with affectionate pleasure the many respectable men who interested themselves for me, a perfect stranger to them not a few of whom I can still name among my friends. They will bear witness for me how opposite even then my principles were to those of Jacobinism or even of democracy, and can attest the strict accuracy of the statement which I have left on record in the tenth and eleventh numbers of the Friend. From this rememberable tour I returned with nearly a thousand names on the subscription list of the watchman, yet more than half convinced, that prudence dictated the abandonment of the scheme. But for this very reason I persevered in it, for I was at that period of my life so completely hagridden by the fear of being influenced by selfish motives that to know a mode of conduct to be the dictate of prudence was a sort of presumptive proof to my feelings, that the contrary was the dictate of duty. Accordingly, I commenced the work, which was announced in London by long bills in letters larger than had ever been seen before, and which, I have been informed, for I did not see them myself eclipsed the glories even of the lottery puffs. But alas! The publication of the very first number was delayed beyond the day announced for its appearance. In the second number an essay against fast days, with a most censurable application of a text from Isaiah for its motto, lost me near five hundred of my subscribers at one blow. In the two following numbers I made enemies of all my Jacobin and Democratic patrons, for, disgusted by their infidelity, and their adoption of French morals with French philosophy, 
and perhaps thinking, that charity ought to begin nearest home, instead of abusing the government and the aristocrats chiefly or entirely, as had been expected of me, I leveled my attacks at modern patriotism and even ventured to declare my belief, that whatever the motives of ministers might have been for the sedition, or as it was then the fashion to call them, the gagging bills, yet the bills themselves would produce an effect to be desired by all the true friends of freedom, as far as they should contribute to deter men from openly declaiming on subjects, the principles of which they had never bottomed and from pleading to the poor and ignorant, instead of pleading for them. At the same time I avowed my conviction, that national education and a concurring spread of the gospel were the indispensable condition of any true political malioration. Thus by the time the seventh number was published, I had the mortification, but why should I say this, when in truth I cared too little for anything that concerned my worldly interests to be at all mortified about it? Of seeing the preceding numbers exposed in sundry old iron shops for a penny apiece. At the ninth number I dropped the work. But from the London publisher I could not obtain a shilling, he was a, and set me at defiance. From other places I procured but little, and after such delays as rendered that little worth nothing and I should have been inevitably thrown into jail by my Bristol printer, who refused to wait even for a month, for a sum between eighty and ninety pounds, if the money had not been paid for me by a man by no means affluent, a dear friend, who attached himself to me from my first arrival at Bristol who has continued my friend with a fidelity unconquered by time or even by my own apparent neglect, a friend from whom I never received an advice that was not wise, nor a remonstrance that was not gentle and affectionate. Conscientiously an opponent of the First Revolutionary War, yet with my eyes thoroughly opened to the true character and impotence of the favourers of revolutionary principles in England, principles which I held in abhorrence, for it was part of my political creed, that whoever ceased to act as an individual by making himself a member of any society not sanctioned by his government, forfeited the rights of a citizen a vehement anti-ministerialist, but after the invasion of Switzerland, a more vehement anti-Gallican, and still more intensely an anti-Jacobin, I retired to a cottage at Stowey, and provided for my scanty maintenance by writing verses for a London morning paper. I saw plainly, that literature was not a profession, by which I could expect to live, for I could not disguise from myself, that, whatever my talents might or might not be in other respects, yet they were not of the sort that could enable me to become a popular writer, and that whatever my opinions might be in themselves, they were almost a key distant from all the three prominent parties, the Pittites the Foxites, and the Democrats. Of the unsaleable nature of my writings I had an amusing memento one morning from our own servant girl. For happening to rise at an earlier hour than usual, I observed her putting an extravagant quantity of paper into the grate in order to light the fire, and mildly checked her for her wastefulness, la, sir replied poor Nanny, why, it is only watchman. I now devoted myself to poetry and to the study of ethics and psychology, and so profound was my admiration at this time of Hartley's essay on man, 
that I gave his name to my firstborn. In addition to the gentleman, my neighbor, whose garden joined on to my little orchard, and the cultivation of whose friendship had been my sole motive in choosing Stoey for my residence, I was so fortunate as to acquire, shortly after my settlement there, an invaluable blessing in the society and neighborhood of one, to whom I could look up with equal reverence, whether I regarded him as a poet, a philosopher, or a man. His conversation extended to almost all subjects, except physics and politics, with the latter he never troubled himself. Yet neither my retirement nor my utter abstraction from all the disputes of the day could secure me in those jealous times from suspicion and obloquy, which did not stop at me, but extended to my excellent friend whose perfect innocence was even adduced as a proof of his guilt. One of the many busy sycophants of that day, I here use the word sycophant in its original sense, as a wretch who flatters the prevailing party by informing against his neighbours, under pretence that they are exporters of prohibited figs or fancies. For the moral application of the term it matters not which, one of these sycophantic law mongrels, discoursing on the politics of the neighborhood, uttered the following deep remark, as to Coleridge, there is not so much harm in him, for he is a world brain that talks whatever comes uppermost, but that he is the dark traitor. You never hear him say a syllable on the subject. Now that the hand of Providence has disciplined all Europe into sobriety, as men tame wild elephants, by alternate blows and caresses, now that Englishmen of all classes are restored to their old English notions and feelings, it will with difficulty be credited. How great an influence was at that time possessed and exerted by the spirit of secret defamation, the too constant attendant on party zeal, during the restless interim from 1793 to the commencement of the Addington administration, or the year before the truce of Amiens. For by the latter period the minds of the partisans, exhausted by excess of stimulation and humbled by mutual disappointment, had become languid. The same causes, that inclined the nation to peace, disposed the individuals to reconciliation. Both parties had found themselves in the wrong. The one had confessedly mistaken the moral character of the revolution, and the other had miscalculated both its moral and its physical resources. The experiment was made at the price of great, almost, we may say, of humiliating sacrifices, and wise men foresaw that it would fail, at least in its direct and ostensible object. Yet it was purchased cheaply, and realized an object of equal value and, if possible, of still more vital importance. For it brought about a national unanimity unexampled in our history since the reign of Elizabeth, and Providence, never wanting to a good work when men have done their parts, soon provided a common focus in the cause of Spain which made us all once more Englishmen by at once gratifying and correcting the predilections of both parties. The sincere reveres of the throne felt the cause of loyalty ennobled by its alliance with that of freedom, while the honest zealots of the people could not but admit that freedom itself assumed a more winning form humanized by loyalty and consecrated by religious principle. The youthful enthusiasts who, 
flattered by the morning rainbow of the French Revolution, had made a boast of expatriating their hopes and fears, now, disciplined by the succeeding storms and sobered by increase of years, had been taught to prize and honour the spirit of nationality as the best safeguard of national independence and this again as the absolute prerequisite and necessary basis of popular rights. If in Spain too disappointment has nipped our too forward expectations, yet all is not destroyed that is checked. The crop was perhaps springing up too rank in the stalk to kern well, and there were, doubtless, symptoms of the Gallican blight on it. If superstition and despotism have been suffered to let in their wolvish sheep to trample and eat it down even to the surface, yet the roots remain alive, and the second growth may prove the stronger and healthier for the temporary interruption. At all events, to us heaven has been just and gracious. The people of England did their best and have received their rewards. Long may we continue to deserve it. Causes, which it had been too generally the habit of former statesmen to regard as belonging to another world, are now admitted by all ranks to have been the main agents of our success. We fought from heaven, the stars in their courses fought against Sisera. If then unanimity grounded on moral feelings has been among the least equivocal sources of our national glory, that man deserves the esteem of his countrymen, even as patriots, who devotes his life and the utmost efforts of his intellect to the preservation and continuance of that unanimity by the disclosure and establishment of principles for by these all opinions must be ultimately tried, and, as the feelings of men are worthy of regard only as far as they are the representatives of their fixed opinions, on the knowledge of these all unanimity, not accidental and fleeting, must be grounded. Let the scholar, who doubts this assertion, refer only to the speeches and writings of Edmund Burke at the commencement of the American War and compare them with his speeches and writings at the commencement of the French Revolution. He will find the principles exactly the same and the deductions the same, but the practical inference is almost opposite in the one case from those drawn in the other yet in both equally legitimate and in both equally confirmed by the results. Whence gained he the superiority of foresight? Whence arose the striking difference, and in most instances even, the discrepancy between the grounds assigned by him and by those who voted with him, on the same questions? How are we to explain the notorious fact, that the speeches and writings of Edmund Burke are more interesting at the present day than they were found at the time of their first publication, while those of his illustrious confederates are either forgotten, or exist only to furnish proofs, that the same conclusion, which one man had deduced scientifically, may be brought out by another in consequence of errors that luckily chanced to neutralize each other. It would be unhandsome as a conjecture, even were it not, as it actually is, false in point of fact to attribute this difference to the deficiency of talent on the part of Burke's friends, or of experience, or of historical knowledge. The satisfactory solution is, that Edmund Burke possessed and had sedulously sharpened that eye, which sees all things, actions, and events, in relation to the laws that determine their existence and circumscribe their possibility. He referred habitually to principles. 
He was a scientific statesman, and therefore a seer. For every principle contains in itself the germs of a prophecy, and, as the prophetic power is the essential privilege of science, so the fulfillment of its oracles supplies the outward and, to men in general, the only test of its claim to the title. Wearisome as Burke's refinements appeared to his parliamentary auditors, yet the cultivated classes throughout Europe have reason to be thankful, that he, went on refining, and thought of convincing, while they thought of dining. Our very signboards, said an illustrious friend to me, give evidence, that there has been a Titian in the world. In like manner, not only the debates in Parliament, not only our proclamations and state papers, but the essays and leading paragraphs of our journals are so many remembrances of Edmund Burke. Of this the reader may easily convince himself, if either by recollection or reference he will compare the opposition newspapers at the commencement and during the five or six following years of the French Revolution with the sentiments and grounds of argument assumed in the same class of journals at present, and for some years past. Whether the spirit of Jacobinism, which the writings of Burke exorcised from the higher and from the literary classes, may not, like the ghost in Hamlet, be heard moving and mining in the underground chambers with an activity the more dangerous because less noisy may admit of a question. I have given my opinions on this point, and the grounds of them, in my letters to Judge Fletcher occasioned by his charge to the Wexford Grand Jury, and published in the Courier. Be this as it may, the evil spirit of jealousy, and with it the Cerberian whelps of feud and slander, no longer walk their rounds in cultivated society. Far different were the days to which these anecdotes have carried me back. The dark guesses of some zealous quidnunc met with so congenial a soil in the grave alarm of a titled dogbury of our neighbourhood, that a spy was actually sent down from the government poor surveillance of myself and friend. There must have been not only abundance, but variety of these honourable men at the disposal of ministers, for this proved a very honest fellow. After three weeks truly Indian perseverance in tracking us, for we were commonly together, during all which time seldom were we out of doors, but he contrived to be within hearing, and all the while utterly unsuspected. How indeed could such a suspicion enter our fancies? He not only rejected Sir Dogbury's request that he would try yet a little longer, but declared to him his belief, that both my friend and myself were as good subjects, for aught he could discover to the contrary, as any in his majesty's dominions. He had repeatedly hid himself he said, for hours together behind a bank at the seaside, our favourite seat, and overheard our conversation. At first he fancied, that we were aware of our danger, for he often heard me talk of one spy nosy, which he was inclined to interpret of himself, and of a remarkable feature belonging to him but he was speedily convinced that it was the name of a man who had made a book and lived long ago. Our talk ran most upon books, and we were perpetually desiring each other to look at this, and to listen to that, but he could not catch a word about politics. Once he had joined me on the road, this occurred, as I was returning home alone from my friend's house, which was about three miles from my own cottage, and, 
passing himself off as a traveller, he had entered into conversation with me, and talked of purpose in a democrat way in order to draw me out. The result, it appears, not only convinced him that I was no friend of Jacobinism, but, he added, I had plainly made it out to be such a silly as well as wicked thing, that he felt ashamed though he had only put it on. I distinctly remembered the occurrence, and had mentioned it immediately on my return, repeating what the traveller with his Bardolph nose had said, with my own answer, and so little did I suspect the true object of my tempter air accuser that I expressed with no small pleasure my hope and belief, that the conversation had been of some service to the poor misled malcontent. This incident therefore prevented all doubt as to the truth of the report, which through a friendly medium came to me from the master of the village inn, who had been ordered to entertain the government gentleman in his best manner, but above all to be silent concerning such a person being in his house. At length he received Sir Dogbury's commands to accompany his guest at the final interview, and, after the absolving suffrage of the gentleman honoured with the confidence of ministers, answered, as follows, to the following queries, D. Well, landlord, and what do you know of the person in question? L. I. see him often pass by with Maester. My landlord, that is, the owner of the house, and sometimes with the newcomers at Holford, but I never said a word to him or he to me. D. But do you not know, that he has distributed papers and handbills of a seditious nature among the common people? L. No, your honour. I never heard of such a thing. D. Have you not seen this Mr. Coleridge, or heard of, his haranguing and talking to knots and clusters of the inhabitants, what are you grinning at, sir? I'll beg your honour's pardon. But I was only thinking, how they'd have stared at him. If what I have heard be true, your honour. They would not have understood a word he said. When our vicar was here, Dr. L. the master of the great school and canon of Windsor, there was a great dinner party at Maester's, and one of the farmers, that was there, told us that he and the doctor talked real Hebrew Greek at each other for an hour together after dinner. D. Answer the question, sir. Does he ever harangue the people? L. I hope your honour and he angry with me. I can say no more than I know. I never saw him talking with any one, but my landlord, and our curate, and the strange gentleman. D. Has he not been seen wandering on the hills towards the channel, and along the shore, with books and papers in his hand, taking charts and maps of the country? L.Y., as to that, your honour. I own, I have heard, I am sure, I would not wish to say ill of anybody, but it is certain, that I have heard, d. speak out, man. Don't be afraid, you are doing your duty to your king and government. What have you heard? L.Y., folks do say, your honour as how that he is a poet, and that he is going to put Quantock and all about here in print, and as they be so much together, I suppose that the strange gentleman has some concern in the business. So ended this formidable inquisition, the latter part of which alone requires explanation, and at the same time entitles the anecdote to a place in my literary life. I had considered it as a defect in the admirable poem of the task, 
that the subject, which gives the title to the work, was not, and indeed could not be, carried on beyond the three or four first pages, and that, throughout the poem, the connections are frequently awkward, and the transitions abrupt and arbitrary. I sought for a subject, that should give equal room and freedom for description, incident, and impassioned reflections on men, nature, and society, yet supply in itself a natural connection to the parts, and unity to the whole. Such a subject I conceived myself to have found in a stream, traced from its source in the hills among the yellow-red moss and conical glass-shaped tufts of bent, to the first break or fall, where its drops become audible, and it begins to form a channel, thence to the peat and turf barn, itself built of the same dark squares as it sheltered, to the sheepfold, to the first cultivated plot of ground, to the lonely cottage and its bleak garden won from the heath, to the hamlet, the villages, the market town, the manufactories, and the seaport. My walks therefore were almost daily on the top of Quantock, and among its sloping combs. With my pencil and memorandum book in my hand, I was making studies, as the artists call them, and often moulding my thoughts into verse, with the objects and imagery immediately before my senses. Many circumstances, evil and good, intervened to prevent the completion of the poem, which was to have been entitled The Brook. Had I finished the work, it was my purpose in the heat of the moment to have dedicated it to our then Committee of Public Safety as containing the charts and maps, with which I was to have supplied the French government in aid of their plans of invasion. And these two for a tract of coast that, from Clevedon to Minehead, scarcely permits the approach of a fishing boat. All my experience from my first entrance into life to the present hour is in favour of the warning maxim, that the man, who opposes in toto the political or religious zealots of his age, is safer from their obloquy than he who differs from them but in one or two points, or perhaps only in degree. By that transfer of the feelings of private life into the discussion of public questions, which is the queen bee in the hive of party fanaticism, the partisan has more sympathy with an intemperate opposite than with a moderate friend. We now enjoy an intermission, and long may it continue. In addition to far higher and more important merits, our present Bible societies and other numerous associations for national or charitable objects, may serve perhaps to carry off the superfluous activity and fervor of stirring minds in innocent hyperboles and the bustle of management. But the poison tree is not dead, though the sap may for a season have subsided to its roots. At least let us not be lulled into such a notion of our entire security, as not to keep watch and ward, even on our best feelings. I have seen gross intolerance shown in support of toleration, sectarian antipathy most obtrusively displayed in the promotion of an undistinguishing comprehension of sects, and acts of cruelty, I had almost said of treachery, committed in furtherance of an object vitally important to the cause of humanity, and all this by men too of naturally kind dispositions and exemplary conduct. The magic rod of fanaticism is preserved in the very aditar of human nature, and needs only the re-exciting warmth of a master hand to bud forth afresh and produce the old fruits. 
the horror of the peasants' war in Germany, and the direful effects of the Anabaptists' tenets, which differed only from those of Jacobinism by the substitution of theological for philosophical jargon, struck all Europe for a time with affright. Yet little more than a century was sufficient to obliterate all effective memory of these events. The same principles with similar though less dreadful consequences were again at work from the imprisonment of the first Charles to the restoration of his son. The fanatic maxim of extirpating fanaticism by persecution produced a civil war. The war ended in the victory of the insurgents, but the temper survived, and Milton had abundant grounds for asserting that Presbyter was but old priest writ large. One good result, thank heaven, of this zealotry was the re-establishment of the church. And now it might have been hoped that the mischievous spirit would have been bound for a season, and a seal set upon him, that he should deceive the nation no more. 33. But no. The ball of persecution was taken up with undiminished vigour by the persecuted. The same fanatic principle that, under the solemn oath and covenant, had turned cathedrals into stables, destroyed the rarest trophies of art and ancestral piety, and hunted the brightest ornaments of learning and religion into holes and corners, now marched under episcopal banners, and, having first crowded the prisons of England, emptied its whole vial of wrath on the miserable covenanters of Scotland. 34. A merciful providence at length constrained both parties to join against a common enemy. A wise government followed, and the established church became, and now is, not only the brightest example, but our best and only sure bulwark, of toleration, the true and indispensable bank against a new inundation of persecuting zeal. Esto perpetua. A long interval of quiet succeeded, or rather, the exhaustion had produced a cold fit of the egg which was symptomatized by indifference among the many, and a tendency to infidelity or skepticism in the educated classes. At length those feelings of disgust and hatred, which for a brief while the multitude had attached to the crimes and absurdities of sectarian and democratic fanaticism, were transferred to the oppressive privileges of the noblesse, and the luxury, intrigues and favoritism of the continental courts. The same principles, dressed in the ostentatious garb of a fashionable philosophy, once more rose triumphant and effected the French Revolution. And have we not within the last three or four years had reason to apprehend, that the detestable maxims and correspondent measures of the late French despotism had already bedimmed the public recollections of democratic frenzy? had drawn off to other objects the electric force of the feelings which had massed and upheld those recollections, and that a favourable concurrence of occasions was alone wanting to awaken the thunder and precipitate the lightning from the opposite quarter of the political heaven. In part from constitutional indolence, which in the very heyday of hope had kept my enthusiasm in check, but still more from the habits and influences of a classical education and academic pursuits, scarcely had a year elapsed from the commencement of my literary and political adventures before my mind sank into a state of thorough disgust and despondency both with regard to the disputes and the parties disputant. With more than poetic feeling I exclaimed, 
the sensual and the dark rebel in vain, slaves by their own compulsion. In mad game they break their manacles, to wear the name of freedom, graven on a heavier chain. O Liberty! With profitless endeavour have I pursued thee many a weary hour, but thou nor swellest thee the victor's pomp, nor ever didst breathe thy soul in forms of human power. Alike from all, how they praise thee, nor prayer nor boastful name delays thee, from superstitions harpy minions and factious blasphemies obscene as slaves. Thou speedest on thy cherub pinions, the guide of homeless winds and playmate of the waves. I retired to a cottage in Somersetshire at the foot of Quantock, and devoted my thoughts and studies to the foundations of religion and morals. Here I found myself all afloat. Doubts rushed in broke upon me from the fountains of the great deep and fell from the windows of heaven. The fontal truths of natural religion and the books of revelation alike contributed to the flood, and it was long ere my ark touched on an array rot, and rested. The idea of the Supreme Being appeared to me to be as necessarily implied in all particular modes of being as the idea of infinite space in all the geometrical figures by which space is limited. I was pleased with the Cartesian opinion, that the idea of God is distinguished from all other ideas by involving its reality, but I was not wholly satisfied. I began then to ask myself, what proof I had of the outward existence of anything. Of this sheet of paper for instance, as a thing in itself, separate from the phenomenon or image in my perception. I saw, that in the nature of things such proof is impossible, and that of all modes of being, that are not objects of the senses. The existence is assumed by a logical necessity arising from the constitution of the mind itself, by the absence of all motive to doubt it, not from any absolute contradiction in the supposition of the contrary. Still the existence of a being, the ground of all existence, was not yet the existence of a moral creator, and governor in the position, that all reality is either contained in the necessary being as an attribute, or exists through him, as its ground, it remains undecided whether the properties of intelligence and will are to be referred to the supreme being in the former or only in the latter sense, as inherent attributes, or only as consequences that have existence in other things through him. 35. Were the latter the truth, then notwithstanding all the preeminence which must be assigned to the eternal first from the sufficiency, unity, and independence of his being, as the dread ground of the universe, his nature would yet fall far short of that, which we are bound to comprehend in the idea of God. 4 without any knowledge or determining resolve of its own, it would only be a blind necessary ground of other things and other spirits, and thus would be distinguished from the fate of certain ancient philosophers in no respect, but that of being more definitely and intelligibly described. For a very long time, indeed, I could not reconcile personality with infinity and my head was with Spinoza, though my whole heart remained with Paul and John. Yet there had dawned upon me, even before I had met with the critique of the pure reason, a certain guiding light. If the mere intellect could make no certain discovery of a holy and intelligent first cause, it might yet supply a demonstration that no legitimate argument could be drawn from the intellect against its truth. 
And what is this more than Saint Paul's assertion, that by wisdom, more properly translated by the powers of reasoning, no man ever arrived at the knowledge of God? What more than the sublimest, and probably the oldest, book on earth has taught us, silver and gold man searcheth out, bringeth the ore out of the earth, and darkness into light. But where findeth he wisdom? Where is the place of understanding? The abyss crieth, it is not in me. Ocean echoeth back, not in me. Whence then cometh wisdom? Where dwelleth understanding? Hidden from the eyes of the living kept secret from the fowls of heaven. Hell and death answer, we have heard the rumour thereof from afar. God marketh out the road to it, God knoweth its abiding place. He beholdeth the ends of the earth, he surveyeth what is beneath the heavens. And as he weighed out the winds, and measured the sea, and appointed laws to the rain, and a path to the thunder, a path to the flashes of the lightning. Then did he see it, and he counted it, he searched into the depth thereof, and with a line did he compass it round. But to man he said, The fear of the Lord is wisdom for thee. And to avoid evil, that is thy understanding. 36. I become convinced, that religion, as both the cornerstone and the keystone of morality, must have a moral origin, so far at least, that the evidence of its doctrines could not, like the truths of abstract science, be wholly independent of the will. It were therefore to be expected, that its fundamental truth would be such as might be denied, though only, by the fool, and even by the fool from the madness of the heart alone. The question then concerning our faith in the existence of a God, not only as the ground of the universe by his essence, but as its maker and judge by his wisdom and holy will, appeared to stand thus. The sciential reason, the objects of which are purely theoretical, remains neutral, as long as its name and semblance are not usurped by the opponents of the doctrine. But it then becomes an effective ally by exposing the false show of demonstration, or by evincing the equal demonstrability of the contrary from premises equally logical. 37. The understanding meantime suggests, the analogy of experience facilitates, the belief. Nature excites and recalls it, as by a perpetual revelation. Our feelings almost necessitate it, and the law of conscience peremptorily commands it. The arguments, that at all apply to it, are in its favour and there is nothing against it, but its own sublimity. It could not be intellectually more evident without becoming morally less effective, without counteracting its own end by sacrificing the life of faith to the cold mechanism of a worthless because compulsory assent. The belief of a god and a future state if a passive acquiescence may be flattered with the name of belief, does not indeed always beget a good heart, but a good heart so naturally begets the belief, that the very few exceptions must be regarded as strange anomalies from strange and unfortunate circumstances. From these premises I proceeded to draw the following conclusions. First, that having once fully admitted the existence of an infinite yet self-conscious creator, we are not allowed to ground the irrationality of any other article of faith on arguments which would equally prove that to be irrational, 
which we had allowed to be real. Secondly, that whatever is deducible from the admission of a self-comprehending and creative spirit may be legitimately used in proof of the possibility of any further mystery concerning the divine nature. Possibilitatem mysteriorum, trinitatis, etc., contra insultus infidelium it hereticorum a contradictionibus vindico, Hord quidem veritatem, qua revelation sola stabiliri posit, says Leibniz in a letter to his duke. He then adds the following just and important remark. In vain will tradition or texts of scripture be adduced in support of a doctrine, don't clava impossibilitatis it contradictionis e manibus horum her culum extorta for it. For the heretic will still reply, that texts, the literal sense of which is not so much above as directly against all reason, must be understood figuratively as herd is a fox, and so forth. These principles I held, philosophically, while in respect of revealed religion I remained a zealous Unitarian. I considered the idea of the Trinity a fair scholastic inference from the being of God, as a creative intelligence, and that it was therefore entitled to the rank of an esoteric doctrine of natural religion. But seeing in the same no practical or moral bearing, I confined it to the schools of philosophy. The admission of the Logos, as hypostasized, that is, neither a mere attribute, nor a personification, in no respect removed my doubts concerning the Incarnation and the Redemption by the Cross, which I could neither reconcile in reason with the impassiveness of the Divine Being, nor in my moral feelings with the sacred distinction between things and persons, the vicarious payment of a debt and the vicarious expiation of guilt. A more thorough revolution in my philosophic principles, and a deeper insight into my own heart, were yet wanting. Nevertheless, I cannot doubt, that the difference of my metaphysical notions from those of Unitarians in general contributed to my final reconversion to the whole truth in Christ even as according to his own confession the books of certain Platonic philosophers, Libri Quorundum Platonicorum, commenced the rescue of St. Augustine's faith from the same error aggravated by the far darker accompaniment of the Manichaean heresy. While my mind was thus perplexed, by a gracious providence for which I can never be sufficiently grateful, the generous and munificent patronage of Mr. Josia, and Mr. Thomas Wedgwood enabled me to finish my education in Germany. Instead of troubling others with my own crude notions and juvenile compositions, I was thenceforward better employed in attempting to storm my own head with the wisdom of others. I made the best use of my time and means and there is therefore no period of my life on which I can look back with such unmingled satisfaction. After acquiring a tolerable sufficiency in the German language, 38, at Ratzeburg, which with my voyage and journey thither I have described in the friend, I proceeded through Hanover to Göttingen. Here I regularly attended the lectures on physiology in the morning, and on natural history in the evening, under Blue Menbach, a name as dear to every Englishman who has studied at that university, as it is venerable to men of science throughout Europe. Eichhorn's lectures on the New Testament were repeated to me from notes by a student from Ratzeburg a young man of sound learning and indefatigable industry, who is now, I believe, 
a professor of the Oriental languages at Heidelberg. But my chief efforts were directed towards a grounded knowledge of the German language and literature. From Professor Titchson I received as many lessons in the Gothic of Ulfilus as sufficed to make me acquainted with its grammar, and the radical words of most frequent occurrence, and with the occasional assistance of the same philosophical linguist, I read through, 39. Otfried's metrical paraphrase of the Gospel, and the most important remains of the Theotiscan, or the transitional state of the Teutonic language from the Gothic to the Old German of the Swabian period. Of this period, the polished dialect of which is analogous to that of our Chaucer, and which leaves the philosophic student in doubt whether the language has not since then lost more in sweetness and flexibility, than it has gained in condensation and copiousness, I read with sedulous accuracy the Minnesinger, or Singers of Love, the Provencal poets of the Swabian court, and the metrical romances, and then laboured through sufficient specimens of the master singers, their degenerate successors. Not however without occasional pleasure from the rude, yet interesting strains of Hans Sachs, the cobbler of Nuremberg. Of this man's genius five folio volumes with double columns are extant in print, and nearly an equal number in manuscript, yet the indefatigable bard takes care to inform his readers, that he never made a shoe the less but had virtuously reared a large family by the labour of his hands. In Pindar, Chaucer, Dante, Milton, and many more, we have instances of the close connection of poetic genius with the love of liberty and of genuine reformation. The moral sense at least will not be outraged, if I add to the list the name of this honest shoemaker a trade by the by remarkable for the production of philosophers and poets. His poem entitled The Morning Star, was the very first publication that appeared in praise and support of Luther, and an excellent hymn of Hans Sachs, which has been deservedly translated into almost all the European languages, was commonly sung in the Protestant churches whenever the heroic reformer visited them. In Luther's own German writings, and eminently in his translation of the Bible, the German language commenced. I mean the language as it is at present written, that which is called the High German, as contradistinguished from the Plattdeutsch, the dialect on the flat or northern countries, and from the Abertuch the language of the Middle and Southern Germany. The High German is indeed a lingua communis, not actually the native language of any province, but the choice and fragrancy of all the dialects. From this cause it is at once the most copious and the most grammatical of all the European tongues. Within less than a century after Luther's death the German was inundated with pedantic barbarisms. A few volumes of this period I read through from motives of curiosity, for it is not easy to imagine anything more fantastic than the very appearance of their pages. Almost every third word is a Latin word with a Germanized ending the Latin portion being always printed in Roman letters, while in the last syllable the German character is retained. At length, about the year 1620, a Pitz arose, whose genius more nearly resembled that of Dreden than any other poet, who at present occurs to my recollection. In the opinion of Lessing, the most acute of critics, and of Adelung, the first of lexicographers, 
Upitz, and the Silesian poets, his followers, not only restored the language, but still remain the models of pure diction. A stranger has no vote on such a question, but after repeated perusal of the works of Apitz my feelings justified the verdict, and I seemed to have acquired from them a sort of tact for what is genuine in the style of later writers. Of the splendid era, which commenced with Gellert, Klopstock, Ramler, Lessing, and their compeers, I need not speak. With the opportunities which I enjoyed, it would have been disgraceful not to have been familiar with their writings, and I have already said as much as the present biographical sketch requires concerning the German philosophers, whose works, for the greater part, I became acquainted with at a far later period. Soon after my return from Germany I was solicited to undertake the literary and political department in the Morning Post, and I acceded to the proposal on the condition that the paper should thenceforwards be conducted on certain fixed and announced principles, and that I should neither be obliged nor requested to deviate from them in favour of any party or any event. In consequence, that journal became and for many years continued anti-ministerial indeed, yet with a very qualified approbation of the opposition, and with far greater earnestness and zeal both anti-Jacobin and anti-Gallican. To this hour I cannot find reason to approve of the first war either in its commencement or its conduct. Nor can I understand, with what reason either Mr. Perceval, whom I am singular enough to regard as the best and wisest minister of this reign, nor the present administration, can be said to have pursued the plans of Mr. Pitt. The love of their country, and perseverant hostility to French principles and French ambition are indeed honourable qualities common to them and to their predecessor. But it appears to me as clear as the evidence of the facts can render any question of history, that the successes of the Perceval and of the existing ministry have been owing to their having pursued measures the direct contrary to Mr. Pitt's. Such for instance are the concentration of the national force to one object, the abandonment of the subsidizing policy, so far at least as neither to go at nor bribe the continental courts into war, till the convictions of their subjects had rendered it a war of their own seeking, and above all, in their manly and generous reliance on the good sense of the English people and on that loyalty which is linked to the very, forty, heart of the nation by the system of credit and the interdependence of property. Be this as it may, I am persuaded that the Morning Post proved a far more useful ally to the government in its most important objects, in consequence of its being generally considered as moderately anti-ministerial than if it had been the avowed eulogist of Mr. Pitt. The few, whose curiosity or fancy should lead them to turn over the journals of that date, may find a small proof of this in the frequent charges made by the Morning Chronicle, that such and such essays or leading paragraphs had been sent from the Treasury. The rapid and unusual increase in the sale of the Morning Post is a sufficient pledge, that genuine impartiality with a respectable portion of literary talent will secure the success of a newspaper without the aid of party or ministerial patronage. But by impartiality I mean an honest and enlightened adherence to a code of intelligible principles previously announced and faithfully referred to in support of every judgment on men and events, not indiscriminate abuse, 
not the indulgence of an editor's own malignant passions, and still less, if that be possible, a determination to make money by flattering the envy and cupidity, the vindictive restlessness and self-conceit of the half-witted vulgar, a determination almost fiendish, but which, I have been informed, has been boastfully avowed by one man, the most notorious of these mob sycophants. From the commencement of the Addington administration to the present day, whatever I have written in the Morning Post, or, after that paper was transferred to other proprietors, in the Courier, has been in defence or furtherance of the measures of government. Things of this nature scarce survive that night that gives them birth. They perish in the sight, cast by so far from afterlife, that there can scarcely aught be said, but that they were. Yet in these labours I employed, and, in the belief of partial friends wasted, the prime and manhood of my intellect. Most assuredly, they added nothing to my fortune or my reputation. The industry of the weak supplied the necessities of the weak. From government or the friends of government I not only never received remuneration, nor ever expected it, but I was never honoured with a single acknowledgement or expression of satisfaction. Yet the retrospect is far from painful or matter of regret. I am not indeed silly enough to take as anything more than a violent hyperbole of party debate, Mr. Fox's assertion that the late war, I trust that the epithet is not prematurely applied, was a war produced by the Morning Post or I should be proud to have the words inscribed on my tomb. As little do I regard the circumstance, that I was a specified object of Bonaparte's resentment during my residence in Italy in consequence of those essays in the Morning Post during the Peace of Amiens. Of this I was warned, directly, by Baron von Humboldt, the Prussian plenipotentiary, who at that time was the minister of the Prussian court at Rome, and indirectly, through his secretary, by Cardinal Fesch himself. Nor do I lay any greater weight on the confirming fact, that an order for my arrest was sent from Paris, from which danger I was rescued by the kindness of a noble Benedictine and the gracious connivance of that good old man, the present Pope. For the late tyrant's vindictive appetite was omnivorous, and preyed equally on a duck d'Ingian, 41, and the writer of a newspaper paragraph. Like a true vulture, 42, Napoleon with an eye not less telescopic, and with a taste equally coarse in his raven could descend from the most dazzling heights to pounce on the leveret in the brake, or even on the field mouse amid the grass. But I do derive a gratification from the knowledge, that my essays contributed to introduce the practice of placing the questions and events of the day in a moral point of view in giving a dignity to particular measures by tracing their policy or impolicy to permanent principles, and an interest to principles by the application of them to individual measures. In Mr. Burke's writings indeed the germs of almost all political truths may be found. But I dare assume to myself the merit of having first explicitly defined and analysed the nature of Jacobinism, and that in distinguishing the Jacobin from the Republican, the Democrat, and the mere demagogue, I both rescued the word from remaining a mere term of abuse, and put on their guard many honest minds, who even in their heat of zeal against Jacobinism, 
admitted or supported principles from which the worst parts of that system may be legitimately deduced. That these are not necessary practical results of such principles, we owe to that fortunate inconsequence of our nature, which permits the heart to rectify the errors of the understanding. The detailed examination of the consular government and its pretended constitution, and the proof given by me, that it was a consummate despotism in masquerade, extorted a recantation even from the morning chronicle, which had previously extolled this constitution as the perfection of a wise and regulated liberty. On every great occurrence I endeavoured to discover in past history the event, that most nearly resembled it. I procured, wherever it was possible, the contemporary historians, memorialists, and pamphleteers. Then fairly subtracting the points of difference from those of likeness, as the balance favoured the former or the latter. I conjectured that the result would be the same or different. In the series of essays entitled A Comparison of France under Napoleon with Rome under the First Caesars and in those which followed on the probable final restoration of the Bourbons I feel myself authorized to affirm, by the effect produced on many intelligent men, that, were the dates wanting, it might have been suspected that the essays had been written within the last twelve months. The same plan I pursued at the commencement of the Spanish Revolution, and with the same success, taking the War of the United Provinces with Philip II as the groundwork of the comparison. I have mentioned this from no motives of vanity nor even from motives of self-defense, which would justify a certain degree of egotism, especially if it be considered, how often and grossly I have been attacked for sentiments, which I have exerted my best powers to confute and expose, and how grievously these charges acted to my disadvantage while I was in Malta. Or rather they would have done so if my own feelings had not precluded the wish of a settled establishment in that island. But I have mentioned it from the full persuasion that, armed with the twofold knowledge of history and the human mind, a man will scarcely err in his judgment concerning the sum total of any future national event, if he have been able to procure the original documents of the past together with authentic accounts of the present, and if he have a philosophic tact for what is truly important in facts, and in most instances therefore for such facts as the dignity of history has excluded from the volumes of our modern compilers, by the courtesy of the age entitled historians. To have lived in vain must be a painful thought to any man, and especially so to him who has made literature his profession. I should therefore rather condole than be angry with the mind, which could attribute to no worthier feelings than those of vanity or self-love, the satisfaction which I acknowledged myself to have enjoyed from the republication of my political essays either whole or as extracts, not only in many of our own provincial papers, but in the federal journals throughout America. I regarded it as some proof of my not having labored altogether in vain, that from the articles written by me shortly before and at the commencement of the late unhappy war with America, not only the sentiments were adopted, but in some instances the very language, in several of the Massachusetts state papers. But no one of these motives nor all conjointly would have impelled me to a statement so uncomfortable to my own feelings, 
had not my character been repeatedly attacked by an unjustifiable intrusion on private life, as of a man incorrigibly idle, and who entrusted not only with ample talents, but favoured with unusual opportunities of improving them, had nevertheless suffered them to rust away without any efficient exertion, either for his own good or that of his fellow creatures. Even if the compositions, which I have made public, and that too in a form the most certain of an extensive circulation, though the least flattering to an author's self-love, had been published in books, they would have filled a respectable number of volumes, though every passage of merely temporary interest were omitted. My prose writings have been charged with a disproportionate demand on the attention, with an excess of refinement in the mode of arriving at truths, with beating the ground for that which might have been run down by the eye, with the length and laborious construction of my periods, in short with obscurity and the love of paradox. But my severest critics have not pretended to have found in my compositions triviality, or traces of a mind that shrunk from the toil of thinking. No one has charged me with tricking out in other words the thoughts of others, or with hashing up anew the Cram Benjamdis's coctum of English literature or philosophy. Seldom have I written that in a day the acquisition or investigation of which had not cost me the previous labour of a month. But are books the only channel through which the stream of intellectual usefulness can flow? Is the diffusion of truth to be estimated by publications, or publications by the truth, which they diffuse or at least contain? I speak it in the excusable warmth of a mind stung by an accusation, which has not only been advanced in reviews of the widest circulation, not only registered in the bulkiest works of periodical literature, but by frequency of repetition has become an admitted fact in private literary circles and thoughtlessly repeated by too many who call themselves my friends, and whose own recollections ought to have suggested a contrary testimony. Would that the criterion of a scholar's utility were the number and moral value of the truths, which he has been the means of throwing into the general circulation, or the number and value of the minds whom by his conversation or letters, he has excited into activity, and supplied with the germs of their aftergrowth. A distinguished rank might not indeed, even then, be awarded to my exertions, but I should dare look forward with confidence to an honourable acquittal. I should dare appeal to the numerous and respectable audiences, which at different times and in different places honoured my lecture rooms with their attendance, whether the points of view from which the subjects treated of were surveyed, whether the grounds of my reasoning were such, as they had heard or read elsewhere, or have since found in previous publications. I can conscientiously declare, that the complete success of the remorse on the first night of its representation did not give me as great or as heartfelt a pleasure, as the observation that the pit and boxes were crowded with faces familiar to me, though of individuals whose names I did not know, and of whom I knew nothing, but that they had attended one or other of my courses of lectures. It is an excellent though perhaps somewhat vulgar proverb, that there are cases where a man may be as well in for a pound as for a penny. To those, who from ignorance of the serious injury I have received from this rumour of having dreamed away my life to no purpose, injuries which I unwillingly remember at all, 
much less am disposed to record in a sketch of my literary life, or to those, who from their own feelings, or the gratification they derive from thinking contemptuously of others, would like Job's comforters attribute these complaints, extorted from me by the sense of wrong, to self-conceit or presumptuous vanity, I have already furnished such ample materials, that I shall gain nothing by withholding the remainder. I will not therefore hesitate to ask the consciences of those, who from their long acquaintance with me and with the circumstances are best qualified to decide or be my judges, whether the restitution of the suum quick would increase or detract from my literary reputation. In this exculpation I hope to be understood as speaking of myself comparatively, and in proportion to the claims, which others are entitled to make on my time or my talents. By what I have effected, am I to be judged by my fellow men, what I could have done, is a question for my own conscience. On my own account I may perhaps have had sufficient reason to lament my deficiency in self-control, and the neglect of concentering my powers to the realization of some permanent work. But to verse rather than to prose, if to either, belongs the voice of mourning for keen pangs of love, awakening as a babe turbulent, with an outcry in the heart and fears self-willed that shunned the eye of hope, and hope that scarce would know itself from fear, sense of past youth, and manhood come in vain, and genius given and knowledge won in vain, and all which I had culled in wood walks wild, and all which patient toil had reared, and all, commune with thee had opened out, but flowers. Strewed on my corpse, and borne upon my bier, in the same coffin, for the self-same grave. These will exist, for the future, I trust, only in the poetic strains, which the feelings at the time called forth. In those only, gentle reader, affectus animi varios, bellunc sequuses per legis invidii, curos revolvis inanes, Quas humilis ten ro stylus olim effudit in evo. Pelegis it lacrimas, it quod fere trata secuta il pure puro fecit me i cuspid vulnus. Omnia Paul 18 consumit longia etas, vivendoc simul morima, rapamurc mainendo. Ips me i calatus enim non il vidbor, friends alirist. Maresc alii, nova mentis imago, vox aliudxenet, jam observatio vitae multa dedit, lugaria nile, fer omnia, jam paul 18 lacrimas rerum experientia tercit. Chapter 11 An affectionate exhortation to those who in early life feel themselves disposed to become authors. It was a favourite remark of the late Mr. Whitbreads, that no man does anything from a single motive. The separate motives, or rather moods of mind, which produced the preceding reflections and anecdotes have been laid open to the reader in each separate instance. But an interest in the welfare of those who at the present time may be in circumstances not dissimilar to my own at my first entrance into life, has been the constant accompaniment, and, as it were, the undersong of all my feelings. Whitehead exerting the prerogative of his laureateship addressed to youthful poets a poetic charge, which is perhaps the best, and certainly the most interesting of his works. With no other privilege than that of sympathy and sincere good wishes, I would address an affectionate exhortation to the youthful literati, 
grounded on my own experience. It will be but short, for the beginning, middle, and end converge to one charge, never pursue literature as a trade. With the exception of one extraordinary man, I have never known an individual, least of all an individual of genius, healthy or happy without a profession, that is, some regular employment, which does not depend on the will of the moment, and which can be carried on so far mechanically that an average quantum only of health, spirits, and intellectual exertion are requisite to its faithful discharge. Three hours of leisure, unannoyed by any alien anxiety, and looked forward to with delight as a change and recreation, will suffice to realize in literature a larger product of what is truly genial, than weeks of compulsion. Money and immediate reputation form only an arbitrary and accidental end of literary labor. The hope of increasing them by any given exertion will often prove a stimulant to industry, but the necessity of acquiring them will in all works of genius convert the stimulant into a narcotic. Motives by excess reverse their very nature and instead of exciting, stun and stupefy the mind. For it is one contradistinction of genius from talent, that its predominant end is always comprised in the means, and this is one of the many points, which establish an analogy between genius and virtue. Now though talents may exist without genius, yet as genius cannot exist, certainly not manifest itself, without talents, I would advise every scholar, who feels the genial power working within him, so far to make a division between the two, as that he should devote his talents to the acquirement of competence in some known trade or profession, and his genius to objects of his tranquil and unbiased choice while the consciousness of being actuated in both alike by the sincere desire to perform. His duty, will alike ennoble both. My dear young friend, I would say, suppose yourself established in any honorable occupation. From the manufactory or counting house, from the law court, or from having visited your last patient, you return at evening, dear tranquil time, when the sweet sense of home is sweetest, to your family, prepared for its social enjoyments, with the very countenances of your wife and children brightened, and their voice of welcome made doubly welcome, by the knowledge that, as far as they are concerned, you have satisfied the demands of the day by the labor of the day. Then, when you retire into your study, in the books on your shelves you revisit so many venerable friends with whom you can converse. Your own spirit scarcely less free from personal anxieties than the great minds, that in those books are still living for you. Even your writing desk with its blank paper and all its other implements will appear as a chain of flowers, capable of linking your feelings as well as thoughts to events and characters past or to come, not a chain of iron, which binds you down to think of the future and the remote by recalling the claims and feelings of the peremptory present. But why should I say retire? The habits of active life and daily intercourse with the stir of the world will tend to give you such self-command, that the presence of your family will be no interruption. Nay, the social silence, or undisturbing voices of a wife or sister will be like a restorative atmosphere, or soft music which moulds a dream without becoming its object. 
If facts are required to prove the possibility of combining weighty performances in literature with full and independent employment, the works of Cicero and Xenophon among the ancients, of Sir Thomas More, Bacon, Baxter, or to refer at once to later and contemporary instances, Darwin and Roscoe, are at once decisive of the question. But all men may not dare promise themselves a sufficiency of self-control for the imitation of those examples, though strict scrutiny should always be made, whether indolence, restlessness, or a vanity impatient for immediate gratification, have not tampered with the judgment and assumed the visit of humility for the purposes of self-delusion. Still the Church presents to every man of learning and genius a profession, in which he may cherish a rational hope of being able to unite the widest schemes of literary utility with the strictest performance of professional duties. Among the numerous blessings of Christianity, the introduction of an established church makes an especial claim on the gratitude of scholars and philosophers, in England, at least, where the principles of Protestantism have conspired with the freedom of the government to double all its salutary powers by the removal of its abuses. That not only the maxims, but the grounds of a pure morality, the mere fragments of which, the lofty grave tragedians taught in chorus or iambic, teachers best of moral prudence, with delight received in brief sententious precepts, 43, and that the sublime truths of the divine unity and attributes, which a Plato found most hard to learn and deemed it still more difficult to reveal that these should have become the almost hereditary property of childhood and poverty, of the hovel and the workshop, that even to the unlettered they sound as commonplace, is a phenomenon, which must withhold all but minds of the most vulgar cast from undervaluing the services even of the pulpit and the reading desk. Yet those who confine the efficiency of an established church to its public offices, can hardly be placed in a much higher rank of intellect. That to every parish throughout the kingdom there is transplanted a germ of civilization, that in the remotest villages there is a nucleus, round which the capabilities of the place may crystallize and brighten, a model sufficiently superior to excite, yet sufficiently near to encourage and facilitate, imitation, this, the unobtrusive, continuous agency of a Protestant church establishment, this it is, which the patriot, and the philanthropist, who would fain unite the love of peace with the Faith in the progressive melioration of mankind, cannot estimate at too high a price. It cannot be valued with the gold of offer, with the precious onyx, or the sapphire. No mention shall be made of coral, or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The clergyman is with his parishioners and among them. He is neither in the cloistered cell, nor in the wilderness, but a neighbor and a family man, whose education and rank admit him to the mansion of the rich landholder, while his duties make him the frequent visitor of the farmhouse and the cottage. He is, or he may become, connected, with the families of his parish or its vicinity by marriage and among the instances of the blindness, or at best of the short-sightedness, which it is the nature of cupidity to inflict, I know few more striking than the clamours of the farmers against church property. 
whatever was not paid to the clergyman would inevitably at the next lease be paid to the landholder, while, as the case at present stands, the revenues of the church are in some sort the reversionary property of every family that may have a member educated for the church, or a daughter that may marry a clergyman. Instead of being foreclosed and immovable, it is in fact the only species of landed property, that is essentially moving and circulative. That there exist no inconveniences, who will pretend to assert? But I have yet to expect the proof that the inconveniences are greater in this than in any other species, or that either the farmers or the clergy would be benefited by forcing the latter to become either trial ibers or salaried placemen. Nay, I do not hesitate to declare my firm persuasion, that whatever reason of discontent the farmers may assign, the true cause is this, that they may cheat the parson but cannot cheat the steward, and that they are disappointed, if they should have been able to withhold only two pounds less than the legal claim, having expected to withhold five. At all events, considered relatively to the encouragement of learning and genius, the establishment presents a patronage at once so effective and unburdensome, that it would be impossible to afford the like or equal in any but a Christian and Protestant country. There is scarce a department of human knowledge without some bearing on the various critical, historical, philosophical and moral truths, in which the scholar must be interested as a clergyman, no one pursuit worthy of a man of genius which may not be followed without incongruity. To give the history of the Bible as a book, would be little less than to relate the origin or first excitement of all the literature and science, that we now possess. The very decorum, which the profession imposes, is favorable to the best purposes of genius and tends to counteract its most frequent defects. Finally, that man must be deficient in sensibility, who would not find an incentive to emulation in the great and burning lights, which in a long series have illustrated the Church of England, who would not hear from within an echo to the voice from their sacred shrines. It pater in ease it avunculus excite at Hector. But, whatever be the profession or trade chosen, the advantages are many and important, compared with the state of a mere literary man, who in any degree depends on the sale of his works for the necessaries and comforts of life. In the former a man lives in sympathy with the world, in which he lives. At least he acquires a better and quicker tact for the knowledge of that, with which men in general can sympathize. He learns to manage his genius more prudently and efficaciously. His powers and acquirements gain him likewise more real admiration, for they surpass the legitimate expectations of others. He is something besides an author, and is not therefore considered merely as an author. The hearts of men are open to him, as to one of their own class, and whether he exerts himself or not in the conversational circles of his acquaintance, his silence is not attributed to pride, nor his communicativeness to vanity. To these advantages I will venture to add a superior chance of happiness in domestic life, were it only that it is as natural for the man to be out of the circle of his household during the day, as it is meritorious for the woman to remain for the most part within it. 
but this subject involves points of consideration so numerous and so delicate, and would not only permit, but require such ample documents from the biography of literary men, that I now merely allude to it in transitu. When the same circumstance has occurred at very different times to very different persons, all of whom have some one thing in common, there is reason to suppose that such circumstance is not merely attributable to the persons concerned, but is in some measure occasioned by the one point in common to them all. Instead of the vehement and almost slanderous dehortation from marriage, which the misogyn, Borchicchio, 44, addresses to literary men, I would substitute the simple advice, be not merely a man of letters. Let literature be an honourable augmentation to your arms, but not constitute the coat, or fill the escutcheon. To objections from conscience I can of course answer in no other way, than by requesting the youthful objector, as I have already done on a former occasion, to ascertain with strict self-examination, whether other influences may not be at work, whether spirits, not of health and with whispers not from heaven may not be walking in the twilight of his consciousness. Let him catalogue his scruples, and reduce them to a distinct intelligible form, let him be certain, that he has read with a docile mind and favourable dispositions the best and most fundamental works on the subject, that he has had both mind and heart opened to the great and illustrious qualities of the many renowned characters, who had doubted like himself and whose researches had ended in the clear conviction, that their doubts had been groundless, or at least in no proportion to the counterweight. Happy will it be for such a man, if among his contemporaries elder than himself he should meet with one, who, with similar powers and feelings as acute as his own, had entertained the same scruples had acted upon them, and who by after research, when the step was, alas, irretrievable, but for that very reason his research undeniably disinterested, had discovered himself to have quarrelled with received opinions only to embrace errors, to have left the direction tracked out for him on the high road of honourable exertion, only to deviate into a labyrinth, where when he had wandered till his head was giddy, his best good fortune was finally to have found his way out again, too late for prudence though not too late for conscience or for truth. Time spent in such delay is time won, for manhood in the meantime is advancing, and with it increase of knowledge, strength of judgment and above all, temperance of feelings. And even if these should effect no change, yet the delay will at least prevent the final approval of the decision from being alloyed by the inward censure of the rashness and vanity, by which it had been precipitated. It would be a sort of irreligion, and scarcely less than a libel on human nature to believe that there is any established and reputable profession or employment, in which a man may not continue to act with honesty and honour, and doubtless there is likewise none, which may not at times present temptations to the contrary. But woefully will that man find himself mistaken, who imagines that the profession of literature, or, to speak more plainly, the trade of authorship, besets its members with fewer or with less insidious temptations, than the church, the law, or the different branches of commerce. But I have treated sufficiently on this unpleasant subject in an early chapter of this volume. 
I will conclude the present therefore with a short extract from Herder, whose name I might have added to the illustrious list of those who have combined the successful pursuit of the muses, not only with the faithful discharge, but with the highest honours and honourable emoluments of an established profession. The translation the reader will find in a note below, 45. Am sorgfältigsten, made NC die Autoschaft. Zu früh oder unmäßig gebraut, marked sie den Kopf fused and das Herzlier, when sie auch sonst keen jubel folgen gabe. Ein Mensch, der nur liset um zu druecken, liset wurschen likjebel, und wer jeden jedanken, der im aufstest, Dirk Feder and Press verse endet, hat sie in Katze sieht el versant, und word bald ein blosser die en a der drucki, ein gusht a benset se wooden. Chapter 12 A chapter of requests and premonitions concerning the perusal or omission of the chapter that follows. In the perusal of philosophical works I have been greatly benefited by a resolve, which, in the antithetic form and with the allowed quaintness of an adage or maxim, I have been accustomed to word thus, until you understand a writer's ignorance. Presume yourself ignorant of his understanding. This golden rule of mine does, I own, resemble those of Pythagoras in its obscurity rather than in its depth. If however the reader will permit me to be my own hierocles, I trust, that he will find its meaning fully explained by the following instances. I have now before me a treatise of a religious fanatic, full of dreams and supernatural experiences. I see clearly the writer's grounds, and their hollowness. I have a complete insight into the causes, which through the medium of his body has acted on his mind and by application of received and ascertained laws I can satisfactorily explain to my own reason all the strange incidents, which the writer records of himself. And this I can do without suspecting him of any intentional falsehood. As when in broad daylight a man tracks the steps of a traveller, who had lost his way in a fog or by a treacherous moonshine, even so, and with the same tranquil sense of certainty, can I follow the traces of this bewildered visionary. I understand his ignorance. On the other hand, I have been reperusing with the best energies of my mind the Timaeus of Plato. Whatever I comprehend, impresses me with a reverential sense of the author's genius but there is a considerable portion of the work, to which I can attach no consistent meaning. In other treatises of the same philosopher, intended for the average comprehensions of men, I have been delighted with the masterly good sense, with the perspicuity of the language, and the aptness of the inductions. I recollect likewise, that numerous passages in this author, which I thoroughly comprehend, were formerly no less unintelligible to me, than the passages now in question. It would, I am aware, be quite fashionable to dismiss them at once as platonic jargon. But this I cannot do with satisfaction to my own mind because I have sought in vain for causes adequate to the solution of the assumed inconsistency. I have no insight into the possibility of a man so eminently wise, using words with such half-meanings to himself, as must perforce pass into no meaning to his readers. When in addition to the motives thus suggested by my own reason, I bring into distinct remembrance the number and the series of great men, 
who, after long and zealous study of these works had joined in honouring the name of Plato with epithets, that almost transcend humanity, I feel, that a contemptuous verdict on my part might argue want of modesty, but would hardly be received by the judicious, as evidence of superior penetration. Therefore, utterly baffled in all my attempts to understand the ignorance of Plato, I conclude myself ignorant of his understanding. In lieu of the various requests which the anxiety of authorship addresses to the unknown reader, I advance but this one, that he will either pass over the following chapter altogether, or read the whole connectedly. The fairest part of the most beautiful body will appear deformed and monstrous, if deceived from its place in the organic whole. Nay, on delicate subjects, where a seemingly trifling difference of more or less may constitute a difference in kind, even a faithful display of the main and supporting ideas if yet they are separated from the forms by which they are at once clothed and modified, may perchance present a skeleton indeed, but a skeleton to alarm and deter. Though I might find numerous precedents, I shall not desire the reader to strip his mind of all prejudices, nor to keep all prior systems out of view during his examination of the present. For in truth, such requests appear to me not much unlike the advice given to hypochondriacal patients in Dr. Buchan's domestic medicine, Vidlicet, to preserve themselves uniformly tranquil and in good spirits. Till I had discovered the art of destroying the memory a party post, without injury to its future operations and without detriment to the judgment, I should suppress the request as premature, and therefore, however much I may wish to be read with an unprejudiced mind, I do not presume to state it as a necessary condition. The extent of my daring is to suggest one criterion, by which it may be rationally conjectured beforehand whether or no a reader would lose his time, and perhaps his temper, in the perusal of this, or any other treatise constructed on similar principles. But it would be cruelly misinterpreted, as implying the least disrespect either for the moral or intellectual qualities of the individuals thereby precluded. The criterion is this. If a man receives as fundamental facts, and therefore of course indemonstrable and incapable of further analysis, the general notions of matter, spirit, soul, body, action, passiveness, time, space, cause and effect, consciousness, perception, memory and habit, if he feels his mind completely at rest concerning all these, and is satisfied, if only he can analyze all other notions into some one or more of these supposed elements with plausible subordination and apt arrangement, to such a mind I would as courteously as possible convey the hint, that for him the chapter was not written. Verbonuses Doctus, prudens, ast hord tibi spiro. For these terms do in truth include all the difficulties, which the human mind can propose for solution. Taking them therefore in mass, and unexamined, it required only a decent apprenticeship in logic, to draw forth their contents in all forms and colours as the professors of ledger domain at our village fairs pull out ribbon after ribbon from their mouths. And not more difficult is it to reduce them back again to their different genera. But though this analysis is highly useful in rendering our knowledge more distinct, 
It does not really add to it. It does not increase, though it gives us a greater mastery over the wealth which we before possessed. For forensic purposes, for all the established professions of society, this is sufficient. But for philosophy in its highest sense as the science of ultimate truths, and therefore sciencia scientiarum, this mere analysis of terms is preparative only, though as a preparative discipline indispensable. Still less dare a favorable perusal be anticipated from the proselytes of that compendious philosophy, which talking of mind but thinking of brick and mortar, or other images equally abstracted from body, contrives a theory of spirit by nicknaming matter, and in a few hours can qualify its dullest disciples to explain the omnsubiel by reducing all things to impressions, ideas, and sensations. But it is time to tell the truth though it requires some courage to avow it in an age and country, in which disquisitions on all subjects, not privileged to adopt technical terms or scientific symbols, must be addressed to the public. I say then, that it is neither possible nor necessary for all men, nor for many, to be philosophers. There is a philosophic and inasmuch as it is actualized by an effort of freedom, an artificial, consciousness, which lies beneath or, as it were, behind the spontaneous consciousness natural to all reflecting beings. As the elder Romans distinguished their northern provinces into C.I.S. Alpine and Transalpine, so may we divide all the objects of human knowledge into those on this side, and those on the other side of the spontaneous consciousness, citra et trans conscientium communem. The latter is exclusively the domain of pure philosophy, which is therefore properly entitled transcendental, in order to discriminate it at once both from mere reflection and representation on the one hand, and on the other from those flights of lawless speculation which, abandoned by all distinct consciousness, because transgressing the bounds and purposes of our intellectual faculties, are justly condemned, as transcendent. 46. The first range of hills that encircles the scanty veil of human life, is the horizon for the majority of its inhabitants. On its ridges the common sun is born and departs. From them the stars rise, and touching them they vanish. By the many, even this range, the natural limit and bulwark of the veil, is but imperfectly known. Its higher ascents are too often hidden by mists and clouds from uncultivated swamps, which few have courage or curiosity to penetrate. To the multitude below these vapors appear, now as the dark haunts of terrific agents, on which none may intrude with impunity, and now all aglow, with colors not their own they are gazed at as the splendid palaces of happiness and power. But in all ages there have been a few, who measuring and sounding the rivers of the vale at the feet of their furthest inaccessible falls have learned, that the sources must be far higher and far inward, a few, who even in the level streams have detected elements which neither the veil itself nor the surrounding mountains contained or could supply. 47. How and whence to these thoughts, these strong probabilities, the ascertaining vision, the intuitive knowledge may finally supervene, can be learnt only by the fact. I might oppose to the question the words with which, 48. 
Plotinus supposes nature to answer a similar difficulty. Should anyone interrogate her, how she works, if graciously she vouchsafe to listen and speak, she will reply, It behoves thee not to disquiet me with interrogatories, but to understand in silence, even as I am silent, and work without words. Likewise in the fifth book of the fifth Aeneid, speaking of the highest and intuitive knowledge as distinguished from the discursive, or in the language of Wordsworth, the vision and the faculty divine, he says, it is not lawful to inquire from whence it sprang, as if it were a thing subject to place and motion, for it neither approached hither nor again departs from hence to some other place, but it either appears to us or it does not appear. So that we ought not to pursue it with a view of detecting its secret source, but to watch in quiet till it suddenly shines upon us, preparing ourselves for the blessed spectacle as the eye waits patiently for the rising sun. They and they only can acquire the philosophic imagination, the sacred power of self-intuition, who within themselves can interpret and understand the symbol, that the wings of the air SYLPH are forming within the skin of the caterpillar, those only, who feel in their own spirits the same instinct which impels the chrysalis of the horned fly to leave room in its involucrum for antenna, yet to come. They know and feel, that the potential works in them, even as the actual works on them. In short, all the organs of sense are framed for a corresponding world of sense, and we have it. All the organs of spirit are framed for a correspondent world of spirit, though the latter organs are not developed in all alike. But they exist in all, and their first appearance discloses itself in the moral being. How else could it be, that even worldlings, not wholly debased, will contemplate the man of simple and disinterested goodness with contradictory feelings of pity and respect. Poor man, he is not made for this world. Oh! Herein they utter a prophecy of universal fulfillment, for man must either rise or sink. It is the essential mark of the true philosopher to rest satisfied with no imperfect light, as long as the impossibility of attaining a fuller knowledge has not been demonstrated. That the common consciousness itself will furnish proofs by its own direction, that it is connected with master currents below the surface, I shall merely assume as a postulate pro tempore. This having been granted, though but in expectation of the argument, I can safely deduce from it the equal truth of my former assertion, that philosophy cannot be intelligible to all, even of the most learned and cultivated classes. A system, the first principle of which it is to render the mind intuitive of the spiritual in man i.e. of that which lies on the other side of our natural consciousness, must needs have a great obscurity for those, who have never disciplined and strengthened this ulterior consciousness. It must in truth be a land of darkness, a perfect antigotion, for men to whom the noblest treasures of their own being are reported only through the imperfect translation of lifeless and sightless motions. Perhaps, in great part, through words which are but the shadows of notions, even as the notional understanding itself is but the shadowy abstraction of living and actual truth. On the immediate, which dwells in every man, and on the original intuition, or absolute affirmation of it, which is likewise in every man, 
but does not in every man rise into consciousness, all the certainty of our knowledge depends, and this becomes intelligible to no man by the ministry of mere words from without. The medium, by which spirits understand each other, is not the surrounding air, but the freedom which they possess in common, as the common ethereal element of their being, the tremulous reciprocations of which propagate themselves even to the inmost of the soul. Where the spirit of a man is not filled with the consciousness of freedom, were it only from its restlessness, as of one still struggling in bondage, all spiritual intercourse is interrupted, not only with others, but even with himself. No wonder then, that he remains incomprehensible to himself as well as to others. No wonder, that, in the fearful desert of his consciousness, he wearies himself out with empty words to which no friendly echo answers, either from his own heart, or the heart of a fellow being, or bewilders himself in the pursuit of notional phantoms, the mere refractions from unseen and distant truths through the distorting medium of his own unenlivened and stagnant understanding. To remain unintelligible to such a mind, exclaims Schelling on a like occasion, is honor and a good name before God and man. The history of philosophy, the same writer observes, contains instances of systems, which for successive generations have remained enigmatic. Such he deems the system of Leibniz, whom another writer, rashly I think, and invidiously, extols as the only philosopher who was himself deeply convinced of his own doctrines. As hitherto interpreted, however, they have not produced the effect, which Leibniz himself, in a most instructive passage, describes as the criterion of a true philosophy, namely, that it would at once explain and collect the fragments of truth scattered through systems apparently the most incongruous. The truth, says he, is diffused more widely than is commonly believed, but it is often painted, yet often masked, and is sometimes mutilated and sometimes, alas, in close alliance with mischievous errors. The deeper, however, we penetrate into the ground of things, the more truth we discover in the doctrines of the greater number of the philosophical sects. The want of substantial reality in the objects of the senses, according to the skeptics, the harmonies or numbers, the prototypes and ideas to which the Pythagoreans and Platonists reduced all things, the one and all of Parmenides and Plotinus, without, 49, Spinozism, the necessary connection of things according to the Stoics, reconcilable with the spontaneity of the other schools, the vital philosophy of the Kabbalists and Hermetists, who assumed the universality of sensation, the substantial forms and entelechies of Aristotle and the schoolmen, together with the mechanical solution of all particular phenomena according to Democritus and the recent philosophers, all these we shall find united in one perspective central point, which shows regularity and a coincidence of all the parts in the very object which from every other point of view must appear confused and distorted. The spirit of sectarianism has been hitherto our fault, and the cause of our failures. We have imprisoned our own conceptions by the lines, which we have drawn, in order to exclude the conceptions of others. 
Jari truve Q la plu part des sectes ont raison dans un bon parti de ce question els avancent, mais non pas tant en ce question els neant. A system, which aims to deduce the memory with all the other functions of intelligence, must of course place its first position from beyond the memory, and anterior to it. Otherwise the principle of solution would be itself a part of the problem to be solved. Such a position therefore must, in the first instance be demanded, and the first question will be, by what right is it demanded? On this account I think it expedient to make some preliminary remarks on the introduction of postulates in philosophy. The word postulate is borrowed from the science of mathematics, 50. In geometry the primary construction is not demonstrated, but postulated. This first and most simple construction in space is the point in motion, or the line. Whether the point is moved in one and the same direction, or whether its direction is continually changed, remains as yet undetermined. But if the direction of the point have been determined, it is either by a point without it, and then there arises the straight line which encloses no space, or the direction of the point is not determined by a point without it, and then it must flow back again on itself, that is, there arises a cyclical line, which does enclose a space. If the straight line be assumed as the positive, the cyclical is then the negation of the straight. It is a line, which at no point strikes out into the straight, but changes its direction continuously. But if the primary line be conceived as undetermined, and the straight line is determined throughout, then the cyclical is the third compounded of both. It is at once undetermined and determined, undetermined through any point without, and determined through itself. Geometry therefore supplies philosophy with the example of a primary intuition from which every science that lays claim to evidence must take its commencement. The mathematician does not begin with a demonstrable proposition, but with an intuition, a practical idea. But here an important distinction presents itself. Philosophy is employed on objects of the inner sense, and cannot, like geometry, appropriate to every construction a correspondent outward intuition. Nevertheless, philosophy, if it is to arrive at evidence, must proceed from the most original construction, and the question then is, what is the most original construction or first productive act for the inner sense? The answer to this question depends on the direction which is given to the inner sense. But in philosophy the inner sense cannot have its direction determined by an outward object. To the original construction of the line I can be compelled by a line drawn before me on the slate or on sand. The stroke thus drawn is indeed not the line itself but only the image or picture of the line. It is not from it, that we first learn to know the line, but, on the contrary, we bring this stroke to the original line generated by the act of the imagination, otherwise we could not define it as without breadth or thickness. Still however this stroke is the sensuous image of the original or ideal line and an efficient mean to excite every imagination to the intuition of it. It is demanded then, whether there be found any means in philosophy to determine the direction of the inner sense, as in mathematics it is determinable by its specific image or outward picture. 
Now the inner sense has its direction determined for the greater part only by an act of freedom. One man's consciousness extends only to the pleasant or unpleasant sensations caused in him by external impressions, another enlarges his inner sense to a consciousness of forms and quantity, a third in addition to the image is conscious of the conception or notion of the thing, a fourth attains to a notion of his notions, he reflects on his own reflections and thus we may say without impropriety, that the one possesses more or less inner sense, than the other. This more or less betrays already, that philosophy in its first principles must have a practical or moral, as well as a theoretical or speculative side. This difference in degree does not exist in the mathematics. Socrates in Plato shows, that an ignorant slave may be brought to understand and of himself to solve the most difficult geometrical problem. Socrates drew the figures for the slave in the sand. The disciples of the critical philosophy could likewise, as was indeed actually done by La Forge and some other followers of Descartes represent the origin of our representations in copper plates, but no one has yet attempted it, and it would be utterly useless. To an Esquimaux or New Zealander our most popular philosophy would be wholly unintelligible. The sense, the inward organ, for it is not yet born in him. So is there many a one among us, yes and some who think themselves philosophers too, to whom the philosophic organ is entirely wanting. To such a man philosophy is a mere play of words and notions, like a theory of music to the deaf, or like the geometry of light to the blind. The connection of the parts and their logical dependencies may be seen and remembered but the whole is groundless and hollow, unsustained by living contact, unaccompanied with any realizing intuition which exists by and in the act that affirms its existence, which is known, because it is, and is, because it is known. The words of Plotinus, in the assumed person of nature, hold true of the philosophic energy. To theraunmu, theorema poia, osper oi geometri i theraunts grafausen, all emen me grafauses, theorases de, up histen tiari tun samartan grammi. With me the act of contemplation makes the thing contemplated, as the geometricians contemplating describe lines correspondent, but I not describing lines but simply contemplating, the representative forms of things rise up into existence. The postulate of philosophy and at the same time the test of philosophic capacity, is no other than the heaven descended know thyself. E silo descendit, not thy see alton. And this at once practically and speculatively. For as philosophy is neither a science of the reason or understanding only, nor merely a science of morals, but the science of being altogether, its primary ground can be neither merely speculative nor merely practical, but both in one. All knowledge rests on the coincidence of an object with a subject. My readers have been warned in a former chapter that, for their convenience as well as the writers, the term, subject, is used by me in its scholastic sense as equivalent to mind or sentient being, and as the necessary correlative of object or quiquid objicita menti. For we can know that only which is true, and the truth is universally placed in the coincidence of the thought with the thing of the representation with the object represented.
Now the sum of all that is merely objective, we will henceforth call nature, confining the term to its passive and material sense, as comprising all the phenomena by which its existence is made known to us. On the other hand the sum of all that is subjective, we may comprehend in the name of the self or intelligence. Both conceptions are in necessary antithesis. Intelligence is conceived of as exclusively representative, nature as exclusively represented, the one as conscious, the other as without consciousness. Now in all acts of positive knowledge there is required a reciprocal concurrence of both, namely of the conscious being, and of that which is in itself unconscious. Our problem is to explain this concurrence, its possibility and its necessity. During the act of knowledge itself, the objective and subjective are so instantly united that we cannot determine to which of the two the priority belongs. There is here no first, and no second, both are co-instantaneous and one. While I am attempting to explain this intimate coalition, I must suppose it dissolved. I must necessarily set out from the one, to which therefore I give hypothetical antecedents, in order to arrive at the other. But as there are but two factors or elements in the problem, subject and object, and as it is left indeterminate from which of them I should commence, there are two cases equally possible. One either the objective is taken as the first, and then we have to account for the supervention of the subjective, which coalesces with IT. The notion of the subjective is not contained in the notion of the objective. On the contrary they mutually exclude each other. The subjective therefore must supervene to the objective. The conception of nature does not apparently involve the co-presence of an intelligence making an ideal duplicate of it, that is, representing it. This desk for instance would, according to our natural notions, be, though there should exist no sentient being to look at it. This then is the problem of natural philosophy. It assumes the objective or unconscious nature as the first, and as therefore to explain how intelligence can supervene to it, or how itself can grow into intelligence. If it should appear, that all enlightened naturalists, without having distinctly proposed the problem to themselves, have yet constantly moved in the line of its solution, it must afford a strong presumption that the problem itself is founded in nature. For if all knowledge has, as it were, two poles reciprocally required and presupposed, all sciences must proceed from the one or the other, and must tend toward the opposite as far as the equatorial point in which both are reconciled and become identical. The necessary tendency therefore of all natural philosophy is from nature to intelligence, and this, and no other is the true ground and occasion of the instinctive striving to introduce theory into our views of natural phenomena. The highest perfection of natural philosophy would consist in the perfect spiritualization of all the laws of nature into laws of intuition and intellect. The phenomena, the material, most wholly disappear and the laws alone, the formal, must remain. Thence it comes, that in nature itself the more the principle of law breaks forth, the more does the husk drop off, the phenomena themselves become more spiritual and at length cease altogether in our consciousness. 
The optical phenomena are but a geometry, the lines of which are drawn by light, and the materiality of this light itself has already become matter of doubt. In the appearances of magnetism all trace of matter is lost, and of the phenomena of gravitation, which not a few among the most illustrious Newtonians have declared no otherwise comprehensible than as an immediate spiritual influence, there remains nothing but its law, the execution of which on a vast scale is the mechanism of the heavenly motions. The theory of natural philosophy would then be completed, when all nature was demonstrated to be identical in essence with that, which in its highest known power exists in man as intelligence and self-consciousness, when the heavens and the earth shall declare not only the power of their maker, but the glory and the presence of their God even as he appeared to the great prophet during the vision of the mount in the skirts of his divinity. This may suffice to show, that even natural science, which commences with the material phenomenon as the reality and substance of things existing, does yet by the necessity of the rising unconsciously, and as it were instinctively, end in nature as an intelligence and by this tendency the science of nature becomes finally natural philosophy, the one of the two poles of fundamental science. Two or the subjective is taken as the first, and the problem then is, how there supervenes to it a coincident objective. In the pursuit of these sciences, our success in each, depends on an austere and faithful adherence to its own principles, with a careful separation and exclusion of those, which appertain to the opposite science. As the natural philosopher, who directs his views to the objective, avoids above all things the intermixture of the subjective in his knowledge, as for instance, arbitrary supposititions or rather afflictions, occult qualities, spiritual agents, and the substitution of final for efficient causes, so on the other hand, the transcendental or intelligential philosopher is equally anxious to preclude all interpellation of the objective into the subjective principles of his science, as for instance, the assumption of impresses or configurations in the brain, correspondent to miniature pictures on the retina painted by rays of light from supposed originals, which are not the immediate and real objects of vision, but deductions from it for the purposes of explanation. This purification of the mind is effected by an absolute and scientific skepticism to which the mind voluntarily determines itself for the specific purpose of future certainty. Descartes who, in his meditations, himself first, at least of the moderns, gave a beautiful example of this voluntary doubt, this self-determined indetermination, happily expresses its utter difference from the skepticism of vanity or irreligion. NEC tamen in skepticos imitaba, qui dubitant tantum ut dubitant, it preta in certitudinem ipsum nile quarant. Nam contra totus in eo irum ut a liquid certi reparium, 51. Nor is it less distinct in its motives and final aim, than in its proper objects which are not as in ordinary skepticism the prejudices of education and circumstance, but those original and innate prejudices which nature herself has planted in all men, and which to all but the philosopher are the first principles of knowledge, and the final test of truth. Now these essential prejudices are all reducible to the one fundamental presumption, 
that there exist things without us. As this on the one hand originates, neither in grounds nor arguments, and yet on the other hand remains proof against all attempts to remove it by grounds or arguments, Naturum furca expellus tamen us creed a bit winking smiley on the one hand lays claim to immediate certainty as a position at once indemonstrable and irresistible, and yet on the other hand, inasmuch as it refers to something essentially different from ourselves, nay even in opposition to ourselves, leaves it inconceivable how it could possibly become a part of our immediate consciousness, in other words how that, which ex hypothesis is and continues to be extrinsic and alien to our being, should become a modification of our being. The philosopher therefore compels himself to treat this faith as nothing more than a prejudice, innate indeed and connatural, but still a prejudice. The other position, which not only claims but necessitates the admission of its immediate certainty, equally for the scientific reason of the philosopher as for the common sense of mankind at large, namely, I am, cannot so properly be entitled a prejudice. It is groundless indeed, but then in the very idea it precludes all ground and separated from the immediate consciousness loses its whole sense and import. It is groundless, but only because it is itself the ground of all other certainty. Now the apparent contradiction, that the former position, namely, the existence of things without us, which from its nature cannot be immediately certain, should be received as blindly and as independently of all grounds as the existence of our own being. The transcendental philosopher can solve only by the supposition that the former is unconsciously involved in the latter, that it is not only coherent but identical, and one and the same thing with our own immediate self-consciousness. To demonstrate this identity is the office and object of his philosophy. If it be said, that this is idealism, let it be remembered that it is only so far idealism, as it is at the same time, and on that very account, the truest and most binding realism. For wherein does the realism of mankind properly consist? In the assertion that there exists a something without them, what, or how, or where they know not, which occasions the objects of their perception. Oh no! This is neither connatural nor universal. It is what a few have taught and learned in the schools, and which the many repeat without asking themselves concerning their own meaning. The realism common to all mankind is far elder and lies infinitely deeper than this hypothetical explanation of the origin of our perceptions, an explanation skimmed from the mere surface of mechanical philosophy. It is the table itself, which the man of common sense believes himself to see, not the phantom of a table from which he may argumentatively deduce the reality of a table, which he does not see. If to destroy the reality of all, that we actually behold, be idealism, what can be more egregiously so, than the system of modern metaphysics, which banishes us to a land of shadows, surrounds us with apparitions, and distinguishes truth from illusion only by the majority of those who dream the same dream. I asserted that the world was mad exclaimed poorly, and the world said, that I was mad, and confound them, they outvoted me. It is to the true and original realism, that I would direct the attention. 
This believes and requires neither more nor less, than the object which it beholds or presents to itself, is the real and very object. In this sense, however much we may strive against it, we are all collectively born idealists, and therefore and only therefore are we at the same time realists. But of this the philosophers of the schools know nothing, or despise the faith as the prejudice of the ignorant vulgar, because they live and move in a crowd of phrases and notions from which human nature has long ago vanished. O, oh, ye that reverence yourselves, and walk humbly with the divinity in your own hearts, ye are worthy of a better philosophy. Let the dead bury the dead, but do you preserve your human nature, the depth of which was never yet fathomed by a philosophy made up of notions and mere logical entities. In the third treatise of my Logosophia, announced at the end of this volume, I shall give, Deo Volant, the demonstrations and constructions of the dynamic philosophy scientifically arranged. It is, according to my conviction, no other than the system of Pythagoras and of Plato revived and purified from impure mixtures. Doctrina patot manus tradita tandem in vapum dissit. The science of arithmetic furnishes instances, that a rule may be useful in practical application, and for the particular purpose may be sufficiently authenticated by the result, before it has itself been fully demonstrated. It is enough, if only it be rendered intelligible. This will, I trust, have been effected in the following theses for those of my readers, who are willing to accompany me through the following chapter, in which the results will be applied to the deduction of the imagination, and with it the principles of production and of genial criticism in the fine arts. Thesis I Truth is correlative to being. Knowledge without a correspondent reality is no knowledge, if we know, there must be somewhat known by us. To know is in its very essence a verb active. Thesis to all truth is either mediate, that is, derived from some other truth or truths, or immediate and original. The latter is absolute, and its formula a dot. The former is of dependent or conditional certainty, and represented in the formula B. A. The certainty, which adheres in A, is attributable to B. Scolium. A chain without a staple, from which all the links derived their stability, or a series without a first, has been not inaptly allegorized, as a string of blind men each holding the skirt of the man before him, reaching far out of sight, but all moving without the least deviation in one straight line. It would be naturally taken for granted, that there was a guide at the head of the file, what if it were answered, no. Sir, the men are without number, and infinite blindness supplies the place of sight. Equally inconceivable is a cycle of equal truths without a common and central principle, which prescribes to each its proper sphere in the system of science. That the absurdity does not so immediately strike us, that it does not seem equally unimaginable, is owing to a surreptitious act of the imagination, which instinctively and without our noticing the same, not only fills up the intervening spaces, and contemplates the cycle, of B, C, D, E, F, etc., as a continuous circle, a, uh, giving to all collectively the unity of their common orbit, but likewise supplies, by a sort of subintelligiter, the one central power, 
which renders the movement harmonious and cyclical. Thesis 3 We are to seek therefore for some absolute truth capable of communicating to other positions a certainty, which it has not itself borrowed, a truth self-grounded, unconditional and known by its own light. In short, we have to find a somewhat which is, simply because it is. In order to be such, it must be one which is its own predicate, so far at least that all other nominal predicates must be modes and repetitions of itself. Its existence too must be such, as to preclude the possibility of requiring a cause or antecedent without an absurdity. Thesis for that there can be but one such principle, may be proved a priori. For were there two or more, each must refer to some other, by which its equality is affirmed, consequently neither would be self-established, as the hypothesis demands. And a posteriori, it will be proved by the principle itself when it is discovered, as involving universal antecedents in its very conception. Scolium if we affirm of a board that it is blue, the predicate, blue, is accidental, and not implied in the subject, board. If we affirm of a circle that it is a key radial, the predicate indeed is implied in the definition of the subject, but the existence of the subject itself is contingent, and supposes both a cause and a percipient. The same reasoning will apply to the indefinite number of supposed indemonstrable truths exempted from the profane approach of philosophic investigation by the amiable Beatty, and other less eloquent and not more profound inaugurators of common sense on the throne of philosophy, a fruitless attempt were it only that it is the twofold function of philosophy to reconcile reason with common sense, and to elevate common sense into reason. Thesis v. Such a principle cannot be anything or object. Each thing is what it is in consequence of some other thing. An infinite, independent, 52, thing, is no less a contradiction than an infinite circle or a sideless triangle. Besides a thing is that, which is capable of being an object which itself is not the sole percipient. But an object is inconceivable without a subject as its antithesis. On perceptum percipientum supinit. But neither can the principle be found in a subject as a subject contradistinguished from an object, for uniquic percipient a liquid objicita perceptum. It is to be found therefore neither in object nor subject taken separately, and consequently, as no other third is conceivable, it must be found in that which is neither subject nor object exclusively, but which is the identity of both. Thesis 6 This principle, and so characterized manifests itself in the sum or I am, which I shall hereafter indiscriminately express by the words spirit, self, and self-consciousness. In this, and in this alone, object and subject, being and knowing, are identical, each involving and supposing the other. In other words, it is a subject which becomes a subject by the act of constructing itself objectively to itself, but which never is an object except for itself, and only so far as by the very same act it becomes a subject. It may be described therefore as a perpetual self-duplication of one and the same power into object and subject which presuppose each other, and can exist only as antitheses. Scolium 
If a man be asked how he knows that he is, he can only answer, some queer sum. But if, the absoluteness of this certainty having been admitted, he be again asked, how he, the individual person, came to be, then in relation to the ground of his existence, not to the ground of his knowledge of that existence, he might reply, some queer deicist, or still more philosophically, some queer in deo sum. But if we elevate our conception to the absolute self, the great eternal I am, then the principle of being, and of knowledge, of idea, and of reality, the ground of existence, and the ground of the knowledge of existence, are absolutely identical, some queer sum, 53, I am, because I affirm myself to be, I affirm myself to be, because I am. Thesis 7 If then I know myself only through myself, it is contradictory to require any other predicate of self, but that of self-consciousness. Only in the self-consciousness of a spirit is there the required identity of object and of representation, for herein consists the essence of a spirit, that it is self-representative. If therefore this be the one only immediate truth, in the certainty of which the reality of our collective knowledge is grounded, it must follow that the spirit in all the objects which it views, views only itself. If this could be proved, the immediate reality of all intuitive knowledge would be assured. It has been shown, that a spirit is that, which is its own object, yet not originally an object, but an absolute subject for which all, itself included, may become an object. It must therefore be an act, for every object is, as an object, dead, fixed, incapable in itself of any action, and necessarily finite. Again the spirit, originally the identity of object and subject, must in some sense dissolve this identity, in order to be conscious of it, fit alter it idem. But this implies an act, and it follows therefore that intelligence or self-consciousness is impossible, except by and in a will. The self-conscious spirit therefore is a will, and freedom must be assumed as a ground of philosophy and can never be deduced from it. Thesis 8 Whatever in its origin is objective, is likewise as such necessarily finite. Therefore, since the spirit is not originally an object, and as the subject exists in antithesis to an object, the spirit cannot originally be finite but neither can it be a subject without becoming an object, and, as it is originally the identity of both, it can be conceived neither as infinite nor finite exclusively, but as the most original union of both. In the existence, in the reconciling, and the recurrence of this contradiction consists the process and mystery of production and life. Thesis 9 This principium communescendi et conoscendi, as subsisting in a will, or primary act of self-duplication, is the mediate or indirect principle of every science, but it is the immediate and direct principle of the ultimate science alone, i.e. of transcendental philosophy alone. For it must be remembered that all these theses refer solely to one of the two polar sciences, namely, to that which commences with, and rigidly confines itself within, the subjective, leaving the objective, as far as it is exclusively objective, to natural philosophy, which is its opposite pole. 
in its very idea therefore as a systematic knowledge of our collective knowing, science or science it involves the necessity of some one highest principle of knowing, as at once the source and accompanying form in all particular acts of intellect and perception. This, it has been shown, can be found only in the act and evolution of self-consciousness. We are not investigating an absolute principium essendi, for then, I admit, many valid objections might be started against our theory, but an absolute principium conoscendi. The result of both the sciences, or their equatorial point, would be the principle of a total and undivided philosophy, as, for prudential reasons, I have chosen to anticipate in the scolium to thesis 6 and the note subjoined. In other words, philosophy would pass into religion, and religion become inclusive of philosophy. We begin with the I know myself, in order to end with the absolute I am. We proceed from the self, in order to lose and find all self in God. Thesis X The transcendental philosopher does not inquire, what ultimate ground of our knowledge there may lie out of our knowing, but what is the last in our knowing itself, beyond which we cannot pass. The principle of our knowing is sought within the sphere of our knowing. It must be something therefore, which can itself be known. It is asserted only, that the act of self-consciousness is for us the source and principle of all our possible knowledge. Whether abstracted from us there exists anything higher and beyond this primary self-knowing, which is for us the form of all our knowing must be decided by the result. That the self-consciousness is the fixed point, to which for us all is mortised and annexed, needs no further proof. But that the self-consciousness may be the modification of a higher form of being, perhaps of a higher consciousness, and this again of a yet higher, and so on in an infinite regressus, in short that self-consciousness may be itself something explicable into something, which must lie beyond the possibility of our knowledge, because the whole synthesis of our intelligence is first formed in and through the self-consciousness, does not at all concern us as transcendental philosophers. For to us, self-consciousness is not a kind of being, but a kind of knowing, and that to the highest and farthest that exists for us. It may however be shown, and has in part already been shown earlier, that even when the objective is assumed as the first, we yet can never pass beyond the principle of self-consciousness. Should we attempt it, we must be driven back from ground to ground each of which would cease to be a ground the moment we pressed on it. We must be whirled down the gulf of an infinite series. But this would make our reason baffle the end and purpose of all reason, namely, unity and system. Or we must break off the series arbitrarily and affirm an absolute something that is in and of itself at once cause and effect, cause a sway, subject and object, or rather the absolute identity of both. But as this is inconceivable, except in a self-consciousness, it follows, that even as natural philosophers we must arrive at the same principle from which as transcendental philosophers we set out, that is, in a self-consciousness in which the principium essendi does not stand to the principlum conoscendi in the relation of cause to effect, but both the one and the other are co-inherent and identical. 
Thus the true system of natural philosophy places the sole reality of things in an absolute, which is at once causa sui it effectus, pater autopata, ucius hell alta, in the absolute identity of subject and object, which it calls nature, and which in its highest power is nothing else than self-conscious will or intelligence. In this sense the position of Malebranche, that we see all things in God, is a strict philosophical truth, and equally true is the assertion of Hobbes, of Hartley, and of their masters in ancient Greece, that all real knowledge supposes a prior sensation. For sensation itself is but vision nascent, not the cause of intelligence but intelligence itself revealed as an earlier power in the process of self-construction. Marker, Alathi Moi, Pater, Alathi Moi Ei Paracosmon, Ei Paramoiran Tun Sun Ethigon. Bearing then this in mind, that intelligence is a self-development, not a quality supervening to a substance, we may abstract from all degree, and for the purpose of philosophic construction reduce it to kind, under the idea of an indestructible power with two opposite and counteracting forces, which by a metaphor borrowed from astronomy, we may call the centrifugal and centripetal forces. The intelligence in the one tends to objectize itself and in the other to know itself in the object. It will be hereafter my business to construct by a series of intuitions the progressive schemes, that must follow from such a power with such forces, till I arrive at the fullness of the human intelligence. For my present purpose, I assume such a power as my principle in order to deduce from it a faculty, the generation, agency, and application of which form the contents of the ensuing chapter. In a preceding page I have justified the use of technical terms in philosophy, whenever they tend to preclude confusion of thought, and when they assist the memory by the exclusive singleness of their meaning more than they may for a short time, bewilder the attention by their strangeness. I trust, that I have not extended this privilege beyond the grounds on which I have claimed it, namely, the conveniency of the scholastic phrase to distinguish the kind from all degrees, or rather to express the kind with the abstraction of degree as for instance multity instead of multitude, or secondly, for the sake of correspondence in sound in interdependent or antithetical terms, as subject and object, or lastly, to avoid the wearying recurrence of circumlocutions and definitions. Thus I shall venture to use potence, in order to express a specific degree of a power in imitation of the algebraists. I have even hazarded the new verb potentiate, with its derivatives, in order to express the combination or transfer of powers. It is with new or unusual terms, as with privileges in courts of justice or legislature, there can be no legitimate privilege where there already exists a positive law adequate to the purpose, and when there is no law in existence, the privilege is to be justified by its accordance with the end, or final cause, of all law. Unusual and new coined words are doubtless an evil, but vagueness, confusion, and imperfect conveyance of our thoughts, are a far greater Every system, which is under the necessity of using terms not familiarized by the metaphysics in fashion, will be described as written in an unintelligible style, 
and the author must expect the charge of having substituted learned jargon for clear conception, while, according to the creed of our modern philosophers, nothing is deemed a clear conception, but what is representable by a distinct image. Thus the conceivable is reduced within the bounds of the picturable. Hink patet, qui fiat, ut cum irreprisentabilit impossibile vulgo adjustum significatus habianta, conceptus tam continue, quam infinity, applorimis regitionta, quip quorum, secundum leges cognitionis intuitivi, Representatio ist impossibilis. Quon quam mortim harum me non porces scolis explosarum notionum, presa time priories, causum hic non dro, maximi tamen momendi erit manus. Gravissimo illos error or labi, qui tam perverse argumentandi ration uchunta. Quiquidinim repugnat legibus intellectus it rationis, uticist impossibile, quod autim, cum rationis parisit objectum, legibus cognitionis intuitivi tantumodo non subist, non item. Nam hic dissensus inter facultatim sensitivam it intellectualum, quarum indulum mox exponam. Nile indigitat, nisi, quas mens ab intellectu accept as fert ideas abstract as, alas in concreto execi it in intuitus commutus ep numero non posse. He caught him reluctancy our subjectiva mentiture, ut plorimum, repugnantium aliquam objectivam, it in cortos facile fallit, limitibus. Quibus mens humana circumscribiture, pro iis habitis, quibus ipsa rerum essentia continetia. 54. Critics, who are most ready to bring this charge of pedantry and unintelligibility, are the most apt to overlook the important fact, that, besides the language of words, there is a language of spirits. Sermo interior, and that the former is only the vehicle of the latter. Consequently their assurance, that they do not understand the philosophic writer, instead of proving anything against the philosophy, may furnish an equal, and, ceteris paribus, even a stronger presumption against their own philosophic talent. Great indeed are the obstacles which an English metaphysician has to encounter. Amongst his most respectable and intelligent judges, there will be many who have devoted their attention exclusively to the concerns and interests of human life, and who bring with them to the perusal of a philosophic system an habitual aversion to all speculations the utility and application of which are not evident and immediate. To these I would in the first instance merely oppose an authority, which they themselves hold venerable, that of Lord Bacon, non in utile science e existim unde sunt, quorum in esse nullus ist usus, si ingenia acuant it ordinant. There are others whose prejudices are still more formidable, inasmuch as they are grounded in their moral feelings and religious principles, which had been alarmed and shocked by the impious and pernicious tenets defended by Hume, Priestley, and the French fatalists or necessitarians, some of whom had perverted metaphysical reasonings to the denial of the mysteries and indeed of all the peculiar doctrines of Christianity, and others even to the subversion of all distinction between right and wrong. I would request such men to consider what an eminent and successful defender of the Christian faith has observed 
that true metaphysics are nothing else but true divinity, and that in fact the writers, who have given them such just offense, were sophists, who had taken advantage of the general neglect into which the science of logic has unhappily fallen, rather than metaphysicians a name indeed which those writers were the first to explode as unmeaning. Secondly, I would remind them, that as long as there are men in the world to whom the Nothaisi Alton is an instinct and a command from their own nature, so long will there be metaphysicians and metaphysical speculations, that false metaphysics can be effectually counteracted by true metaphysics alone, and that if the reasoning be clear, solid and pertinent, the truth deduced can never be the less valuable on account of the depth from which it may have been drawn. A third class profess themselves friendly to metaphysics, and believe that they are themselves metaphysicians. They have no objection to system or terminology, provided it be the method and the nomenclature to which they have been familiarized in the writings of Locke, Hume, Hartley, Condillac, or perhaps Dr. Reed, and Professor Stewart. To objections from this cause, it is a sufficient answer that one main object of my attempt was to demonstrate the vagueness or insufficiency of the terms used in the metaphysical schools of France and Great Britain since the Revolution, and that the errors which I propose to attack cannot subsist, except as they are concealed behind the mask of a plausible and indefinite nomenclature. But the worst and widest impediment still remains. It is the predominance of a popular philosophy, at once the counterfeit and the mortal enemy of all true and manly metaphysical research. It is that corruption, introduced by certain immethodical aphorisming eclectics, who, dismissing not only all system, but all logical connection, pick and choose whatever is most plausible and showy, who select, whatever words can have some semblance of sense attached to them without the least expenditure of thought, in short whatever may enable men to talk of what they do not understand, with a careful avoidance of everything that might awaken them to a moment's suspicion of their ignorance. This alas! is an irremediable disease, for it brings with it, not so much an indisposition to any particular system, but an utter loss of taste and faculty for all system and for all philosophy. Like echoes that beget each other amongst the mountains, the praise or blame of such men rolls in volleys long after the report from the original blunderbuss. Sequisitas est potius it coercio quam consensus, it tamen, quod pessimum ist, pusillanimitas ist a non sine arrogantia it fastidio esse offert. 55. I shall now proceed to the nature and genesis of the imagination, but I must first take leave to notice that after a more accurate perusal of Mr. Wordsworth's remarks on the imagination, in his preface to the new edition of his poems, I find that my conclusions are not so consentient with his as, I confess, I had taken for granted. In an article contributed by me to Mr. Southey's Omnina, on the soul and its organs of sense, are the following sentences. These, the human faculties, I would arrange under the different senses and powers, as the eye, the ear, the touch, etc., the imitative power, voluntary and automatic, the imagination, or shaping and modifying power, the fancy, or the aggregative and associative power, the understanding, 
or the regulative, substantiating and realizing power, the speculative reason, viz. theoretica et scientifica, or the power by which we produce or aim to produce unity, necessity, and universality in all our knowledge by means of principles a priori, 56, the will, or practical reason, the faculty of choice, Germanis, Wilke, and, distinct both from the moral will and the choice, the sensation of volition, which I have found reason to include under the head of single and double touch. To this, as far as it relates to the subject in question, namely the words, the aggregative and associative power, Mr. Wordsworth's objection is only that the definition is too general. To aggregate and to associate, to evoke and to combine, belong as well to the imagination as to the fancy. I reply, that if, by the power of evoking and combining, Mr. Wordsworth means the same as, and no more than, I meant by the aggregative and associative. I continue to deny that it belongs at all to the imagination, and I am disposed to conjecture that he has mistaken the co-presence of fancy with imagination for the operation of the latter singly. A man may work with two very different tools at the same moment, each has its share in the work, but the work effected by each is distinct and different. But it will probably appear in the next chapter, that deeming it necessary to go back much further than Mr. Wordsworth's subject required or permitted, I have attached a meaning to both fancy and imagination, which he had not in view, at least while he was writing that preface. He will judge. Would to heaven, I might meet with many such readers. I will conclude with the words of Bishop Jeremy Taylor, he to whom all things are one, who draweth all things to one, and seeth all things in one, may enjoy true peace and rest of spirit. 57, Chapter 13 on the Imagination, or Esemplastic Power O Adam, One Almighty is, from whom all things proceed and up to him return, if not depraved e from good, created all such to perfection, one first matter all, endued with various forms, various degrees of substance, and, in things that live, of life, but more refined e, more spiritous and pure, as nearer to him plaqued e, or near attending, each in their several active spheres as I good e, till body up to spirit work, in bounds proportion d to each kind. So from the root springs lighter the green stalk, from thence the leaves more airy, last the bright consummate flower spirits odorous breathes, flowers and their fruit, man's nourishment, by gradual scale sublim d, to vital spirits aspire to animal, to intellectual, give both life and sense, fancy and understanding, whence the soul reason receives, and reason is her being, discursive or intuitive. 58. Same dicerentus cyres corporals nil nice i material continuant, verisime in flacu consist, nec habaria substantial quiquam. Quem admodum et platonici olim rectagnovia. Hincagita, preta pure mathematica et fantasii subjecta, collegi quadam metaphysica solac ment perceptibilia, es admittendar et massi materiali principium quadam superius it, ut sic de calm, formal addendum. Quando quidem omnes veritates rerum corporeum ex solis axiomatibus logisticis et geometrisis, 
Nempta magno it parvo, toto it parti, figura it situ, colligi non possint, sedalia de causa it effectu, actionic it passion, accedia debiant, quibus ordinis rerum rations. Sarvanta. Id principium rerum, an entelechian and vimapellimus, non refert, modo miminerimus, Pusolum verum notionem intelligibilita explicri. 59. Sibomai noiron crup heum tax in choria t mesono eucatacathon. 60. Descartes, speaking as a naturalist, and in imitation of Archimedes, said, Give me matter and motion and I will construct you the universe. We must of course understand him to have meant, I will render the construction of the universe intelligible. In the same sense the transcendental philosopher says, Grant me a nature having two contrary forces, the one of which tends to expand infinitely, while the other strives to apprehend or find itself in this infinity and I will cause the world of intelligences with the whole system of their representations to rise up before you. Every other science presupposes intelligence as already existing and complete, the philosopher contemplates it in its growth, and as it were represents its history to the mind from its birth to its maturity. The venerable sage of Koenigsberg has preceded the march of this master thought as an effective pioneer in his essay on the introduction of negative quantities into philosophy, published 1763. In this he has shown, that instead of assailing the science of mathematics by metaphysics, as Berkeley did in his Analyst, or of sophisticating it, as Wolf did, by the vain attempt of deducing the first principles of geometry from supposed deeper grounds of ontology, it behoved the metaphysician rather to examine whether the only province of knowledge, which man has succeeded in erecting into a pure science, might not furnish materials, or at least hints, for establishing and pacifying the unsettled, warring, and embroiled domain of philosophy. An imitation of the mathematical method had indeed been attempted with no better success than attended the essay of David to wear the armour of Saul. Another use however is possible and of far greater promise, namely, the actual application of the positions which had so wonderfully enlarged the discoveries of geometry, mutatis mutandis, to philosophical subjects. Kant having briefly illustrated the utility of such an attempt in the questions of space, motion, and infinitely small quantities, as employed by the mathematician, proceeds to the idea of negative quantities and the transfer of them to metaphysical investigation. Opposites, he well observes, are of two kinds, either logical, that is, such as are absolutely incompatible, or real, without being contradictory. The former he denominates nihil negativum irreprisentabile the connection of which produces nonsense. A body in motion is something a liquid cogitabile, but a body, at one and the same time in motion and not in motion, is nothing, or, at most, air articulated into nonsense. But a motory force of a body in one direction, and an equal force of the same body in an opposite direction is not incompatible, and the result, namely, rest, is real and representable. For the purposes of mathematical calculus it is indifferent which force we term negative, and which positive, 
and consequently we appropriate the latter to that, which happens to be the principal object in our thoughts. Thus if a man's capital be ten and his debts eight, the subtraction will be the same, whether we call the capital negative debt, or the debt negative capital. But inasmuch as the latter stands practically in reference to the former, we of course represent the sum as ten to eight. It is equally clear that two equal forces acting in opposite directions, both being finite and each distinguished from the other by its direction only, must neutralize or reduce each other to inaction. Now the transcendental philosophy demands, first, that two forces should be conceived which counteract each other by their essential nature, not only not in consequence of the accidental direction of each, but as prior to all direction, nay, as the primary forces from which the conditions of all possible directions are derivative and deducible, secondly, that these forces should be assumed to be both alike infinite, both alike indestructible. The problem will then be to discover the result or product of two such forces, as distinguished from the result of those forces which are finite, and derive their difference solely from the circumstance of their direction. When we have formed a scheme or outline of these two different kinds of force, and of their different results, by the process of discursive reasoning, it will then remain for us to elevate the thesis from notional to actual. By contemplating intuitively this one power with its two inherent indestructible yet counteracting forces, and the results or generations to which their interpenetration gives existence, in the living principle and in the process of our own self-consciousness. By what instrument this is possible the solution itself will discover, at the same time that it will reveal to and for whom it is possible. Non omnia possumus ons. There is a philosophic no less than a poetic genius, which is differenced from the highest perfection of talent, not by degree but by kind. The counteraction then of the two assumed forces does not depend on their meeting from opposite directions. The power which acts in them is indestructible, it is therefore inexhaustibly re -ebullient and as something must be the result of these two forces, both alike infinite, and both alike indestructible, and as rest or neutralization cannot be this result, no other conception is possible, but that the product must be a tertium liquid, or finite generation. Consequently this conception is necessary. Now this tertium liquid can be no other than an interpenetration of the counteracting powers, partaking of both. Asterisk 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 thus far had the work been transcribed for the press, when I received the following letter from a friend, whose practical judgment I have had ample reason to estimate and revere and whose taste and sensibility preclude all the excuses which my self-love might possibly have prompted me to set up in plea against the decision of advisers of equal good sense, but with less tact and feeling. Dear C. You ask my opinion concerning your chapter on the imagination, both as to the impressions it made on myself and as to those which I think it will make on the public, i.e. that part of the public, who, from the title of the work and from its forming a sort of introduction to a volume of poems, are likely to constitute the great majority of your readers. As to myself, and stating in the first place the effect on my understanding, 
your opinions and method of argument were not only so new to me, but so directly the reverse of all I had ever been accustomed to consider as truth, that even if I had comprehended your premises sufficiently to have admitted them, and had seen the necessity of your conclusions, I should still have been in that state of mind, which in your note in chap. For you have so ingeniously evolved, as the antithesis to that in which a man is, when he makes a bull. In your own words, I should have felt as if I had been standing on my head. The effect on my feelings, on the other hand, I cannot better represent, than by supposing myself to have known only our light airy modern chapels of ease and then for the first time to have been placed, and left alone, in one of our largest Gothic cathedrals in a gusty moonlight night of autumn. Now in glimmer, and now in gloom, often in palpable darkness not without a chilly sensation of terror, then suddenly emerging into broad yet visionary lights with coloured shadows of fantastic shapes yet all decked with holy insignia and mystic symbols, and ever and anon coming out full upon pictures and stonework images of great men, with whose names I was familiar, but which looked upon me with countenances and an expression, the most dissimilar to all I had been in the habit of connecting with those names. Those whom I had been taught to venerate as almost superhuman in magnitude of intellect, I found perched in little fretwork niches, as grotesque dwarfs, while the grotesques, in my hitherto belief, stood guarding the high altar with all the characters of apotheosis. In short, what I had supposed substances were thinned away into shadows while everywhere shadows were deepened into substances, if substance might be called e that shadow seemed e, for each seemed e either. Yet after all, I could not but repeat the lines which you had quoted from a MS poem of your own in the friend, and applied to a work of Mr. Wordsworth's though with a few of the words altered, an Orphic tale indeed a tale obscure of high and passionate thoughts to a strange music chanted. Be assured, however, that I look forward anxiously to your great book on the constructive philosophy, which you have promised and announced, and that I will do my best to understand it. Only I will not promise to descend into the dark cave of Trophonius with you there to rub my own eyes, in order to make the sparks and figured flashes, which I am required to see. So much for myself. But as for the public I do not hesitate a moment in advising and urging you to withdraw the chapter from the present work, and to reserve it for your announced treatises on the logos or communicative intellect in man and deity. First, because imperfectly as I understand the present chapter, I see clearly that you have done too much, and yet not enough. You have been obliged to omit so many links, from the necessity of compression, that what remains, looks, if I may recur to my former illustration, like the fragments of the winding steps of an old ruined tower. Secondly, a still stronger argument, at least one that I am sure will be more forcible with you, is, that your readers will have both right and reason to complain of you. This chapter, which cannot, when it is printed, amount to so little as an hundred pages, will of necessity greatly increase the expense of the work, and every reader who, like myself, is neither prepared nor perhaps calculated for the study of so abstruse a subject so abstrusely treated, 
will, as I have before hinted, be almost entitled to accuse you of a sort of imposition on him. For who, he might truly observe, could from your title page, to wit, my literary life and opinions published too as introductory to a volume of miscellaneous poems, have anticipated, or even conjectured, a long treatise on ideal realism which holds the same relation in abstruseness to Plotinus, as Plotinus does to Plato. It will be well, if already you have not too much of metaphysical disquisition in your work, though as the larger part of the disquisition is historical, it will doubtless be both interesting and instructive to many to whose unprepared minds your speculations on the esemplastic power would be utterly unintelligible. Be assured, if you do publish this chapter in the present work, you will be reminded of Bishop Barclay's series, announced as an essay on tar water, which beginning with tar ends with the Trinity, the omnisabile forming the interspace. I say in the present work. In that greater work to which you have devoted so many years, and study so intense and various, it will be in its proper place. Your prospectus will have described and announced both its contents and their nature, and if any persons purchase it, who feel no interest in the subjects of which it treats, they will have themselves only to blame. I could add to these arguments one derived from pecuniary motives and particularly from the probable effects on the sale of your present publication, but they would weigh little with you compared with the preceding. Besides, I have long observed, that arguments drawn from your own personal interests more often act on you as narcotics than as stimulants, and that in money concerns you have some small portion of pig nature in your moral idiosyncrasy, and, like these amiable creatures, must occasionally be pulled backward from the boat in order to make you enter it. All success attend you, for if hard thinking and hard reading are merits, you have deserved it. Your affectionate, etc., in consequence of this very judicious letter, which produced complete conviction on my mind, I shall content myself for the present with stating the main result of the chapter, which I have reserved for that future publication, a detailed prospectus of which the reader will find at the close of the second volume. The imagination then I consider either as primary, or secondary. The primary imagination I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception, and as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. The secondary imagination I consider as an echo of the former, coexisting with the conscious will yet still as identical with the primary in the kind of its agency, and differing only in degree, and in the mode of its operation. It dissolves, diffuses, dissipates, in order to recreate, or where this process is rendered impossible, yet still at all events it struggles to idealize and to unify. It is essentially vital even as all objects, as objects, are essentially fixed and dead. Fancy, on the contrary, has no other counters to play with, but fixities and definites. The fancy is indeed no other than a mode of memory emancipated from the order of time and space, while it is blended with and modified by that empirical phenomenon of the will, which we express by the word choice. 
but equally with the ordinary memory the fancy must receive all its materials ready-made from the law of association. Chapter 14 Occasion of the Lyrical Ballads, and the Objects Originally Proposed, Preface to the Second Edition, The Ensuing Controversy, Its Causes and Acrimony, Philosophic Definitions of a Poem and Poetry with Scolia. During the first year that Mr. Wordsworth and I were neighbours, our conversations turned frequently on the two cardinal points of poetry, the power of exciting the sympathy of the reader by a faithful adherence to the truth of nature, and the power of giving the interest of novelty by the modifying colours of imagination. The sudden charm, which accidents of light and shade, which moonlight or sunset diffused over a known and familiar landscape, appeared to represent the practicability of combining both. These are the poetry of nature. The thought suggested itself, to which of us I do not recollect, that a series of poems might be composed of two sorts. In the one, the incidents and agents were to be, in part at least, supernatural, and the excellence aimed at was to consist in the interesting of the affections by the dramatic truth of such emotions, as would naturally accompany such situations, supposing them real. And real in this sense they have been to every human being who, from whatever source of delusion, has at any time believed himself under supernatural agency. For the second class, subjects were to be chosen from ordinary life, the characters and incidents were to be such as will be found in every village and its vicinity, where there is a meditative and feeling mind to seek after them, or to notice them, when they present themselves. In this idea originated the plan of the lyrical ballads, in which it was agreed, that my endeavours should be directed to persons and characters supernatural, or at least romantic, yet so as to transfer from our inward nature a human interest and a semblance of truth sufficient to procure for these shadows of imagination that willing suspension of disbelief for the moment which constitutes poetic faith. Mr. Wordsworth, on the other hand, was to propose to himself as his object, to give the charm of novelty to things of every day, and to excite a feeling analogous to the supernatural, by awakening the mind's attention to the lethargy of custom, and directing it to the loveliness and the wonders of the world before us an inexhaustible treasure, but for which, in consequence of the film of familiarity and selfish solicitude, we have eyes, yet see not, ears that hear not, and hearts that neither feel nor understand. With this view I wrote The Ancient Mariner, and was preparing among other poems, The Dark Lady, and The Christabel in which I should have more nearly realized my ideal, than I had done in my first attempt. But Mr. Wordsworth's industry had proved so much more successful, and the number of his poems so much greater, that my compositions, instead of forming a balance, appeared rather an interpolation of heterogeneous matter. Mr. Wordsworth added two or three poems written in his own character, in the impassioned, lofty, and sustained diction, which is characteristic of his genius. In this form the lyrical ballads were published, and were presented by him, as an experiment, whether subjects, which from their nature rejected the usual ornaments and extra-colloquial style of poems in general, might not be so managed in the language of ordinary life as to produce the pleasurable interest, 
which it is the peculiar business of poetry to impart. To the second edition he added a preface of considerable length, in which, notwithstanding some passages of apparently a contrary import, he was understood to contend for the extension of this style to poetry of all kinds, and to reject as vicious and indefensible all phrases and forms of speech that were not included in what he, unfortunately, I think, adopting an equivocal expression, called the language of real life. From this preface, prefixed to poems in which it was impossible to deny the presence of original genius, however mistaken its direction might be deemed, arose the whole long-continued controversy. For from the conjunction of perceived power with supposed heresy I explain the inveteracy and in some instances, I grieve to say, the acrimonious passions with which the controversy has been conducted by the assailants. Had Mr. Wordsworth's poems been the silly, the childish things, which they were for a long time described as being had they been really distinguished from the compositions of other poets merely by meanness of language and inanity of thought, had they indeed contained nothing more than what is found in the parodies and pretended imitations of them, they must have sunk at once, a dead weight, into the slough of oblivion, and have dragged the preface along with them. But year after year increased the number of Mr. Wordsworth's admirers. They were found too not in the lower classes of the reading public but chiefly among young men of strong sensibility and meditative minds, and their admiration, inflamed perhaps in some degree by opposition, was distinguished by its intensity, I might almost say, by its religious fervour. These facts, and the intellectual energy of the author, which was more or less consciously felt, where it was outwardly and even boisterously denied, meeting with sentiments of aversion to his opinions, and of alarm at their consequences, produced an eddy of criticism, which would of itself have borne up the poems by the violence with which it whirled them round and round. With many parts of this preface in the sense attributed to them and which the words undoubtedly seem to authorize, I never concurred, but on the contrary objected to them as erroneous in principle, and as contradictory, in appearance at least, both to other parts of the same preface, and to the author's own practice in the greater part of the poems themselves. Mr. Wordsworth in his recent collection has, I find, degraded this prefatory disquisition to the end of his second volume, to be read or not at the reader's choice. But he has not, as far as I can discover, announced any change in his poetic creed. At all events, considering it as the source of a controversy, in which I have been honoured more than I deserve by the frequent conjunction of my name with his, I think it expedient to declare once for all, in what points I coincide with the opinions supported in that preface, and in what points I altogether differ. But in order to render myself intelligible I must previously, in as few words as possible, explain my views, first, of a poem, and secondly, of poetry itself, in kind, and in essence. The office of philosophical disquisition consists in just distinction, while it is the privilege of the philosopher to preserve himself constantly aware, that distinction is not division. In order to obtain adequate notions of any truth, we must intellectually separate its distinguishable parts, and this is the technical process of philosophy. 
but having so done, we must then restore them in our conceptions to the unity, in which they actually coexist, and this is the result of philosophy. A poem contains the same elements as a prose composition, the difference therefore must consist in a different combination of them, in consequence of a different object being proposed. According to the difference of the object will be the difference of the combination. It is possible, that the object may be merely to facilitate the recollection of any given facts or observations by artificial arrangement, and the composition will be a poem, merely because it is distinguished from prose by meter, or by rhyme, or by both conjointly. In this, the lowest sense, a man might attribute the name of a poem to the well-known enumeration of the days in the several months, thirty days of September, April, June, and November etc. and others of the same class and purpose. And as a particular pleasure is found in anticipating the recurrence of sounds and quantities, all compositions that have this charm superadded, whatever be their contents, may be entitled poems. So much for the superficial form. A difference of object and contents supplies an additional ground of distinction. The immediate purpose may be the communication of truths, either of truth absolute and demonstrable as in works of science, or of facts experienced and recorded, as in history. Pleasure, and that of the highest and most permanent kind, may result from the attainment of the end, but it is not itself the immediate end. In other works the communication of pleasure may be the immediate purpose, and though truth, either moral or intellectual, ought to be the ultimate end, yet this will distinguish the character of the author, not the class to which the work belongs. Blessed indeed is that state of society, in which the immediate purpose would be baffled by the perversion of the proper ultimate end, in which no charm of diction or imagery could exempt the bathylus even of an Anachaean, or the Alexis of Virgil from disgust and aversion. But the communication of pleasure may be the immediate object of a work not metrically composed, and that object may have been in a high degree attained, as in novels and romances. Would then the mere superdition of metre, with or without rhyme, entitle these to the name of poems? The answer is, that nothing can permanently please, which does not contain in itself the reason why it is so, and not otherwise. If metre be superded, all other parts must be made consonant with it. They must be such, as to justify the perpetual and distinct attention to each part which an exact correspondent recurrence of accent and sound are calculated to excite. The final definition then, so deduced, may be thus worded. A poem is that species of composition, which is opposed to works of science, by proposing for its immediate object pleasure, not truth, and from all other species, Having this object in common with it, it is discriminated by proposing to itself such delight from the whole, as is compatible with a distinct gratification from each component part. Controversy is not seldom excited in consequence of the disputants attaching each a different meaning to the same word, and in few instances has this been more striking than in disputes concerning the present subject. If a man chooses to call every composition a poem, which is rhyme, or measure, or both, 
I must leave his opinion uncontroverted. The distinction is at least competent to characterize the writer's intention. If it were subjoined, that the whole is likewise entertaining or affecting, as a tale, or as a series of interesting reflections, I of course admit this as another fit ingredient of a poem, and an additional merit. But if the definition sought for be that of a legitimate poem, I answer, it must be one, the parts of which mutually support and explain each other, all in their proportion harmonizing with, and supporting the purpose and known influences of metrical arrangement. The philosophic critics of all ages coincide with the ultimate judgment of all countries, in equally denying the praises of a just poem, on the one hand, to a series of striking lines or distiches, each of which, absorbing the whole attention of the reader to itself, becomes disjoined from its context, and forms a separate whole instead of a harmonizing part, and on the other hand, to an unsustained composition, from which the reader collects rapidly the general result unattracted by the component parts. The reader should be carried forward, not merely or chiefly by the mechanical impulse of curiosity, or by a restless desire to arrive at the final solution but by the pleasurable activity of mind excited by the attractions of the journey itself. Like the motion of a serpent, which the Egyptians made the emblem of intellectual power, or like the path of sound through the air, at every step he pauses and half recedes, and from the retrogressive movement collects the force which again carries him onward. Price epitandus ist liber spiritus, says Petronius most happily. The epithet, liber, here balances the preceding verb, and it is not easy to conceive more meaning condensed in fewer words. But if this should be admitted as a satisfactory character of a poem, we have still to seek for a definition of poetry. The writings of Plato, and Jeremy Taylor, and Burnett's theory of the earth, furnish undeniable proofs that poetry of the highest kind may exist without meter, and even without the contradistinguishing objects of a poem. The first chapter of Isaiah, indeed a very large portion of the whole book, is poetry in the most emphatic sense. Yet it would be not less irrational than strange to assert, that pleasure, and not truth was the immediate object of the prophet. In short, whatever specific import we attach to the word, poetry, there will be found involved in it, as a necessary consequence, that a poem of any length neither can be, nor ought to be, all poetry. Yet if an harmonious whole is to be produced, the remaining parts must be preserved in keeping with the poetry, and this can be no otherwise effected than by such a studied selection and artificial arrangement, as will partake of one, though not a peculiar property of poetry. And this again can be no other than the property of exciting a more continuous and equal attention than the language of prose aims at, whether colloquial or written. My own conclusions on the nature of poetry, in the strictest use of the word, have been in part anticipated in some of the remarks on the fancy and imagination in the early part of this work. What is poetry, is so nearly the same question with, what is a poet, that the answer to the one is involved in the solution of the other. For it is a distinction resulting from the poetic genius itself, which sustains and modifies the images, thoughts, 
and emotions of the poet's own mind. The poet, described in ideal perfection, brings the whole soul of man into activity, with the subordination of its faculties to each other according to their relative worth and dignity. He diffuses a tone and spirit of unity, that blends, and, as it were, fuses, each into each, by that synthetic and magical power, to which I would exclusively appropriate the name of imagination. This power, first put in action by the will and understanding, and retained under their remissive, though gentle and unnoticed, control, laxis to habenus, reveals itself in the balance or reconcilement of opposite or discordant qualities, of sameness, with difference, of the general with the concrete, the idea with the image, the individual with the representative, the sense of novelty and freshness with old and familiar objects a more than usual state of emotion with more than usual order, judgment ever awake and steady self-possession with enthusiasm and feeling profound or vehement, and while it blends and harmonizes the natural and the artificial, still subordinates art to nature, the manner to the matter, and our admiration of the poet to our sympathy with the poetry. Doubtless, as Sir John Davies observes of the soul, and his words may with slight alteration be applied, and even more appropriately, to the poetic imagination, doubtless this could not be, but that she turns bodies to spirit by sublimation strange, as fire converts to fire the things it burns, as we our food into our nature change. From their gross matter she abstracts their forms, and draws a kind of quintessence from things, which to her proper nature she transforms to bear them light on her celestial wings. Thus does she, when from individual states she doth abstract the universal kinds, which then reclothed in divers names and fates steal access through the senses to our minds. Finally, good sense is the body of poetic genius, fancy its drapery, motion its life, and imagination the soul that is everywhere, and in each, and forms all into one graceful and intelligent whole. Chapter 15 The Specific Symptoms of Poetic Power Elucidated in a Critical Analysis of Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis and rape of Luris. In the application of these principles to purposes of practical criticism, as employed in the appraisement of works more or less imperfect, I have endeavoured to discover what the qualities in a poem are, which may be deemed promises and specific symptoms of poetic power as distinguished from general talent determined to poetic composition by accidental motives, by an act of the will, rather than by the inspiration of a genial and productive nature. In this investigation, I could not, I thought, do better, than keep before me the earliest work of the greatest genius that perhaps human nature has yet produced, our myriad-minded, 61, Shakespeare. I mean the Venus and Adonis, and the Luris, works which give at once strong promises of the strength, and yet obvious proofs of the immaturity, of his genius. From these I abstracted the following marks as characteristics of original poetic genius in general. One in the Venus and Adonis, the first and most obvious excellence is the perfect sweetness of the versification, its adaptation to the subject, 
and the power displayed in varying the march of the words without passing into a loftier and more majestic rhythm than was demanded by the thoughts, or permitted by the propriety of preserving a sense of melody predominant. The delight in richness and sweetness of sound, even to a faulty excess, if it be evidently original, and not the result of an easily imitable mechanism, I regard as a highly favorable promise in the compositions of a young man. The man that hath not music in his soul can indeed never be a genuine poet. Imagery, even taken from nature, much more when transplanted from books, as travels, voyages, and works of natural history, affecting incidents, just thoughts, interesting personal or domestic feelings, and with these the art of their combination or intertexture in the form of a poem, may all by incessant effort be acquired as a trade, by a man of talent and much reading, who, as I once before observed, has mistaken an intense desire of poetic reputation for a natural poetic genius, the love of the arbitrary end for a possession of the peculiar means. But the sense of musical delight, with the power of producing it, is a gift of imagination, and this together with the power of reducing multitude into unity of effect, and modifying a series of thoughts by some one predominant thought or feeling, may be cultivated and improved, but can never be learned. It is in these that poet nascit a non fit. To a second promise of genius is the choice of subjects very remote from the private interests and circumstances of the writer himself. At least I have found, that where the subject is taken immediately from the author's personal sensations and experiences, the excellence of a particular poem is but an equivocal mark, and often a fallacious pledge, of genuine poetic power. We may perhaps remember the tale of the statuary who had acquired considerable reputation for the legs of his goddesses, though the rest of the statue accorded but indifferently with ideal beauty, till his wife, elated by her husband's praises, modestly acknowledged that she had been his constant model. In the Venus and Adonis this proof of poetic power exists even to excess. It is throughout as if a superior spirit more intuitive, more intimately conscious, even than the characters themselves, not only of every outward look and act, but of the flux and reflux of the mind in all its subtlest thoughts and feelings, were placing the whole before our view, himself meanwhile unparticipating in the passions and actuated only by that pleasurable excitement, which had resulted from the energetic fervor of his own spirit in so vividly exhibiting what it had so accurately and profoundly contemplated. I think, I should have conjectured from these poems, that even then the great instinct, which impelled the poet to the drama, was secretly working in him, prompting him, by a series and never broken chain of imagery, always vivid and, because unbroken, often minute, by the highest effort of the picturesque in words, of which words are capable, higher perhaps than was ever realized by any other poet, even Dante not excepted to provide a substitute for that visual language, that constant intervention and running comment by tone, look and gesture, which in his dramatic works he was entitled to expect from the players. His Venus and Adonis seem at once the characters themselves, 
and the whole representation of those characters by the most consummate actors. You seem to be told nothing, but to see and hear everything. Hence it is, from the perpetual activity of attention required on the part of the reader, from the rapid flow, the quick change, and the playful nature of the thoughts and images, and above all from the alienation, and, if I may hazard such an expression, the utter aloofness of the poet's own feelings, from those of which he is at once the painter and the analyst, that though the very subject cannot but detract from the pleasure of a delicate mind, yet never was poem less dangerous on a moral account. Instead of doing as Ariosto, and as, still more offensively, Wieland has done, instead of degrading and deforming passion into appetite, the trials of love into the struggles of concupiscence, Shakespeare has here represented the animal impulse itself, so as to preclude all sympathy with it, by dissipating the reader's notice among the thousand outward images, and now beautiful, now fanciful circumstances which form its dresses and its scenery, or by diverting our attention from the main subject by those frequent witty or profound reflections, which the poet's ever active mind has deduced from, or connected with, the imagery and the incidents. The reader is forced into too much action to sympathize with the merely passive of our nature. As little can a mind thus roused and awakened be brooded on by mean and indistinct emotion, as the low, lazy mist can creep upon the surface of a lake, while a strong gale is driving it onward in waves and billows. 3. It has been before observed that images, however beautiful, though faithfully copied from nature, and as accurately represented in words, do not of themselves characterize the poet. They become proofs of original genius only as far as they are modified by a predominant passion, or by associated thoughts or images awakened by that passion, or when they have the effect of reducing multitude to unity, or succession to an instant, or lastly, when a human and intellectual life is transferred to them from the poet's own spirit, which shoots its being through earth, sea, and air. In the two following lines for instance, there is nothing objectionable, nothing which would preclude them from forming, in their proper place, part of a descriptive poem, Behold yon row of pines that shorn and bodhi bend from the sea blast, seen at twilight eve. But with a small alteration of rhythm, the same words would be equally in their place in a book of topography, or in a descriptive tour. The same image will rise into semblance of poetry if thus conveyed, yon row of bleak and visionary pines, by twilight glimpse discerned. Mark. How they flee from the fierce sea blast, all their tresses wild streaming before them. I have given this as an illustration, by no means as an instance, of that particular excellence which I had in view, and in which Shakespeare even in his earliest, as in his latest, works surpasses all other poets. It is by this that he still gives a dignity and a passion to the objects which he presents. Unaided by any previous excitement, they burst upon us at once in life and in power, full many a glorious morning have I seen flatter the mountain tops with sovereign eye. Not mine own fears, nor the prophetic soul of the wide world dreaming on things to come 
Asterisk 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 the mortal mooneth her eclipse endured, and the sad augurs mock their own presage, incertainties now crown themselves as a D, and peace proclaims olives of endless age. Now with the drops of this most balmy time my love looks fresh, and death to me subscribes, since spite of him, I'll live in this poor rhyme, while he insults o'er dull and speechless tribes. And thou in this shalt find thy monument, when tyrants' crests, and tombs of brass are spent. As of higher worth, so doubtless still more characteristic of poetic genius does the imagery become, when it moulds and colours itself to the circumstances, passion, or character, present and foremost in the mind. For unrivalled instances of this excellence, the reader's own memory will refer him to the Lear, Othello, in short to which not of the great, ever living, dead man's dramatic works. In opum m copia fecit. How true it is to nature, he has himself finely expressed in the instance of love in his 98th sonnet. From you have I been absent in the spring, when proud pied April dressed in all its trim, hath put a spirit of youth in everything, that heavy Saturn laugh d and leap d with him. Yet nor the lays of birds nor the sweet smell of different flowers in odour and in hue, could make me any summer's story tell, or from their proud lap pluck them, where they grew nor did I wonder at the lilies white, nor praise the deep vermilion in the rose, they were, though sweet, but figures of delight, drawn after you, you pattern of all those. Yet seemed ye it winter still, and, you away, as with your shadow, I with these did play. Scarcely less sure, or if a less valuable, not less indispensable mark gonamon men poetau, hostis roma genion lacoi, will the imagery supply, when, with more than the power of the painter, the poet gives us the liveliest image of succession with the feeling of simultaneousness, with this. He breaketh from the sweet embrace of those fair arms, which bound him to her breast, and homeward through the dark lawn runs apace. Asterisk, 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 look. How a bright star shooteth from the sky, so glides he in the night from Venus' eye. For the last character I shall mention which would prove indeed but little, except as taken conjointly with the former, yet without which the former could scarce exist in a high degree, and, even if this were possible, would give promises only of transitory flashes and a meteoric power, is depth, and energy of thought. No man was ever yet a great poet without being at the same time a profound philosopher. For poetry is the blossom and the fragrancy of all human knowledge, human thoughts, human passions, emotions, language. In Shakespeare's poems the creative power and the intellectual energy wrestle as in a war embrace. Each in its excess of strength seems to threaten the extinction of the other. At length in the drama they were reconciled, and fought each with its shield before the breast of the other. Or like two rapid streams, that, at their first meeting within narrow and rocky banks, mutually strive to repel each other and intermix reluctantly and in tumult but soon finding a wider channel and more yielding shores blend, and dilate, and flow on in one current and with one voice. 
the Venus and Adonis did not perhaps allow the display of the deeper passions. But the story of Luretia seems to favor and even demand their intensest workings. And yet we find in Shakespeare's management of the tale neither pathos, nor any other dramatic quality. There is the same minute and faithful imagery as in the former poem, in the same vivid colors, inspirited by the same impetuous vigor of thought, and diverging and contracting with the same activity of the assimilative and of the modifying faculties, and with a yet larger display, a yet wider range of knowledge and reflection, and lastly, with the same perfect dominion often domination, over the whole world of language. What then shall we say? Even this, that Shakespeare, no mere child of nature, no automaton of genius, no passive vehicle of inspiration, possessed by the spirit, not possessing it, first studied patiently, meditated deeply, understood minutely, till knowledge, become habitual and intuitive, wedded itself to his habitual feelings, and at length gave birth to that stupendous power, by which he stands alone, with no equal or second in his own class, to that power which seated him on one of the two glorious mitten summits of the poetic mountain, with Milton as his compeer not rival while the former darts himself forth, and passes into all the forms of human character and passion, the one protus of the fire and the flood, the other attracts all forms and things to himself, into the unity of his own ideal. All things and modes of action shape themselves anew in the being of Milton, while Shakespeare becomes all things yet forever remaining himself. O oh, what great menace thou not produced, England, my country, truly indeed, we must be free or die, who speak the tongue, which Shakespeare spake, the faith and morals hold, which Milton held. In everything we are sprung of earth's first blood, have titles manifold. Chapter 16 Striking Points of Difference Between the Poets of the Present Age and Those of the 15th and 16th Centuries, which expressed for the union of the characteristic merits of both. Christdom, from its first settlement on feudal rights, has been so far one great body, however imperfectly organized that a similar spirit will be found in each period to have been acting in all its members. The study of Shakespeare's poems, I do not include his dramatic works, eminently as they too deserve that title, led me to a more careful examination of the contemporary poets both in England and in other countries but my attention was especially fixed on those of Italy, from the birth to the death of Shakespeare, that being the country in which the fine arts had been most sedulously, and hitherto most successfully cultivated. Abstracted from the degrees and peculiarities of individual genius, the properties common to the good writers of each period seem to establish one striking point of difference between the poetry of the 15th and 16th centuries, and that of the present age. The remark may perhaps be extended to the sister art of painting. At least the latter will serve to illustrate the former. In the present age the poet I would wish to be understood as speaking generally, and without allusion to individual names, seems to propose to himself as his main object, and as that which is the most characteristic of his art, new and striking images, 
with incidents that interest the affections or excite the curiosity. Both his characters and his descriptions he renders, as much as possible, specific and individual, even to a degree of portraiture. In his diction and metre, on the other hand, he is comparatively careless. The measure is either constructed on no previous system, and acknowledges no justifying principle but that of the writer's convenience, or else some mechanical movement is adopted, of which one couplet or stanza is so far an adequate specimen, as that the occasional differences appear evidently to arise from accident, or the qualities of the language itself not from meditation and an intelligent purpose. And the language from Pope's translation of Homer, to Darwin's Temple of Nature, 62, may, notwithstanding some illustrious exceptions, be too faithfully characterized, as claiming to be poetical for no better reason, than that it would be intolerable in conversation or in prose. Though alas, even our prose writings, nay even the style of our more set discourses, strive to be in the fashion, and trick themselves out in the soiled and overworn finery of the meretricious muse. It is true that of late a great improvement in this respect is observable in our most popular writers. But it is equally true that this recurrence to plain sense and genuine mother English is far from being general, and that the composition of our novels, magazines, public harangues, and the like is commonly as trivial in thought, and yet enigmatic in expression, as if Echo and Sphinx had laid their heads together to construct it. Nay even of those who have most rescued themselves from this contagion, I should plead inwardly guilty to the charge of duplicity or cowardice, if I withheld my conviction, that few have guarded the purity of their native tongue with that jealous care, which the sublime Dante in his tract de la vulgar eloquenza, declares to be the first duty of a poet. For language is the armory of the human mind, and at once contains the trophies of its past, and the weapons of its future conquests. Animadvert, says Hobbes, quam sit ab impropriate verborum prinum homini hus prolabi in eras circa ipsus res. Sat, vero, says Senertus in hac vitae brevitatit nach re obscuritate, re remist, quibus conoscendis tempus impendata, ut, confusi it multivotis, sermonibus intelligendis illud consumere opus non sit. Au, quantus strages paravia verba nubula, qua tot dicunt ut nile dicunt, nubs potius, Equibus it in rebus politicis it in ecclesia turbines it to nitrua erum punt. It proin direct dictum putamus a platon in gorgia, o essen tar onomata edia, is te ikai tar pragmata, it ab epicteto, archi page usios hat un onomaton episcepsis, it prudentis im galnus scribit. Hat un onomaton crasis teractis a chitain ton pragmaton epiteratia nosen. Egregi vero J. C. Scaliger, in lib. Ida plantis, ist primum, in quit, sapientis officium, bean sentia, ut sibi vivat, proximum, bean loci, ut patrii vivat. Something analogous to the materials and structure of modern poetry I seem to have noticed, but here I beg to be understood as speaking with the utmost diffidence, in our common landscape painters. 
their foregrounds and intermediate distances are comparatively unattractive, while the main interest of the landscape is thrown into the background, where mountains and torrents and castles forbid the eye to proceed, and nothing tempts it to trace its way back again. But in the works of the great Italian and Flemish masters, the front and middle objects of the landscape are the most obvious and determinate, the interest gradually dies away in the background, and the charm and peculiar worth of the picture consists, not so much in the specific objects which it conveys to the understanding in a visual language formed by the substitution of figures for words, as in the beauty and harmony of the colours lines, and expression, with which the objects are represented. Hence novelty of subject was rather avoided than sought for. Superior excellence in the manner of treating the same subjects was the trial and test of the artist's merit. Not otherwise is it with the more polished poets of the 15th and 16th centuries especially those of Italy. The imagery is almost always general, sun, moon, flowers, breezes, murmuring streams, warbling songsters, delicious shades, lovely damsels cruel as fair, nymphs, naiads, and goddesses, are the materials which are common to all and which each shaped and arranged according to his judgment or fancy, little solicitous to add or to particularize. If we make an honorable exception in favor of some English poets, the thoughts too are as little novel as the images, and the fable of their narrative poems, for the most part drawn from mythology, or sources of equal notoriety derive their chief attractions from the manner of treating them, from impassioned flow, or picturesque arrangement. In opposition to the present age, and perhaps in as faulty an extreme, they placed the essence of poetry in the art. The excellence, at which they aimed, consisted in the exquisite polish of the diction, combined with perfect simplicity. This their prime object they attained by the avoidance of every word, which a gentleman would not use in dignified conversation, and of every word and phrase, which none but a learned man would use, by the studied position of words and phrases, so that not only each part should be melodious in itself but contribute to the harmony of the whole, each note referring and conducting to the melody of all the foregoing and following words of the same period or stanza, and lastly with equal labor. The greater because unbetrayed, by the variation and various harmonies of their metrical movement. Their measures, however, were not indebted for their variety to the introduction of new meters, such as have been attempted of late in the Alonso and Imogen, and others borrowed from the German, having in their very mechanism a specific overpowering tune, to which the generous reader humors his voice and emphasis, with more indulgence to the author than attention to the meaning or quantity of the words, but which, to an ear familiar with the numerous sounds of the Greek and Roman poets, has an effect not unlike that of galloping over a paved road in a German stage wagon without springs. On the contrary, the elder bards both of Italy and England produced a far greater as well as more charming variety by countless modifications and subtle balances of sound in the common meters of their country. A lasting and enviable reputation awaits that man of genius, who should attempt and realize a union, who should recall the high finish, the appropriateness, the facility, 
the delicate proportion, and above all, the perfusive and omnipresent grace, which have preserved, as in a shrine of precious amber, the sparrow of Cachalas, the swallow, the grasshopper, and all the other little loves of Anakaean, and which, with bright, though diminished glories, revisited the youth and early manhood of Christian Europe, in the vales of 63, Arno, and the groves of Isis and of Cam, and who with these should combine the keener interest, deeper pathos, manlier reflection, and the fresher and more various imagery, which give a value and a name that will not pass away to the poets who have done honour to our own times, and to those of our immediate predecessors. Chapter 17 Examination of the Tenets Peculiar to Mr. Wordsworth, Rustic Life, Above All, Low and Rustic Life, Especially Unfavorable to the Formation of a Human Diction, The Best Parts of Language The Product of Philosophers, Not of Clowns or Shepherds, Poetry Essentially Ideal and Generic the language of Milton as much the language of real life, yet, incomparably more so than that of the cottager. As far then as Mr. Wordsworth in his preface contended, and most ably contended, for a reformation in our poetic diction, as far as he has evinced the truth of passion, and the dramatic propriety of those figures and metaphors in the original poets, which, stripped of their justifying reasons, and converted into mere artifices of connection or ornament, constitute the characteristic falsity in the poetic style of the moderns, and as far as he has, with equal acuteness and clearness, pointed out the process by which this change was effected, and the resemblances between that state into which the reader's mind is thrown by the pleasurable confusion of thought from an unaccustomed train of words and images, and that state which is induced by the natural language of impassioned feeling, he undertook a useful task, and deserves all praise, both for the attempt and for the execution. The provocations to this remonstrance in behalf of truth and nature were still of perpetual recurrence before and after the publication of this preface. I cannot likewise but add, that the comparison of such poems of merit, as have been given to the public within the last ten or twelve years, with the majority of those produced previously to the appearance of that preface, leave no doubt on my mind, that Mr. Wordsworth is fully justified in believing his efforts to have been by no means ineffectual. Not only in the verses of those who have professed their admiration of his genius, but even of those who have distinguished themselves by hostility to his theory, and depreciation of his writings are the impressions of his principles plainly visible. It is possible, that with these principles others may have been blended, which are not equally evident, and some which are unsteady and subvertible from the narrowness or imperfection of their basis. But it is more than possible, that these errors of defect or exaggeration, by kindling and feeding the controversy, may have conduced not only to the wider propagation of the accompanying truths, but that, by their frequent presentation to the mind in an excited state, they may have won for them a more permanent and practical result. A man will borrow a part from his opponent the more easily if he feels himself justified in continuing to reject a part. While there remain important points in which he can still feel himself in the right, in which he still finds firm footing for continued resistance, 
he will gradually adopt those opinions, which were the least remote from his own convictions, as not less congruous with his own theory than with that which he reprobates. In like manner with a kind of instinctive prudence, he will abandon by little and little his weakest posts, till at length he seems to forget that they had ever belonged to him, or affects to consider them at most as accidental and petty annexments the removal of which leaves the citadel unhurt and unendangered. My own differences from certain supposed parts of Mr. Wordsworth's theory ground themselves on the assumption, that his words had been rightly interpreted, as purporting that the proper diction for poetry in general consists altogether in a language taken, with due exceptions, from the mouths of men in real life a language which actually constitutes the natural conversation of men under the influence of natural feelings. My objection is, first, that in any sense this rule is applicable only to certain classes of poetry, secondly, that even to these classes it is not applicable, except in such a sense, as if never by any one as far as I know or have read, been denied or doubted, and lastly, that as far as, and in that degree in which it is practicable, it is yet as a rule useless, if not injurious, and therefore either need not, or ought not to be practised. The poet informs his reader, that he had generally chosen low and rustic life, but not as low and rustic, or in order to repeat that pleasure of doubtful moral effect, which persons of elevated rank and of superior refinement oftentimes derive from a happy imitation of the rude unpolished manners and discourse of their inferiors. For the pleasure so derived may be traced to three exciting causes. The first is the naturalness, in fact, of the things represented. The second is the apparent naturalness of the representation, as raised and qualified by an imperceptible infusion of the author's own knowledge and talent, which infusion does, indeed, constitute it an imitation as distinguished from a mere copy. The third cause may be found in the reader's conscious feeling of his superiority awakened by the contrast presented to him, even as for the same purpose the kings and great barons of yore retained, sometimes actual clowns and fools, but more frequently shrewd and witty fellows in that character. These, however, were not Mr. Wordsworth's objects. He chose low and rustic life, because in that condition the essential passions of the heart find a better soil, in which they can attain their maturity, are less under restraint, and speak a plainer and more emphatic language, because in that condition of life our elementary feelings coexist in a state of greater simplicity and consequently may be more accurately contemplated, and more forcibly communicated, because the manners of rural life germinate from those elementary feelings, and from the necessary character of rural occupations are more easily comprehended, and are more durable, and lastly, because in that condition the passions of men are incorporated with the beautiful and permanent forms of nature. Now it is clear to me, that in the most interesting of the poems, in which the author is more or less dramatic, as the brothers, Michael, Ruth, the mad mother, and others, the persons introduced are by no means taken from low or rustic life in the common acceptation of those words. And it is not less clear, that the sentiments and language, 
as far as they can be conceived to have been really transferred from the minds and conversation of such persons, are attributable to causes and circumstances not necessarily connected with their occupations and abode. The thoughts, feelings, language, and manners of the shepherd farmers in the vales of Cumberland and Westmoreland, as far as they are actually adopted in those poems, may be accounted for from causes, which will and do produce the same results in every state of life, whether in town or country. As the two principal I rank that independence, which raises a man above servitude, or daily toil for the profit of others, yet not above the necessity of industry and a frugal simplicity of domestic life, and the accompanying unambitious, but solid and religious, education, which has rendered few books familiar, but the Bible, and the liturgy or hymn book. To this latter cause, indeed, which is so far accidental, that it is the blessing of particular countries and a particular age, not the product of particular places or employments, the poet owes the show of probability, that his personages might really feel, think, and talk with any tolerable resemblance to his representation. It is an excellent remark of Dr. Henry Moore's, that a man of confined education, but of good parts, by constant reading of the Bible will naturally form a more winning and commanding rhetoric than those that are learned, the intermixture of tongues and of artificial phrases debasing their style. It is, moreover, to be considered that to the formation of healthy feelings, and a reflecting mind, Negations involve impediments not less formidable than sophistication and vicious intermixture. I am convinced, that for the human soul to prosper in rustic life a certain vantage ground is prerequisite. It is not every man that is likely to be improved by a country life or by country labours. Education or original sensibility, or both, must pre-exist, if the changes, forms, and incidents of nature are to prove a sufficient stimulant. And where these are not sufficient, the mind contracts and hardens by want of stimulants, and the man becomes selfish, sensual, gross, and hard-hearted. Let the management of the poor laws in Liverpool, Manchester, or Bristol be compared with the ordinary dispensation of the poor rates in agricultural villages, where the farmers are the overseers and guardians of the poor. If my own experience have not been particularly unfortunate, as well as that of the many respectable country clergymen with whom I have conversed on the subject, the result would engender more than scepticism concerning the desirable influences of low and rustic life in and for itself. Whatever may be concluded on the other side, from the stronger local attachments and enterprising spirit of the Swiss, and other mountaineers, applies to a particular mode of pastoral life, under forms of property that permit and beget manners truly republican, not to rustic life in general, or to the absence of artificial cultivation. On the contrary the mountaineers, whose manners have been so often eulogized, are in general better educated and greater readers than men of equal rank elsewhere. But where this is not the case, as among the peasantry of North Wales, the ancient mountains, with all their terrors and all their glories, are pictures to the blind, and music to the deaf. I should not have entered so much into detail upon this passage, but here seems to be the point, 
to which all the lines of difference converge as to their source and center, I mean, as far as, and in whatever respect, my poetic creed does differ from the doctrines promulgated in this preface. I adopt with full faith, the principle of Aristotle, that poetry, as poetry, is essentially ideal, that it avoids and excludes all accident, that its apparent individualities of rank, character, or occupation must be representative of a class, and that the persons of poetry must be clothed with generic attributes, with the common attributes of the class, not with such as one gifted individual might possibly possess, but such as from his situation it is most probable beforehand that he would possess. If my premises are right and my deductions legitimate, it follows that there can be no poetic medium between the swains of Theocritus and those of an imaginary golden age. The characters of the vicar and the shepherd mariner in the poem of the brothers, and that of the shepherd of Green Headgill in the Michael, have all the verisimilitude and representative quality that the purposes of poetry can require. They are persons of a known and abiding class, and their manners and sentiments the natural product of circumstances common to the class. Take Michael for instance, an old man stout of heart, and strong of limb. His bodily frame had been from youth to age of an unusual strength. His mind was keen, intense, and frugal, apt for all affairs, and in his shepherd's calling he was prompt and watchful more than ordinary men. Hence he had learned the meaning of all winds, of blasts of every tone, and oftentimes when others he did not, he heard the South make subterraneous music like the noise of bagpipers on distant highland hills. The shepherd, at such warning, of his flock bed out him, and he to himself would say, The winds are now devising work for me. And truly, at all times, the storm, that drives the traveller to a shelter, summoned him up to the mountains. He had been alone amid the heart of many thousand mists, that came to him and left him on the heights. So lived he, until his eightieth year was past. And grossly that man errs, who should suppose that the green valleys, and the streams and rocks, were things indifferent to the shepherd's thoughts. Fields where with cheerful spirits he had breathed the common air, the hills, which he so oft had climbed with vigorous steps, which had impressed so many incidents upon his mind of hardship, skill or courage, joy or fear, which, like a book, preserved the memory of the dumb animals, whom he had saved, had fed or sheltered, linking to such acts so grateful in themselves, the certainty of honourable gain, these fields, these hills which were his living being, even more than his own blood, what? Could they less? Had laid strong hold on his affections, were to him a pleasurable feeling of blind love, the pleasure which there is in life itself. On the other hand, in the poems which are pitched in a lower key, as the Harry Gill, and the Idiot Boy, the feelings are those of human nature in general, though the poet has judiciously laid the scene in the country, in order to place himself in the vicinity of interesting images, without the necessity of ascribing a sentimental perception of their beauty to the persons of his drama. In the Idiot Boy, Indeed, the mother's character is not so much the real and native product of a situation where the essential passions of the heart find a better soil, 
in which they can attain their maturity and speak a plainer and more emphatic language as it is an impersonation of an instinct abandoned by judgment. Hence the two following charges seem to me not wholly groundless, at least, they are the only plausible objections, which I have heard to that fine poem. The one is, that the author has not, in the poem itself, taken sufficient care to preclude from the reader's fancy the disgusting images of ordinary morbid idiocy which yet it was by no means his intention to represent. He was even by the burr, burr, burr uncounteracted by any preceding description of the boy's beauty, assisted in recalling them. The other is, that the idiocy of the boy is so evenly balanced by the folly of the mother as to present to the general reader rather a laughable burlesque on the blindness of anile dotage, than an analytic display of maternal affection in its ordinary workings. In The Thorn, the poet himself acknowledges in a note the necessity of an introductory poem, in which he should have portrayed the character of the person from whom the words of the poem are supposed to proceed a superstitious man moderately imaginative, of slow faculties and deep feelings, a captain of a small trading vessel, for example, who, being past the middle age of life, had retired upon an annuity, or small independent income, to some village or country town of which he was not a native or in which he had not been accustomed to live. Such men having nothing to do become credulous and talkative from indolence. But in a poem, still more in a lyric poem, and the nurse in Romeo and Juliet alone prevents me from extending the remark even to dramatic poetry, if indeed even the nurse can be deemed altogether a case in point. It is not possible to imitate truly a dull and garrulous discourser, without repeating the effects of dullness and garrulity. However this may be, I dare assert, that the parts, and these form the far larger portion of the whole, which might as well or still better have proceeded from the poet's own imagination, and have been spoken in his own character are those which have given, and which will continue to give, universal delight, and that the passages exclusively appropriate to the supposed narrator, such as the last couplet of the third stanza, 64, the seven last lines of the tenth, 65, and the five following stanzas with the exception of the four admirable lines at the commencement of the fourteenth, are felt by many unprejudiced and unsophisticated hearts, as sudden and unpleasant sinkings from the height to which the poet had previously lifted them, and to which he again re-elevates both himself and his reader. If then I am compelled to doubt the theory, by which the choice of characters was to be directed, not only a priori, from grounds of reason, but both from the few instances in which the poet himself need be supposed to have been governed by it, and from the comparative inferiority of those instances, still more must I hesitate in my assent to the sentence which immediately follows the former citation and which I can neither admit as particular fact, nor as general rule. The language, too, of these men has been adopted, purified indeed from what appear to be its real defects, from all lasting and rational causes of dislike or disgust, because such men hourly communicate with the best objects from which the best part of language is originally derived and because, from their rank in society and the sameness and narrow circle of their intercourse, 
being less under the action of social vanity, they convey their feelings and notions in simple and unelaborated expressions. To this I reply, that a rustic's language, purified from all provincialism and grossness, and so far reconstructed as to be made consistent with the rules of grammar, which are in essence no other than the laws of universal logic, applied to psychological materials, will not differ from the language of any other man of common sense, however learned or refined he may be, except as far as the notions, which the rustic has to convey, are fewer and more indiscriminate. This will become still clearer, if we add the consideration, equally important though less obvious, that the rustic, from the more imperfect development of his faculties, and from the lower state of their cultivation, aims almost solely to convey insulated facts, either those of his scanty experience or his traditional belief, while the educated man chiefly seeks to discover and express those connections of things, or those relative bearings of fact to fact, from which some more or less general law is deducible. For facts are valuable to a wise man, chiefly as they lead to the discovery of the indwelling law, which is the true being of things, the sole solution of their modes of existence, and in the knowledge of which consists our dignity and our power. As little can I agree with the assertion, that from the objects with which the rustic hourly communicates the best part of language is formed. For first, if to communicate with an object implies such an acquaintance with it, as renders it capable of being discriminately reflected on, the distinct knowledge of an uneducated rustic would furnish a very scanty vocabulary. The few things and modes of action requisite for his bodily conveniences would alone be individualized while all the rest of nature would be expressed by a small number of confused general terms. Secondly, I deny that the words and combinations of words derived from the objects, with which the rustic is familiar, whether with distinct or confused knowledge, can be justly said to form the best part of language. It is more than probable that many classes of the brute creation possess discriminating sounds, by which they can convey to each other notices of such objects as concern their food, shelter, or safety. Yet we hesitate to call the aggregate of such sounds a language, otherwise than metaphorically. The best part of human language, properly so called, is derived from reflection on the acts of the mind itself. It is formed by a voluntary appropriation of fixed symbols to internal acts, to processes and results of imagination, the greater part of which have no place in the consciousness of uneducated man, though in civilized society by imitation and passive remembrance of what they hear from their religious instructors and other superiors, the most uneducated share in the harvest which they neither sowed, nor reaped. If the history of the phrases in hourly currency among our peasants were traced, a person not previously aware of the fact would be surprised at finding so large a number which three or four centuries ago were the exclusive property of the universities and the schools, and, at the commencement of the Reformation, had been transferred from the school to the pulpit, and thus gradually passed into common life. The extreme difficulty, and often the impossibility, 
of finding words for the simplest moral and intellectual processes of the languages of uncivilized tribes has proved perhaps the weightiest obstacle to the progress of our most zealous and adroit missionaries. Yet these tribes are surrounded by the same nature as our peasants are, but in still more impressive forms, and they are, moreover, obliged to particularize many more of them. When, therefore, Mr. Wordsworth adds, accordingly, such a language, meaning, as before, the language of rustic life purified from provincialism, arising out of repeated experience and regular feelings, is a more permanent, and a far more philosophical language, than that which is frequently substituted for it by poets, who think that they are conferring honor upon themselves and their art in proportion as they indulge in arbitrary and capricious habits of expression, it may be answered that the language, which he has in view, can be attributed to rustics with no greater right than the style of Hooker or Bacon to Tom Brown or Sir Roger L. Strange. Doubtless, if what is peculiar to each were omitted in each, the result must needs be the same. Further, that the poet, who uses an illogical diction, or a style fitted to excite only the low and changeable pleasure of wonder by means of groundless novelty, substitutes a language of folly and vanity, not for that of the rustic, but for that of good sense and natural feeling. Here let me be permitted to remind the reader, that the positions, which I controvert, are contained in the sentences, a selection of the real language of men, the language of these men, that is, men in low and rustic life, has been adopted, I have proposed to myself to imitate, and, as far as is possible, to adopt the very language of men. Between the language of prose and that of metrical composition, there neither is, nor can be, any essential difference it is against these exclusively that my opposition is directed. I object, in the very first instance, to an equivocation in the use of the word real. Every man's language varies, according to the extent of his knowledge, the activity of his faculties, and the depth or quickness of his feelings. Every man's language has, first, its individualities, secondly, the common properties of the class to which he belongs, and thirdly, words and phrases of universal use. The language of Hooker, Bacon, Bishop Taylor, and Burke differs from the common language of the learned class only by the superior number and novelty of the thoughts and relations which they had to convey. The language of Algernon Sidney differs not at all from that, which every well-educated gentleman would wish to write, and, with due allowances for the undeliberateness, and less connected train, of thinking natural and proper to conversation, such as he would wish to talk. Neither one nor the other differ half as much from the general language of cultivated society, as the language of Mr. Wordsworth's homeliest composition differs from that of a common peasant. For real therefore, we must substitute ordinary, or lingua communis. And this, we have proved, is no more to be found in the phraseology of low and rustic life than in that of any other class. Amid the peculiarities of each and the result of course must be common to all. And assuredly the omissions and changes to be made in the language of rustics, before it could be transferred to any species of poem 
except the drama or other professed imitation, are at least as numerous and weighty, as would be required in adapting to the same purpose the ordinary language of tradesmen and manufacturers. Not to mention, that the language so highly extolled by Mr. Wordsworth varies in every county, nay in every village, according to the accidental character of the clergyman, the existence or non-existence of schools, or even, perhaps, as the exciterman, publican, and barber happen to be, or not to be, zealous politicians and readers of the weekly newspaper Pro Bono Publico. Anterior to cultivation the lingua communis of every country, as Dante has well observed, exists everywhere in parts, and nowhere as a whole. Neither is the case rendered at all more tenable by the addition of the words, in a state of excitement. For the nature of a man's words, where he is strongly affected by joy, grief, or anger, must necessarily depend on the number and quality of the general truths, conceptions and images, and of the words expressing them, with which his mind had been previously stored. For the property of passion is not to create, but to set in increased activity. At least, whatever new connections of thoughts or images, or, which is equally, if not more than equally, the appropriate effect of strong excitement, whatever generalizations of truth or experience the heat of passion may produce, yet the terms of their conveyance must have pre-existed in his former conversations and are only collected and crowded together by the unusual stimulation. It is indeed very possible to adopt in a poem the unmeaning repetitions, habitual phrases, and other blank counters, which an unfurnished or confused understanding interposes at short intervals, in order to keep hold of his subject, which is still slipping from him and to give him time for recollection, or, in mere aid of vacancy, as in the scanty companies of a country stage the same player pops backwards and forwards, in order to prevent the appearance of empty spaces, in the procession of Macbeth, or Henry VIII. But what assistance to the poet, or ornament to the poem, these can supply. I am at a loss to conjecture. Nothing assuredly can differ either in origin or in mode more widely from the apparent tautologies of intense and turbulent feeling, in which the passion is greater and of longer endurance than to be exhausted or satisfied by a single representation of the image or incident exciting it. Such repetitions I admit to be a beauty of the highest kind, as illustrated by Mr. Wordsworth himself from the Song of Deborah. At her feet he bowed, he fell, he lay down, at her feet he bowed, he fell, where he bowed, there he fell down dead. Judges v. 27 Chapter 18 Language of Metrical Composition Why and Wherein Essentially Different from That of Prose, Origin and Elements of Meter, Its Necessary Consequences, and the Conditions Thereby Imposed on the Metrical Writer in the Choice of His Diction. I conclude, therefore, that the attempt is impracticable, and that, were it not impracticable, it would still be useless. For the very power of making the selection implies the previous possession of the language selected. Or where can the poet have lived? And by what rules could he direct his choice, which would not have enabled him to select and arrange his words by the light of his own judgment? 
we do not adopt the language of a class by the mere adoption of such words exclusively, as that class would use, or at least understand, but likewise by following the order, in which the words of such men are wont to succeed each other. Now this order, in the intercourse of uneducated men, is distinguished from the diction of their superiors in knowledge and power by the greater disjunction and separation in the component parts of that, whatever it be, which they wish to communicate. There is a want of that prospectiveness of mind, that serve you, which enables a man to foresee the whole of what he is to convey, appertaining to any one point, and by this means so to subordinate and arrange the different parts according to their relative importance, as to convey it at once, and as an organized whole. Now I will take the first stanza, on which I have chanced to open, in the lyrical ballads. It is one the most simple and the least peculiar in its language. In distant countries have I been, and yet I have not often seen a healthy man, a man full grown, weep in the public roads, alone. But such a one, on English ground, and in the broad highway, I met, along the broad highway he came, his cheeks with tears were wet sturdy he seemed, though he was sad and in his arms a lamb he had. The words here are doubtless such as are current in all ranks of life, and of course not less so in the hamlet and cottage than in the shop, manufactory, college, or palace. But is this the order, in which the rustic would have placed the words? I am grievously deceived if the following less compact mode of commencing the same tale be not a far more faithful copy. I have been in a many parts, far and near, and I don't know that I ever saw before a man crying by himself in the public road, a grown man I mean, that was neither sick nor hurt etc., etc., but when I turn to the following stanza in the thorn, at all times of the day and night this wretched woman thither goes, and she is known to every star, and every wind that blows and there, beside the thorn, she sits, when the blue daylight's in the skies, and when the whirlwind's on the hill, or frosty air is keen and still, and to herself she cries, O oh misery! O oh misery! O oh woe is me! O oh misery, and compare this with the language of ordinary men, or with that which I can conceive at all likely to proceed, in real life, from such a narrator, as is supposed in the note to the poem, compare it either in the succession of the images or of the sentences, I am reminded of the sublime prayer and hymn of praise, which Milton, in opposition to an established liturgy, presents as a fair specimen of common extempore devotion, and such as we might expect to hear from every self. Inspired minister of a conventicle. And I reflect with delight, how little a mere theory, though of his own workmanship, interferes with the processes of genuine imagination in a man of true poetic genius, who possesses, as Mr. Wordsworth, if ever man did, most assuredly does possess, the vision and the faculty divine. One point then alone remains, but that the most important, its examination having been, indeed, my chief inducement for the preceding inquisition. There neither is nor can be any essential difference between the language of prose and metrical composition. Such is Mr. Wordsworth's assertion. Now prose itself, at least in all argumentative and consecutive works, differs, 
and ought to differ, from the language of conversation, even as, 66, reading ought to differ from talking. Unless therefore the difference denied be that of the mere words, as materials common to all styles of writing, and not of the style itself in the universally admitted sense of the term, it might be naturally presumed that there must exist a still greater between the ordonnance of poetic composition and that of prose, than is expected to distinguish prose from ordinary conversation. There are not, indeed, examples wanting in the history of literature, of apparent paradoxes that have summoned the public wonder as new and startling truths, but which, on examination, have shrunk into tame and harmless truisms, as the eyes of a cat, seen in the dark have been mistaken for flames of fire. But Mr. Wordsworth is among the last men, to whom a delusion of this kind would be attributed by anyone, who had enjoyed the slightest opportunity of understanding his mind and character. Where an objection has been anticipated by such an author as natural, his answer to it must needs be interpreted in some sense which either is, or has been, or is capable of being controverted. My object then must be to discover some other meaning for the term essential difference in this place, exclusive of the indistinction and community of the words themselves. For whether there ought to exist a class of words in the English, in any degree resembling the poetic dialect of the Greek and Italian, is a question of very subordinate importance. The number of such words would be small indeed, in our language, and even in the Italian and Greek, they consist not so much of different words, as of slight differences in the forms of declining and conjugating the same words, forms doubtless, which having been, at some period more or less remote, the common grammatic flexions of some tribe or province, had been accidentally appropriated to poetry by the general admiration of certain master intellects, the first established lights of inspiration, to whom that dialect happened to be native. Essence in its primary signification, means the principle of individuation, the inmost principle of the possibility of any thing, as that particular thing. It is equivalent to the idea of a thing, whenever we use the word, idea, with philosophic precision. Existence, on the other hand, is distinguished from essence by the superinduction of reality. Thus we speak of the essence, and essential properties of a circle, but we do not therefore assert, that anything, which really exists, is mathematically circular. Thus too, without any tautology we contend for the existence of the Supreme Being, that is, for a reality correspondent to the idea. There is, next, a secondary use of the word essence, in which it signifies the point or ground of contradistinction between two modifications of the same substance or subject. Thus we should be allowed to say, that the style of architecture of Westminster Abbey is essentially different from that of St. Paul, even though both had been built with blocks cut into the same form, and from the same quarry. Only in this latter sense of the term must it have been denied by Mr. Wordsworth, for in this sense alone is it affirmed by the general opinion, that the language of poetry that is the formal construction, or architecture, of the words and phrases, is essentially different from that of prose.
Now the burden of the proof lies with the Opunya, not with the supporters of the common belief. Mr. Wordsworth, in consequence, assigns as the proof of his position, that not only the language of a large portion of every good poem, even of the most elevated character, must necessarily, except with reference to the metre, in no respect differ from that of good prose, but likewise that some of the most interesting parts of the best poems will be found to be strictly the language of prose, when prose is well written. The truth of this assertion might be demonstrated by innumerable passages from almost all the poetical writings, even of Milton himself. He then quotes Gray's sonnet, In vain to me the smiling mornings shine, and reddening Phbus lifts his golden fire, the birds in vain their amorous discant join, or cheerful fields resume their green attire. These ears, alas! For other notes rapin, a different object do these eyes require. My lonely anguish melts no heart but mine, and in my breast the imperfect joys expire. Yet morning smiles the busy race to cheer, and newborn pleasure brings to happier men, the fields to all their wonted tribute bear, to warm their little loves the birds complain, I fruitless mourn to him that cannot hear, and weep the more because I weep in vain and adds the following remark, it will easily be perceived, that the only part of this sonnet which is of any value, is the lines printed in italics, it is equally obvious, that, except in the rhyme, and in the use of the single, word fruitless for fruitlessly, which is so far a defect, the language of these lines does in no respect differ from that of prose. An idealist defending his system by the fact, that when asleep we often believe ourselves awake, was well answered by his plain neighbour, ah, but when awake do we ever believe ourselves asleep? Things identical must be convertible. The preceding passage seems to rest on a similar sophism. For the question is not, whether there may not occur in prose an order of words, which would be equally proper in a poem, nor whether there are not beautiful lines and sentences of frequent occurrence in good poems, which would be equally becoming as well as beautiful in good prose for neither the one nor the other has ever been either denied or doubted by any one. The true question must be, whether there are not modes of expression, a construction, and an order of sentences, which are in their fit and natural place in a serious prose composition, but would be disproportionate and heterogeneous in metrical poetry, and, vice versa whether in the language of a serious poem there may not be an arrangement both of words and sentences, and a use and selection of, what are called, figures of speech, both as to their kind, their frequency, and their occasions, which on a subject of equal weight would be vicious and alien in correct and manly prose. I contend that in both cases this unfitness of each for the place of the other frequently will and ought to exist. And first from the origin of meter. This I would trace to the balance in the mind affected by that spontaneous effort which strives to hold in check the workings of passion. It might be easily explained likewise in what manner this salutary antagonism is assisted by the very state, which it counteracts, and how this balance of antagonists became organized into metre, in the usual acceptation of that term, by a supervening act of the will and judgment, 
consciously and for the foreseen purpose of pleasure. Assuming these principles, as the data of our argument, we deduce from them two legitimate conditions, which the critic is entitled to expect in every metrical work. First, that, as the elements of meter owe their existence to a state of increased excitement, so the meter itself should be accompanied by the natural language of excitement. Secondly, that as these elements are formed into meter artificially, by a voluntary act, with the design and for the purpose of blending delight with emotion, so the traces of present volition should throughout the metrical language be proportionately discernible. Now these two conditions must be reconciled and co-present. There must be not only a partnership, but a union, an interpenetration of passion and of will, of spontaneous impulse and of voluntary purpose. Again, this union can be manifested only in a frequency of forms and figures of speech, originally the offspring of passion, but now the adopted children of power greater than would be desired or endured, where the emotion is not voluntarily encouraged and kept up for the sake of that pleasure, which such emotion, so tempered and mastered by the will, is found capable of communicating. It not only dictates, but of itself tends to produce a more frequent employment of picturesque and vivifying language than would be natural in any other case, in which there did not exist, as there does in the present, a previous and well understood, though tacit, compact between the poet and his reader, that the latter is entitled to expect, and the former bound to supply this species and degree of pleasurable excitement. We may in some measure apply to this union the answer of Polyxens, in the winter's tale, to Petitar's neglect of the streaked gilla flowers, because she had heard it said, there is an art, which, in their piedness, shares with great creating nature. Paul. Say there be, yet nature is made better by no mean but nature makes that mean, so, or that art, which, you say, adds to nature, is an art, that nature makes. You see, sweet maid, we marry a gentler scion to the wildest stock, and make conceive a bark of baser kind by bud of nobler race. This is an art, which does mend nature, change it rather but the art itself is nature. Secondly, I argue from the effects of metre. As far as metre acts in and for itself, it tends to increase the vivacity and susceptibility both of the general feelings and of the attention. This effect it produces by the continued excitement of surprise and by the quick reciprocations of curiosity still gratified and still re-excited, which are too slight indeed to be at any one moment objects of distinct consciousness, yet become considerable in their aggregate influence. As a medicated atmosphere, or as wine during animated conversation, they act powerfully, though themselves unnoticed. Where, therefore, correspondent food and appropriate matter are not provided for the attention and feelings thus roused there must needs be a disappointment felt, like that of leaping in the dark from the last step of a staircase, when we had prepared our muscles for a leap of three or four. The discussion on the powers of metre in the preface is highly ingenious and touches at all points on truth. But I cannot find any statement of its powers considered abstractly and separately.
On the contrary Mr. Wordsworth seems always to estimate metre by the powers, which it exerts during, and, as I think, in consequence of, its combination with other elements of poetry. Thus the previous difficulty is left unanswered, what the elements are, with which it must be combined, in order to produce its own effects to any pleasurable purpose. Double and trisyllable rhymes, indeed, form a lower species of wit, and, attended to exclusively for their own sake, may become a source of momentary amusement as in poor Smart's distich to the Welsh squire who had promised him a hare, tell me, thou son of great Cadwallader, ast sent the hare, or ast thou swallowed e her? But for any poetic purposes, meter resembles, if the aptness of the simile may excuse its meanness, yeast, worthless or disagreeable by itself but giving vivacity and spirit to the liquor with which it is proportionally combined. The reference to the children in the wood by no means satisfies my judgment. We all willingly throw ourselves back for a while into the feelings of our childhood. This ballad, therefore, we read under such recollections of our own childish feelings as would equally endear to us poems, which Mr. Wordsworth himself would regard as faulty in the opposite extreme of gaudy and technical ornament. Before the invention of printing, and in a still greater degree, before the introduction of writing, meter, especially alliterative meter, whether alliterative at the beginning of the words, as in Pierce Plowman, or at the end, as in rhymes, possessed an independent value as assisting the recollection, and consequently the preservation, of any series of truths or incidents. But I am not convinced by the collation of facts, that the children in the widows either its preservation, or its popularity, to its metrical form. Mr. Marshall's repository affords a number of tales in prose inferior in pathos and general merit, some of as old a date, and many as widely popular. Tom Hiker Thrift, Jack the Giant Killer, Goody Two Shoes, and Little Red Riding Hood are formidable rivals. And that they have continued in prose cannot be fairly explained by the assumption, that the comparative meanness of their thoughts and images precluded even the humblest forms of meter. The scene of Goody Two Shoes in the church is perfectly susceptible of metrical narration, and, among the Thaumata Thaumastatata even of the present age, I do not recollect a more astonishing image than that of the whole rookery, that flew out of the giant's beard scared by the tremendous voice, with which this monster answered the challenge of the heroic Tom Hiker Thrift. If from these we turn to compositions universally, and independently of all early associations, beloved and admired, would the Maria, the monk, or the poor man's ass of stern, be read with more delight, or have a better chance of immortality, had they without any change in the diction been composed in rhyme, than in their present state. If I am not grossly mistaken, the general reply would be in the negative. Nay, I will confess, that, in Mr. Wordsworth's own volumes, the Anecdote Forefathers, Simon Lee, Alice Fell, Beggars, and the Sailor's Mother, notwithstanding the beauties which are to be found in each of them where the poet interposes the music of his own thoughts, would have been more delightful to me in prose, told and managed, as by Mr. Wordsworth they would have been, 
in a moral essay or pedestrian tour. Meter in itself is simply a stimulant of the attention, and therefore excites the question, why is the attention to be thus stimulated? Now the question cannot be answered by the pleasure of the meter itself, for this we have shown to be conditional, and dependent on the appropriateness of the thoughts and expressions, to which the metrical form is superadded. Neither can I conceive any other answer that can be rationally given, short of this, I write in meter, because I am about to use a language different from that of prose. Besides, where the language is not such, how interesting soever the reflections are, that are capable of being drawn by a philosophic mind from the thoughts or incidents of the poem the meter itself must often become feeble. Take the last three stanzas of the sailor's mother, for instance. If I could for a moment abstract from the effect produced on the author's feelings, as a man, by the incident at the time of its real occurrence, I would dare appeal to his own judgment whether in the meter itself he found a sufficient reason for their being written metrically. And, thus continuing, she said, I had a son, who many a day sailed on the seas, but he is dead, in Denmark he was cast away, and I have travelled far as Hull to see what clothes he might have left, or other property. The bird and cage they both were his twas my son's bird, and neat and trim he kept it, many voyages this singing bird hath gone with him, when last he sailed he left the bird behind, as it might be, perhaps, from bodings of his mind. He to a fellow lodger's care had left it, to be watched and fed, till he came back again, and there I found it when my son was dead, and now, God help me for my little wit. I trail it with me, sir. He took so much delight in it. If disproportioning the emphasis we read these stanzas so as to make the rhymes perceptible, even trisyllable rhymes could scarcely produce an equal sense of oddity and strangeness as we feel here in finding rhymes at all in sentences so exclusively colloquial. I would further ask whether, but for that visionary state, into which the figure of the woman and the susceptibility of his own genius had placed the poet's imagination, a state, which spreads its influence and colouring over all, that coexists with the exciting cause and in which the simplest, and the most familiar things gain a strange power of spreading or around them. 67. I would ask the poet whether he would not have felt an abrupt downfall in these verses from the preceding stanza. The ancient spirit is not dead, old times, thought I, are breathing there, proud was I that my country bred such strength a dignity so fair, she begged an alms, like one in poor estate, I looked at her again, nor did my pride abate. It must not be omitted, and is besides worthy of notice, that those stanzas furnish the only fair instance that I have been able to discover in all Mr. Wordsworth's writings, of an actual adoption, or true imitation of the real and very language of low and rustic life, freed from provincialisms. Thirdly, I deduce the position from all the causes elsewhere assigned, which render meter the proper form of poetry, and poetry imperfect and defective without meter. Meter, therefore, having been connected with poetry most often and by a peculiar fitness, whatever else is combined with meter must, though it be not itself essentially poetic, 
have nevertheless some property in common with poetry, as an intermedium of affinity, a sort, if I may dare borrow a well-known phrase from technical chemistry, of more daunt between it and the super-added meter. Now poetry, Mr. Wordsworth truly affirms, does always imply passion, which word must be here understood in its most general sense, as an excited state of the feelings and faculties. And as every passion has its proper pulse, so will it likewise have its characteristic modes of expression. But where there exists that degree of genius and talent which entitles a writer to aim at the honours of a poet, the very act of poetic composition itself is, and is allowed to imply and to produce, an unusual state of excitement, which of course justifies and demands a correspondent difference of language, as truly, though not perhaps in as marked a degree, as the excitement of love, fear, rage, or jealousy. The vividness of the descriptions or declamations in Dunn or Dreden, is as much and as often derived from the force and fervour of the describer, as from the reflections, forms or incidents, which constitute their subject and materials. The wheels take fire from the mere rapidity of their motion. To what extent, and under what modifications, this may be admitted to act, I shall attempt to define in an after remark on Mr. Wordsworth's reply to this objection, or rather on his objection to this reply, as already anticipated in his preface. Fourthly, and as intimately connected with this, if not the same argument in a more general form, I adduce the high spiritual instinct of the human being impelling us to seek unity by harmonious adjustment, and thus establishing the principle that all the parts of an organized whole must be assimilated to the more important and essential parts. This and the preceding arguments may be strengthened by the reflection, that the composition of a poem is among the imitative arts, and that imitation, as opposed to copying, consists either in the interfusion of the same throughout the radically different, or of the different throughout a base radically the same. Lastly, I appeal to the practice of the best poets of all countries and in all ages, as authorizing the opinion, deduced from all the foregoing, that in every import of the word essential, which would not here involve a mere truism, there may be, is, and ought to be an essential difference between the language of prose and of metrical composition. In Mr. Wordsworth's criticism of Gray's sonnet, the reader's sympathy with his praise or blame of the different parts is taken for granted rather perhaps too easily. He has not, at least, attempted to win or compel it by argumentative analysis. In my conception at least, the lines rejected as of no value do, with the exception of the two first differ as much and as little from the language of common life, as those which he has printed in italics as possessing genuine excellence. Of the five lines thus honourably distinguished, two of them differ from prose even more widely, than the lines which either precede or follow, in the position of the words. A different object do these eyes require. My lonely anguish melts no heart but mine, and in my breast the imperfect joys expire. But were it otherwise, what would this prove, but a truth, of which no man ever doubted, vidless eat, that there are sentences, which would be equally in their place both in verse and prose. Assuredly it does not prove the point 
which alone requires proof, namely, that there are not passages, which would suit the one and not suit the other. The first line of this sonnet is distinguished from the ordinary language of men by the epithet to mourning. For we will set aside, at present, the consideration, that the particular word smiling is hackneyed, and, as it involves a sort of personification, not quite congruous with the common and material attribute of shining. And, doubtless, this adjunction of epithets for the purpose of additional description, where no particular attention is demanded for the quality of the thing, would be noticed as giving a poetic cast to a man's conversation. Should the sportsman exclaim, Come boys, the rosy morning calls you up he will be supposed to have some song in his head. But no one suspects this, when he says, A wet morning shall not confine us to our beds. This then is either a defect in poetry, or it is not. Whoever should decide in the affirmative, I would request him to reperuse any one poem, of any confessedly great poet from Homer to Milton, or from Miss Shilas to Shakespeare, and to strike out, in thought I mean, every instance of this kind. If the number of these fancied erasures did not startle him, or if he continued to deem the work improved by their total omission, he must advance reasons of no ordinary strength and evidence, reasons grounded in the essence of human nature. Otherwise, I should not hesitate to consider him as a man not so much proof against all authority, as dead to it. The second line, and reddening Fbus lifts his golden fire, has indeed almost as many faults as words. But then it is a bad line, not because the language is distinct from that of prose, but because it conveys incongruous images, because it confounds the cause and the effect, the real thing with the personified representative of the thing, in short because it differs from the language of good sense. That the fbus is hackneyed, and a schoolboy image, is an accidental fault, dependent on the age in which the author wrote, and not deduced from the nature of the thing. That it is part of an exploded mythology, is an objection more deeply grounded. Yet when the torch of ancient learning was rekindled, so cheering were its beams, that our eldest poets, cut off by Christianity from all accredited machinery, and deprived of all acknowledged guardians and symbols of the great objects of nature, were naturally induced to adopt, as a poetic language, those fabulous personages, those forms of the 68, supernatural in nature, which had given them such dear delight in the poems of their great masters. Nay, even at this day what scholar of genial taste will not so far sympathize with them, as to read with pleasure in Petrarch, Chaucer, or Spencer, what he would perhaps condemn as puerile in a modern poet. I remember no poet whose writings would safely stand the test of Mr. Wordsworth's theory, than Spencer. Yet will Mr. Wordsworth say, that the style of the following stanza is either undistinguished from prose, and the language of ordinary life, or that it is vicious, and that the stanzas are blots in the Fairy Queen. By this the northern wagoner had set his sevenfold tum behind the steadfast star, that was in ocean waves yet never wet, 
but firm is fixed and sendeth light from far to all that in the wild deep wandering are and careful shown to clear with his note shrill had warned once that Fbus fiery carinest was climbing up the eastern hill, full envious that night so long his room did fill. At last the golden oriental gate of greatest heaven gan to open fairer, and Fbus fresh as bridegroom to his mate, came dancing forth, shaking his dewy hair, and hurled e his glistering beams through gloomy air, which when the wakeful elf perceived, straightway he started up, and did himself prepare in sun-bright arms and battailous array, for with that pagan proud he come bat will that day. On the contrary to how many passages, both in hymn books and in blank verse poems, could I, were it not invidious, direct the reader's attention, the style of which is most unpoetic, because, and only because, it is the style of prose. He will not suppose me capable of having in my mind such verses, as I put my hat upon my head and walk thee into the strand and there I met another man, whose hat was in his hand. To such specimens it would indeed be a fair and full reply, that these lines are not bad, because they are unpoetic, but because they are empty of all sense and feeling, and that it were an idle attempt to prove that an ape is not a Newton, when it is self-evident that he is not a man. But the sense shall be good and weighty, the language correct and dignified, the subject interesting and treated with feeling, and yet the style shall, notwithstanding all these merits, be justly blamable as prosaic, and solely because the words and the order of the words would find their appropriate place in prose, but are not suitable to metrical composition. The Civil Wars of Daniel is an instructive, and even interesting work, but take the following stanzas, and from the hundred instances which abound I might probably have selected others far more striking and to the end we may with better ease discern the true discourse, vouchsafe to show what were the times foregoing near to these, that these we may with better profit know. Tell how the world fell into this disease, and how so great distemperature did grow, so shall we see with what degrees it came, how things at full do soon wax out of frame. Ten kings had from the Norman conqueror reign d with intermixed d and variable fate, when England to her greatest height attained d of power, dominion, glory, wealth and state, after it had with much ado sustained e the violence of princes, with debate for titles and the often mutinies of nobles for their ancient liberties. For first, the Norman, conquering all by might, by might was fork d to keep what he had got, mixing our customs and the form of right with foreign constitutions, he had brought mastering the mighty, humbling the poorer white, by all severest means that could be wrought, and, making the succession doubtful, rent his new got state, and left it turbulent. Will it be contended on the one side, that these lines are mean and senseless? Or on the other, that they are not prosaic? and for that reason unpoetic. This poet's well-merited epithet is that of the well-languaged Daniel, but likewise, and by the consent of his contemporaries no less than of all succeeding critics, the prosaic Daniel. Yet those, who thus designate this wise and amiable writer from the frequent incorrespondency of his diction to his metre in the majority of his compositions, not only deem them valuable and interesting on other accounts, 
but willingly admit that there are to be found throughout his poems, and especially in his epistles and in his high men's triumph, many and exquisite specimens of that style which, as the neutral ground of prose and verse, is common to both. A fine and almost faultless extract, eminent as for other beauties, so for its perfection in this species of diction, may be seen in Lamb's Dramatic Specimens, a work of various interest from the nature of the selections themselves, all from the plays of Shakespeare's contemporaries, and deriving a high additional value from the notes, which are full of just and original criticism, expressed with all the freshness of originality. Among the possible effects of practical adherence to a theory that aims to identify the style of prose and verse, if it does not indeed claim for the latter a yet nearer resemblance to the average style of men in the viva voce intercourse of real life, we might anticipate the following as not the least likely to occur. It will happen, as I have indeed before observed that the meter itself, the sole acknowledged difference, will occasionally become meter to the eye only. The existence of prosaisms, and that they detract from the merit of a poem, must at length be conceded, when a number of successive lines can be rendered, even to the most delicate ear, unrecognizable as verse, or as having even been intended for verse by simply transcribing them as prose, when if the poem be in blank verse, this can be effected without any alteration, or at most by merely restoring one or two words to their proper places, from which they have been transplanted, 69, for no assignable cause or reason but that of the author's convenience, but if it be in rhyme, by the mere exchange of the final word of each line for some other of the same meaning, equally appropriate, dignified and euphonic. The answer or objection in the preface to the anticipated remark that metre paves the way to other distinctions is contained in the following words. The distinction of rhyme and metre is regular and uniform, and not like that produced by, what is usually called, poetic diction, arbitrary, and subject to infinite caprices, upon which no calculation whatever can be made. In the one case the reader is utterly at the mercy of the poet respecting what imagery or diction he may choose to connect with the passion. But is this a poet? of whom a poet is speaking. No surely. Rather of a fool or madman, or at best of a vain or ignorant fantaste. And might not brains so wild and so deficient make just the same havoc with rhymes and meters, as they are supposed to effect with modes and figures of speech? How is the reader at the mercy of such men? If he continue to read their nonsense, is it not his own fault? The ultimate end of criticism is much more to establish the principles of writing, than to furnish rules how to pass judgment on what has been written by others, if indeed it were possible that the two could be separated. But if it be asked by what principles the poet is to regulate his own style, if he do not adhere closely to the sort and order of words which he hears in the market, wake, high road, or plough field. I reply, by principles, the ignorance or neglect of which would convict him of being no poet, but a silly or presumptuous usurper of the name by the principles of grammar, logic, psychology. In one word by such a knowledge of the facts, material and spiritual, 
that most appertain to his art, as, if it have been governed and applied by good sense, and rendered instinctive by habit, becomes the representative and reward of our past conscious reasonings, insights, and conclusions, and acquires the name of taste. By what rule that does not leave the reader at the poet's mercy, and the poet at his own, is the latter to distinguish between the language suitable to suppressed, and the language, which is characteristic of indulged, anger, or between that of rage and that of jealousy? Is it obtained by wandering about in search of angry or jealous people in uncultivated society, in order to copy their words? Or not far rather by the power of imagination proceeding upon the all in each of human nature? By meditation, rather than by observation? And by the latter in consequence only of the former? as eyes, for which the former has predetermined their field of vision, and to which, as to its organ, it communicates a microscopic power. There is not, I firmly believe, a man now living, who has, from his own inward experience, a clearer intuition, than Mr. Wordsworth himself that the last mentioned are the true sources of genial discrimination. Through the same process and by the same creative agency will the poet distinguish the degree and kind of the excitement produced by the very act of poetic composition. As intuitively will he know, what differences of style it at once inspires and justifies what intermixture of conscious volition is natural to that state, and in what instances such figures and colors of speech degenerate into mere creatures of an arbitrary purpose, cold technical artifices of ornament or connection. For, even as truth is its own light and evidence, discovering at once itself and falsehood, so is it the prerogative of poetic genius to distinguish by parental instinct its proper offspring from the changelings, which the gnomes of vanity or the fairies of fashion may have laid in its cradle or called by its names. Could a rule be given from without, poetry would cease to be poetry, and sink into a mechanical art. It would be more phosis not poesis. The rules of the imagination are themselves the very powers of growth and production. The words to which they are reducible, present only the outlines and external appearance of the fruit. A deceptive counterfeit of the superficial form and colors may be elaborated, but the marble peach feels cold and heavy and children only put it to their mouths. We find no difficulty in admitting as excellent, and the legitimate language of poetic fervor self-impassioned, Dunn's apostrophe to the sun in the second stanza of his Progress of the Soul. The Eye of Heaven, this great soul envies not, by thy male force is all, we have, Bago. In the first east thou now beginnest to shine, suck est early balm and island spices there, and wilt anon in thy loose rein de career at Tagus, Po, Seine, Thames, and Danau dine, and see at night this western world of mine, yet hast thou not more nations seen than she, who before thee one day began to be, and, thy frail light being quenched thee, shall long, long outlive thee. Or the next stanza but one, great destiny, the commissary of God, that hast marked thee out a path and period for everything. Who, where we offspring took, our ways and ends seest at one instant, thou not of all causes. Thou, 
whose changeless brown air smiles nor frowns. Oh! Vouchsafe thou to look, and show my story in thy eternal book etc. As little difficulty do we find in excluding from the honours of unaffected warmth and elevation the madness prepense of pseudo-poesy, or the startling hysteric of weakness over-exerting itself, which bursts on the unprepared reader in sundry odes and apostrophes to abstract terms. Such are the odes to jealousy, to hope, to oblivion and the like, in Dodsley's collection and the magazines of that day, which seldom fail to remind me of an Oxford copy of verses on the two Suttons, commencing with inoculation, heavenly made, descend. It is not to be denied that men of undoubted talents, and even poets of true, though not of first-rate, genius have from a mistaken theory deluded both themselves and others in the opposite extreme. I once read to a company of sensible and well-educated women the introductory period of Cowley's preface to his Pindrick Odes written in imitation of the style and manner of the Odes of Pindar. If, says Cowley, a man should undertake to translate Pindar, word for word, it would be thought that one madman had translated another as may appear, when he, that understands not the original, reads the verbal traduction of him into Latin prose, than which nothing seems more raving. I then proceeded with his own free version of the Second Olympic, composed for the charitable purpose of rationalizing the Theban Eagle. Queen of all harmonious things, dancing words and speaking strings, what god, what hero, wilt thou sing? What happy man to equal glories bring? Begin, begin thy noble choice, and let the hills around reflect the image of thy voice. Pisa does to Jove belong, Jove and Pisa claim thy song. The fair first fruits of war, th Olympic Games, Alcides, offer thee up to Jove, Alcides, too, thy strings may move, but, oh, what man to join with these can worthy prove? Join Theron boldly to their sacred names, Theron the next honor claims, Theron to no man gives place is first in Pisces and in virtue's race, Theron there, and he alone, even his own swift forefathers has outgone. One of the company exclaimed, with the full assent of the rest, that if the original were madder than this, it must be incurably mad. I then translated the ode from the Greek, and as nearly as possible, word for word, and the impression was, that in the general movement of the periods, in the form of the connections and transitions, and in the sober majesty of lofty sense, it appeared to them to approach more nearly, than any other poetry they had heard, to the style of our Bible, in the prophetic books. The first strophe will suffice as a specimen, ye harp controlling hymns or, ye hymns the sovereigns of harps. What god? What hero? What man shall we celebrate? Truly Pisa indeed is of Jove, but the Olympiad, or the Olympic Games, did Hercules establish, the first fruits of the spoils of war. But Theron for the four-horsed car, that bore victory to him, it behoves us now to voice aloud, the just, the hospitable, the bulwark of Agrigentum, of renowned fathers the flower, even him who preserves his native city erect and safe. 
but are such rhetorical caprices condemnable only for their deviation from the language of real life? And are they by no other means to be precluded, but by the rejection of all distinctions between prose and verse, save that of meter? Surely good sense, and a moderate insight into the constitution of the human mind, would be amply sufficient to prove, that such language and such combinations are the native product neither of the fancy nor of the imagination, that their operation consists in the excitement of surprise by the juxtaposition and apparent reconciliation of widely different or incompatible things. As when, for instance, the hills are made to reflect the image of a voice. Surely, no unusual taste is requisite to see clearly that this compulsory juxtaposition is not produced by the presentation of impressive or delightful forms to the inward vision, nor by any sympathy with the modifying powers with which the genius of the poet had united and inspirited all the objects of his thought, that it is therefore a species of wit, a pure work of the will and implies a leisure and self-possession both of thought and of feeling, incompatible with the steady fervor of a mind possessed and filled with the grandeur of its subject. To sum up the whole in one sentence, when a poem, or a part of a poem, shall be adduced, which is evidently vicious in the figures and sentexture of its style, yet for the condemnation of which no reason can be assigned, except that it differs from the style in which men actually converse, then, and not till then, can I hold this theory to be either plausible, or practicable, or capable of furnishing either rule, guidance, or precaution, that might not, more easily and more safely, as well as more naturally, have been deduced in the author's own mind from considerations of grammar, logic, and the truth and nature of things, confirmed by the authority of works, whose fame is not of one country nor of one age. Chapter 19 Continuation Concerning the real object which, it is probable, Mr. Wordsworth had before him in his critical preface, elucidation and application of this. It might appear from some passages in the former part of Mr. Wordsworth's preface, that he meant to confine his theory of style, and the necessity of a close accordance with the actual language of men, to those particular subjects from low and rustic life which by way of experiment he had purposed to naturalize as a new species in our English poetry. But from the train of argument that follows, from the reference to Milton, and from the spirit of his critique on Gray's sonnet, those sentences appear to have been rather courtesies of modesty, than actual limitations of his system. Yet so groundless does this system appear on a close examination, and so strange and overwhelming, seventy, in its consequences, that I cannot, and I do not, believe that the poet did ever himself adopt it in the unqualified sense, in which his expressions have been understood by others, and which, indeed, according to all the common laws of interpretation they seem to bear. What then did he mean? I apprehend, that in the clear perception, not unaccompanied with disgust or contempt, of the gaudy affectations of a style which passed current with too many for poetic diction, though in truth it had as little pretensions to poetry as to logic or common sense, he narrowed his view for the time, and feeling a justifiable preference for the language of nature and of good sense, 
even in its humblest and least ornamented forms, he suffered himself to express, in terms at once too large and too exclusive, his predilection for a style the most remote possible from the false and showy splendor which he wished to explode. It is possible, that this predilection, at first merely comparative, deviated for a time into direct partiality. But the real object which he had in view, was, I doubt not, a species of excellence which had been long before most happily characterized by the judicious and amiable Gov, whose works are so justly beloved and esteemed by the Germans, in his remarks on Gelert from which the following is literally translated. The talent, that is required in order to make, excellent verses, is perhaps greater than the philosopher is ready to admit, or would find it in his power to acquire, the talent to seek only the apt expression of the thought, and yet to find at the same time with it the rhyme and the metre. Gelert possessed this happy gift, if ever any one of our poets possessed it, and nothing perhaps contributed more to the great and universal impression which his fables made on their first publication, or conduces more to their continued popularity. It was a strange and curious phenomenon, and such as in Germany had been previously unheard of to read verses in which everything was expressed just as one would wish to talk, and yet all dignified, attractive, and interesting, and all at the same time perfectly correct as to the measure of the syllables and the rhyme. It is certain, that poetry when it has attained this excellence makes a far greater impression than prose. So much so indeed that even the gratification which the very rhymes afford, becomes then no longer a contemptible or trifling gratification. 71. However novel this phenomenon may have been in Germany at the time of Gelert, it is by no means new, nor yet of recent existence in our language. Spite of the licentiousness with which Spencer occasionally compels the orthography of his words into a subservience to his rhymes, the whole fairy queen is an almost continued instance of this beauty. Waller's song Go, Lovely Rose, is doubtless familiar to most of my readers, but if I had happened to have had by me the poems of Cotton, more but far less deservedly celebrated as the author of the Virgil Travisted, I should have indulged myself, and I think have gratified many, who are not acquainted with his serious works, by selecting some admirable specimens of this style. There are not a few poems in that volume, replete with every excellence of thought, image, and passion which we expect or desire in the poetry of the milder muse, and yet so worded, that the reader sees no one reason either in the selection or the order of the words, why he might not have said the very same in an appropriate conversation, and cannot conceive how indeed he could have expressed such thoughts otherwise without loss or injury to his meaning. But in truth our language is, and from the first dawn of poetry ever has been, particularly rich in compositions distinguished by this excellence. The final E, which is now mute, in Chaucer's age was either sounded or dropped indifferently. We ourselves still use either beloved or beloved D according as the rhyme, or measure or the purpose of more or less solemnity may require. Let the reader then only adopt the pronunciation of the poet and of the court, at which he lived, both with respect to the final E and to the accentuation of the last syllable, 
I would then venture to ask, what even in the colloquial language of elegant and unaffected women, who are the peculiar mistresses of pure English and undefiled, what could we hear more natural, or seemingly more unstudied, than the following stanzas from Chaucer's Troilus and Cazide? And after this forth to the gate he went, there as Cazide out rode a full goad pass, and up and down there made he many a went, and to himself for loft he said, Alas! Fro Hennis rode my bliss and my solas as willed blissful God now for his joy, I might her sane agen come into Troy. And to the yonder HIL I gan her bide, alas! And there I took of her my lev and yond I saw her to her father ride, for Sora of which mine hurt shall to cleave, and hither home I came when it was eve, and here I dwell, outcast from ally joy, and steal, till I my sane her ift in Troy. And of himself imagined he oft to bend defated, pale and wooks in less than he was wont and that men said in soft, what may it be, who can the soth jess, why Troilus of all this heaviness? And all this then is but his melancholy, that he had of himself such fantasy. Another time imagining he would that every wight, that passed him by the way, had of him wrath, and that the I answered, I am right sorry. Troilus Walde. And thus he drove a die yet forth or twee, as ye have heard, such life gan he to lead as he that stowed betwixt in hope and dread, for which him licked in his song is shoot he a chinchison of his woe as he best might, and made a song of words but a few, so would his woeful hurt for to light. And when he was from every man's sight with soft voice he of his lady dear, that absent was, gan sing as ye may hear, asterisk 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 this song, when he thus song in had, full bone he fill agen into his sighs oldie. And every night, as was his wont to done, he stowed the bright moon to behold and all his sorrow to the moon he told, and said, I wis, when thou art horned new, I shall be glad, if all the world be true. Another exquisite master of this species of style, where the scholar and the poet supplies the material, but the perfect well-bred gentleman the expressions and the arrangement, is George Herbert. As from the nature of the subject, and the too frequent quaintness of the thoughts, his temple, or sacred poems and private ejaculations are comparatively but little known, I shall extract two poems. The first is a sonnet, equally admirable for the weight, number, and expression of the thoughts, and for the simple dignity of the language. Unless, indeed, a fastidious taste should object to the latter half of the sixth line. The second is a poem of greater length, which I have chosen not only for the present purpose, but likewise as a striking example and illustration of an assertion hazarded in a former page of these sketches namely that the characteristic fault of our elder poets is the reverse of that, which distinguishes too many of our more recent versifiers, the one conveying the most fantastic thoughts in the most correct and natural language, the other in the most fantastic language conveying the most trivial thoughts. The latter is a riddle of words the former an enigma of thoughts. The one reminds me of an odd passage in Drayton's ideas as other men, so I myself do muse, why in this sort I rest invention so, and why these giddy metaphors I use, leaving the path the greater part do go, 
I will resolve you, I am lunatic. 72. The other recalls a still odder passage in the synagogue, or the shadow of the temple, a connected series of poems in imitation of Herbert's temple, and, in some editions, annexed to it. Oh how my mind is gravelly! Not a thought, that I can find, but's ravelly all to naught. Short ends of threads, and narrow shreds of lists, knots, snarled ruffs, loose broken tufts of twists, are my torn meditation's ragged clothing, which, wound and woven, shape a suit for nothing. One while I think, and then I am in pain to think how to unthink that thought again. Immediately after these burlesque passages I cannot proceed to the extracts promised, without changing the ludicrous tone of feeling by the interposition of the three following stanzas of Herbert's. Virtue Sweet day, so cool, so calm so bright, the bridal of the earth and sky, the dew shall weep thy fall tonight, for thou must die. Sweet rose, whose hue angry and brave bids the rush gazer wipe his eye thy root is ever in its grave, and thou must die. Sweet spring, full of sweet days and roses, a box, where sweets compacted lie my music shows. Ye have your closes, and all must die. The Bosom Sin, a sonnet by George Herbert Lord, with what carest thou begirt us round? Parents first season us, then schoolmasters deliver us to laws. They send us bound to rules of reason, holy messengers, pulpits and Sundays, sorrow-dogging sin affliction sorted, anguish of all sizes, fine nets and stratagems to catch us in, Bibles laid open, millions of surprises, blessings beforehand, ties of gratefulness, the sound of glory ringing in our ears without, our shame, within, our consciences, angels and grace, eternal hopes and fears. Yet all these fences and their whole array one cunning bosom sin blows quite away. Love unknown. Dear friend, sit down. The tale is long and sad and in my faintings, I presume, your love will more comply than help. A lord I had, and have, of whom some grounds, which may improve, I hold for two lives and both lives in me. To him I brought a dish of fruit one day, and in the middle placed my heart. But he, I sigh to say, look thee on a servant, who did know his eye, better than you know me, or, which is one, than I myself. The servant instantly, quitting the fruit, sees thee on my heart alone, and threw it in a font, wherein did fall a stream of blood, which issued from the side of a great rock, I well remember all, and have good cause, there it was dipped and dyed, and washed thee, and wrung, the very ringing yet in forceth tears. Your heart was foul, I fear. Indeed tis true. I did and do commit many a fault, more than my lease will bear, yet still ask thee pardon, and was not denied. But you shall hear. After my heart was well, and clean and fair, as I one event heed, I sigh to tell, walk thee by myself abroad, I saw a large and spacious furnace flaming, and thereon a boiling cauldron, round about whose verge was in great letters set affliction. The greatness showed thee the owner. So I went to fetch a sacrifice out of my fold, thinking with that, which I did thus present, to warm his love, 
which, I did fear, grew cold. But as my heart did tender it, the man who was to take it from me, slipped his hand, and threw my heart into the scalding pan, my heart that brought it, do you understand? The offerer's heart. Your heart was hard, I fear. Indeed tease true. I found a callous matter began to spread and to expatiate there, but with a richer drug than scalding water I bathed it often, even with holy blood, which at a board, while many drank bare wine, a friend did steal into my cup for good, even taken inwardly, and most divine to supple hardnesses. But at the length out of the cauldron getting, soon I fled unto my house, where to repair the strength which I had lost, I haste to my bed, but when I thought to sleep out all these faults, I sigh to speak, I found that some had stuffed e the bed with thoughts, I would say thorns. Dear, could my heart not break, when with my pleasures even my rest was gone? Full well I understood who had been there, for I had given the key to none but one, it must be he. Your heart was dull, I fear. Indeed a slack and sleepy state of mind did oft possess me, so that when I prayed e, though my lips went, my heart did stay behind. But all my scores were by another paid, who took my guilt upon him. Truly, friend, for aught I hear, your master shows to you more favour than you wot of. Mark the end. The font did only what was old renew the cauldron suppled what was grown too hard, the thorns did quicken what was grown too dull, all did but strive to mend what you had mardy. Wherefore be cheered ye, and praise him to the full each day, each hour, each moment of the week who fain would have you be new, tender quick. Chapter XX The former subject continued, the neutral style, or that common to prose and poetry, exemplified by specimens from Chaucer, Herbert, and others. I have no fear in declaring my conviction, that the excellence defined and exemplified in the preceding chapter is not the characteristic excellence of Mr. Wordsworth's style, because I can add with equal sincerity, that it is precluded by higher powers. The praise of uniform adherence to genuine, logical English is undoubtedly his, nay, laying the main emphasis on the word uniform. I will dare add that, of all contemporary poets, it is his alone. For, in a less absolute sense of the word, I should certainly include Mr. Bowie's, Lord Byron, and, as to all his later writings, Mr. Southey, the exceptions in their works being so few and unimportant but of the specific excellence described in the quotation from Gov, I appear to find more, and more undoubted specimens in the works of others, for instance, among the minor poems of Mr. Thomas More, and of our illustrious laureate. To me it will always remain a singular and noticeable fact, that a theory, which would establish this lingua communis, not only as the best, but as the only commendable style, should have proceeded from a poet, whose diction, next to that of Shakespeare and Milton, appears to me of all others the most individualized and characteristic. And let it be remembered too, that I am now interpreting the controverted passages of Mr. Wordsworth's critical preface by the purpose and object, which he may be supposed to have intended, rather than by the sense which the words themselves must convey, 
if they are taken without this allowance. A person of any taste, who had but studied three or four of Shakespeare's principal plays, would without the name affixed scarcely fail to recognize as Shakespeare's a quotation from any other play, though but of a few lines. A similar peculiarity, though in a less degree, attends Mr. Wordsworth's style, whenever he speaks in his own person, or whenever, though under a feigned name, it is clear that he himself is still speaking, as in the different dramatis personae of the recluse. Even in the other poems, in which he purposes to be most dramatic, there are few in which it does not occasionally burst forth. The reader might often address the poet in his own words with reference to the persons introduced, it seems, as I retrace the ballad line by line that but half of it is theirs, and the better half is thine. Who, having been previously acquainted with any considerable portion of Mr. Wordsworth's publications, and having studied them with a full feeling of the author's genius, would not at once claim as words worthy in the little poem on the rainbow. The child is father of the man, etc. Or in the Lucy Gray. No mate, no comrade Lucy knew, she dwelt on a wide moor, the sweetest thing that ever grew beside a human door or in the idle shepherd boys. Along the river's stony marge the sand lark chants a joyous song, the thrush is busy in the wood, and carols loud and strong. A thousand lambs are on the rocks, all newly born. Both earth and sky keep jubilee, and more than all, those boys with their green coronal, they never hear the cry that plaintive cry, which up the hill comes from the depth of Dungeon Gill. Need I mention the exquisite description of the sea lock in the blind Highland boy? Who but a poet tells a tale in such language to the little ones by the fireside as, yet had he many a restless dream, both when he heard the eagle's scream, and when he heard the torrent's roar and heard the water beat the shore near where their cottage stood. Beside a lake their cottage stood, not small like ours, a peaceful flood, but one of mighty size, and strange, that, rough or smooth, is full of change, and stirring in its bed. For to this lake, by night and day, the great sea water finds its way through long, long windings of the hills, and drinks up all the pretty rills and rivers large and strong, then hurries back the road it came returns on errand still the same, this did it when the earth was new, and this forevermore will do, as long as earth shall last. And, with the coming of the tide, Come boats and ships that sweetly ride, between the woods and lofty rocks, and to the shepherds with their flocks bring tales of distant lands. I might quote almost the whole of his Ruth, but take the following stanzas, but, as you have before been told, this stripling, sportive, gay, and bold, and, with his dancing crest, so beautiful, through savage lands had roamed about with vagrant bands of Indians in the west. The wind, the tempest roaring high, the tumult of a tropic sky, might well be dangerous food for him, a youth to whom was given so much of earth, so much of heaven, and such impetuous blood. Whatever in those climes he found irregular in sight or sound did to his mind impart a kindred impulse, seemed allied to his own powers, and justified the workings of his heart. Nor less, to feed voluptuous thought, 
the beauteous forms of nature wrought, fair trees and lovely flowers, the breezes their own languor lent, the stars had feelings, which they sent into those magic bowers. Yet in his worst pursuits, I ween, that sometimes there did intervene pure hopes of high intent for passions linked to forms so fair and stately, needs must have their share of noble sentiment. But from Mr. Wordsworth's more elevated compositions, which already form three-fourths of his works, and will, I trust, constitute hereafter a still larger proportion, from these, whether in rhyme or blank verse, it would be difficult and almost superfluous to select instances of a diction peculiarly his own, of a style which cannot be imitated without its being at once recognized, as originating in Mr. Wordsworth. It would not be easy to open on any one of his loftier strains, that does not contain examples of this, and more in proportion as the lines are more excellent, and most like the author. For those, who may happen to have been less familiar with his writings, I will give three specimens taken with little choice. The first from the lines on the boy of Winandamir, who blew mimic hootings to the silent owls, that they might answer him dot, and they would shout across the watery vale, and shout again, with long halloos, and screams, and echoes loud redoubled and redoubled, concourse wild of mirth and jocund din. And when it chanced, that pauses of deep silence mocked his skill, then sometimes in that silence, while he hung listening, a gentle shock of mild surprise has carried far into his heart the voice of mountain torrents, or the visible scene, 73, would enter unawares into his mind with all its solemn imagery, its rocks, its woods, and that uncertain heaven, received into the bosom of the steady lake. The second shall be that noble imitation of Drayton, 74, if it was not rather a coincidence, in the lines to Joanna. When I had gazed perhaps two minutes' space, Joanna, looking in my eyes, beheld that ravishment of mine, and laughed aloud. The rock like something starting from a sleep, took up the lady's voice, and laughed again. That ancient woman seated on Helm Crag was ready with her cavern, Hamaskar and the tall steep of Silver Howe sent forth a noise of laughter, Southern Logbrig heard, and Fairfield answered with a mountain tone. Helvelin far into the clear blue sky carried the lady's voice, old Skidor blew his speaking trumpet, back out of the clouds from Glaramara southward came the voice, and Kirkston tossed it from its misty head. The third, which is in rhyme, I take from the song at the feast of Broom Castle, upon the restoration of Lord Clifford, the shepherd to the estates and honours of his ancestors. Now another day is come, fitter hope, and nobler doom, he hath thrown aside his crook, and hath buried deep his book, armour rusting in his halls on the blood of Clifford calls, quell the Scot exclaims the lance. Bear me to the heart of France, is the longing of the shield, tell thy name, Thou trembling field, field of death, where thou be, grown thou with our victory. Happy day, and mighty hour, when our shepherd, in his power, mailed and horsed, with lance and sword, to his ancestors restored, like a reappearing star, like a glory from afar, first shall head the flock of war. Alas! The fervent harper did not know, that for a tranquil soul the lay was framed, who, 
long compelled in humble walks to go, was softened into feeling, soothed, and tamed. Love had he found in huts where poor men lie, his daily teachers had been woods and rills, the silence that is in the starry sky, the sleep that is among the lonely hills. The words themselves in the foregoing extracts, are, no doubt, sufficiently common for the greater part. Dot. But in what poem are they not so, if we accept a few misadventurous attempts to translate the arts and sciences into verse? In the excursion the number of polysyllabic, or what the common people call, dictionary, words is more than usually great. And so must it needs be, in proportion to the number and variety of an author's conceptions, and his solicitude to express them with precision. Dot. But are those words in those places commonly employed in real life to express the same thought or outward thing? Are they the style used in the ordinary intercourse of spoken words? No. Nor are the modes of connections, and still less the breaks and transitions. Would any but a poet, at least could any one without being conscious that he had expressed himself with noticeable vivacity, have described a bird singing loud by, the thrush is busy in the wood or have spoken of boys with a string of club moss round their rusty hats, as the boys with their green coronal, or have translated a beautiful May Day into both earth and sky keep jubilee, or have brought all the different marks and circumstances of a sea lock before the mind, as the actions of a living and acting power or have represented the reflection of the sky in the water, as that uncertain heaven received into the bosom of the steady lake. Even the grammatical construction is not unfrequently peculiar, as the wind, the tempest roaring high, the tumult of a tropic sky, might well be dangerous food to him, a youth to whom was given, etc. There is a peculiarity in the frequent use of the asymartaeton, that is, the omission of the connective particle before the last of several words, or several sentences used grammatically as single words, all being in the same case and governing or governed by the same verb, and not less in the construction of words by apposition, to him, a youth. In short, were there excluded from Mr. Wordsworth's poetic compositions all, that a literal adherence to the theory of his preface would exclude, two-thirds at least of the marked beauties of his poetry must be erased. For a far greater number of lines would be sacrificed than in any other recent poet because the pleasure received from Wordsworth's poems being less derived either from excitement of curiosity or the rapid flow of narration, the striking passages form a larger proportion of their value. I do not adduce it as a fair criterion of comparative excellence, nor do I even think it such, but merely as matter of fact. I affirm that from no contemporary writer could so many lines be quoted, without reference to the poem in which they are found, for their own independent weight or beauty. From the sphere of my own experience I can bring to my recollection three persons of no everyday powers and acquirements, who had read the poems of others with more and more unallayed pleasure and had thought more highly of their authors, as poets, who yet have confessed to me, that from no modern work had so many passages started up anew in their minds at different times, and as different occasions had awakened a meditative mood. 
Chapter XXI Remarks on the Present Mode of Conducting Critical Journals Long have I wished to see a fair and philosophical inquisition into the character of Wordsworth, as a poet, on the evidence of his published works, and a positive, not a comparative, appreciation of their characteristic excellences, deficiencies, and defects. I know no claim that the mere opinion of any individual can have to weigh down the opinion of the author himself, against the probability of whose parental partiality we ought to set that of his having thought longer and more deeply on the subject. But I should call that investigation fair and philosophical in which the critic announces and endeavours to establish the principles which he holds for the foundation of poetry in general, with the specification of these in their application to the different classes of poetry. Having thus prepared his canons of criticism for praise and condemnation, he would proceed to particularize the most striking passages to which he deems them applicable faithfully noticing the frequent or infrequent recurrence of similar merits or defects, and as faithfully distinguishing what is characteristic from what is accidental, or a mere flagging of the wing. Then if his premises be rational, his deductions legitimate, and his conclusions justly applied, the reader, and possibly the poet himself, may adopt his judgment in the light of judgment and in the independence of free agency. If he has erred, he presents his errors in a definite place and tangible form, and holds the torch and guides the way to their detection. I most willingly admit, and estimate at a high value, the services which the Edinburgh Review and others formed afterwards on the same plan, have rendered to society in the diffusion of knowledge. I think the commencement of the Edinburgh Review an important epoch in periodical criticism, and that it has a claim upon the gratitude of the literary republic, and indeed of the reading public at large, for having originated the scheme of reviewing those books only which are susceptible and deserving of argumentative criticism. Not less meritorious, and far more faithfully and in general far more ably executed, is their plan of supplying the vacant place of the trash or mediocrity, wisely left to sink into oblivion by its own weight, with original essays on the most interesting subjects of the time, religious, or political, in which the titles of the books or pamphlets prefixed furnish only the name and occasion of the disquisition. I do not arraign the keenness, or asperity of its damnatory style, in and for itself, as long as the author is addressed or treated as the mere impersonation of the work then under trial. I have no quarrel with them on this account as long as no personal allusions are admitted, and no recommitment, for new trial, of juvenile performances, that were published, perhaps forgotten, many years before the commencement of the review, since for the forcing back of such works to public notice no motives are easily assignable but such as are furnished to the critic by his own personal malignity, or what is still worse, by a habit of malignity in the form of mere wantonness. No private grudge they need, no personal spite the viva sexio is its own delight. All enmity, all envy, they disclaim, disinterested thieves of our good name, cool sober murderers of their neighbor's fame. STC. Every censure, every sarcasm respecting a publication which the critic, with the criticized work before him, 
can make good, is the critic's right. The writer is authorized to reply, but not to complain. Neither can anyone prescribe to the critic, how soft or how hard, how friendly, or how bitter, shall be the phrases which he is to select for the expression of such reprehension or ridicule. The critic must know what effect it is his object to produce, and with a view to this effect must he weigh his words. But as soon as the critic betrays that he knows more of his author than the author's publications could have told him, as soon as from this more intimate knowledge elsewhere obtained, he avails himself of the slightest tray against the author. His censure instantly becomes personal injury, his sarcasms personal insults. He ceases to be a critic, and takes on him the most contemptible character to which a rational creature can be degraded, that of a gossip, backbiter, and pesquillant, but with this heavy aggravation, that he steals the unquiet the deforming passions of the world into the museum, into the very place which, next to the chapel and oratory, should be our sanctuary, and secure place of refuge, offers abominations on the altar of the muses, and makes its sacred paling the very circle in which he conjures up the lying and profane spirit. This determination of unlicensed personality, and of permitted and legitimate censure, which I owe in part to the illustrious Lessing, himself a model of acute, spirited, sometimes stinging, but always argumentative and honorable, criticism, is beyond controversy the true one, and though I would not myself exercise all the rights of the latter, yet, let but the former be excluded, I submit myself to its exercise in the hands of others, without complaint and without resentment. Let a communication be formed between any number of learned men in the various branches of science and literature, and whether the President and Central Committee be in London, or Edinburgh if only they previously lay aside their individuality, and pledge themselves inwardly, as well as ostensibly, to administer judgment according to a constitution and code of laws, and if by grounding this code on the twofold basis of universal morals and philosophic reason, independent of all foreseen application to particular works and authors, they obtain the right to speak each as the representative of their body corporate, they shall have honor and good wishes from me, and I shall accord to them their fair dignities, though self-assumed, not less cheerfully than if I could inquire concerning them in the herald's office, or turn to them in the book of peerage. However loud may be the outcries for prevented or subverted reputation, however numerous and impatient the complaints of merciless severity and insupportable despotism, I shall neither feel, nor utter aught but to the defense and justification of the critical machine. Should any literary quixote find himself provoked by its sounds and regular movements, I should admonish him with Sanko Panza, that it is no giant but a windmill, there it stands on its own place, and its own hillock, never goes out of its way to attack anyone, and to none and from none either gives or asks assistance. When the public press has poured in any part of its produce between its millstones, it grinds it off. One man sack the same as another, and with whatever wind may happen to be then blowing. All the two and thirty winds are alike its friends.
of the whole wide atmosphere it does not desire a single finger breadth more than what is necessary for its sails to turn round in. But this space must be left free and unimpeded. Gnats, beetles, wasps, butterflies, and the whole tribe of ephemerals and insignificance, may flit in and out and between, may hum, and buzz, and jar, may shrill their tiny pipes, and wind their puny horns, unchastised and unnoticed. But idlers and bravados of larger size and prouder show must beware, how they place themselves within its sweep. Much less may they presume to lay hands on the sails, the strength of which is neither greater nor less than as the wind is, which drives them round. Whomsoever the remorseless arm slings aloft, or whirls along with it in the air, he has himself alone to blame, though, when the same arm throws him from it, it will more often double than break the force of his fall. Putting aside the too manifest and too frequent interference of national party, and even personal predilection or aversion, and reserving for deeper feelings those worse and more criminal intrusions into the sacredness of private life, which not seldom merit legal rather than literary chastisement. The two principal objects and occasions which I find for blame and regret in the conduct of the review in question are first, its unfaithfulness to its own announced and excellent plan, by subjecting, to criticism works neither indecent nor immoral, yet of such trifling importance even in point of size and, according to the critic's own verdict, so devoid of all merit, as must excite in the most candid mind the suspicion, either that dislike or vindictive feelings were at work or that there was a cold prudential predetermination to increase the sale of the review by flattering the malignant passions of human nature. That I may not myself become subject to the charge, which I am bringing against others, by an accusation without proof, I refer to the article on Dr. Reynolds' sermon in the very first number of the Edinburgh Review as an illustration of my meaning. If in looking through all the succeeding volumes the reader should find this a solitary instance, I must submit to that painful forfeiture of esteem, which awaits a groundless or exaggerated charge. The second point of objection belongs to this review only in common with all other works of periodical criticism, at least, it applies in common to the general system of all, whatever exception there may be in favour of particular articles. Or if it attaches to the Edinburgh Review, and to its only co-rival, the Quarterly, with any peculiar force, this results from the superiority of talent, acquirement, and information which both have so undeniably displayed, and which doubtless deepens the regret though not the blame. I am referring to the substitution of assertion for argument, to the frequency of arbitrary and sometimes petulant verdicts not seldom unsupported even by a single quotation from the work condemned, which might at least have explained the critic's meaning, if it did not prove the justice of his sentence. Even where this is not the case, the extracts are too often made without reference to any general grounds or rules from which the faultiness or inadmissibility of the qualities attributed may be deduced, and without any attempt to show that the qualities are attributable to the passage extracted. I have met with such extracts from Mr. Wordsworth's poems, annexed to such assertions, has led me to imagine, that the reviewer, 
having written his critique before he had read the work, had then pricked with a pin for passages, wherewith to illustrate the various branches of his preconceived opinions. By what principle of rational choice can we suppose a critic to have been directed, at least in a Christian country, and himself, we hope, a Christian, who gives the following lines? portraying the fervour of solitary devotion excited by the magnificent display of the Almighty's works, as a proof and example of an author's tendency to downright ravings, and absolute unintelligibility. Oh then what soul was his, when on the tops of the high mountains he beheld the sun rise up, and bathed the world in light. He looked, ocean and earth, the solid frame of earth, and ocean's liquid mass, beneath him lay in gladness and deep joy. The clouds were touched, and in their silent faces did he read unutterable love. Sound needed none, nor any voice of joy, his spirit drank the spectacle. Sensation, soul, and form all melted into him, they swallowed up his animal being, in them did he live, and by them did he live, they were his life. Can it be expected, that either the author or his admirers, should be induced to pay any serious attention to decisions which prove nothing but the pitiable state of the critic's own taste and sensibility? On opening the review they see a favourite passage, of the force and truth of which they had an intuitive certainty in their own inward experience confirmed, if confirmation it could receive, by the sympathy of their most enlightened friends, some of whom perhaps, even in the world's opinion, hold a higher intellectual rank than the critic himself would presume to claim and this very passage they find selected, as the characteristic effusion of a mind deserted by reason, as furnishing evidence that the writer was raving, or he could not have thus strung words together without sense or purpose. No diversity of taste seems capable of explaining such a contrast in judgment. That I had overrated the merit of a passage or poem, that I had erred concerning the degree of its excellence, I might be easily induced to believe or apprehend. But that lines, the sense of which I had analysed and found consonant with all the best convictions of my understanding, and the imagery and diction of which had collected round those convictions my noblest as well as my most delightful feelings, that I should admit such lines to be mere nonsense or lunacy, is too much for the most ingenious arguments to effect. But that such a revolution of taste should be brought about by a few broad assertions, seems little less than impossible. On the contrary, it would require an effort of charity not to dismiss the criticism with the aphorism of the wise man, in animam malevolum sapientia hoard in trepotist. What then if this very critic should have cited a large number of single lines and even of long paragraphs, which he himself acknowledges to possess eminent and original beauty? What if he himself has owned, that beauties as great are scattered in abundance throughout the whole book? And yet, though under this impression, should have commenced his critique in vulgar exaltation with a prophecy meant to secure its own fulfilment. With a this won't do. What? If after such acknowledgments extorted from his own judgment he should proceed from charge to charge of tameness and raving, flights and flatness, and at length, consigning the author to the house of incurables, 
should conclude with a strain of rudest contempt evidently grounded in the distempered state of his own moral associations. Suppose to all this done without a single leading principle established or even announced, and without any one attempt at argumentative deduction, though the poet had presented a more than usual opportunity for it, by having previously made public his own principles of judgment in poetry, and supported them by a connected train of reasoning. The office and duty of the poet is to select the most dignified as well as the gayest, happiest attitude of things. The reverse, for in all cases a reverse is possible, is the appropriate business of burlesque and travesty, a predominant taste for which has been always deemed a mark of a low and degraded mind. When I was at Rome, among many other visits to the tomb of Julius II. I went thither once with a Prussian artist, a man of genius and great vivacity of feeling. As we were gazing on Michelangelo's Moses, our conversation turned on the horns and beard of that stupendous statue, of the necessity of each to support the other, of the superhuman effect of the former and the necessity of the existence of both to give a harmony and integrity both to the image and the feeling excited by it. Conceive them removed, and the statue would become un natural, without being supernatural. We called to mind the horns of the rising sun, and I repeated the noble passage from Taylor's Holy Dying that horns were the emblem of power and sovereignty among the eastern nations, and are still retained as such in Abyssinia, the Aichelus of the ancient Greeks, and the probable ideas and feelings, that originally suggested the mixture of the human and the brute form in the figure, by which they realized the idea of their mysterious pan as representing intelligence blended with a darker power, deeper, mightier, and more universal than the conscious intellect of man, than intelligence, all these. Thoughts and recollections passed in procession before our minds. My companion who possessed more than his share of the hatred, which his countrymen bore to the French, had just observed to me, a Frenchman, sir, is the only animal in the human shape, that by no possibility can lift itself up to religion or poetry when, lo, two French officers of distinction and rank entered the church. Mark you whispered the Prussian, the first thing which those scoundrels will notice for they will begin by instantly noticing the statue in parts, without one moment's pause of admiration impressed by the whole, will be the horns and the beard. And the associations, which they will immediately connect with them will be those of a he-goat and a cuckold. Never did man guess more luckily. Had he inherited a portion of the great legislator's prophetic powers, whose statue we had been contemplating, he could scarcely have uttered words more coincident with the result, for even as he had said, so it came to pass.